essentially the first time they really venture out of the hive to collect pollen and nectar and you know fly for miles around the hive and then come back again. And they do that until they literally drop dead from, from work and age. Uh, really more from uh, work because the worker bees live about six to eight weeks in the summer and then, but in the winter, those winter worker bees will live for a number of months, six, up to six months or more. So, uh, it, and they're not working. So, you see what work does to you? Aren't you glad you're retired? <laughs> yeah, I am. Because I'm not retired. Now, what happened here? Let's see. Okay, so, the queen bee. She's the center of the hive's universe. No other bee is more important than that queen. Without her, the whole colony would die because she is the only bee capable of having fully functioning ovaries that can lay fertilized eggs that will hatch into new bees. Um, she has powerful pheromones. That's a chemical scent that tells that colony at any time that she's present. They may not see her because there may be 40,000 bees in the hive, and she's down here and they're way up on the second floor, but they know she's there. And if you were to remove her from the hive, or if she died, something happened to her, they would know within hours that she's gone. And they would immediately start to make a new queen. I'll tell you about that later. But she is a egg-laying machine. She, all she does is lay eggs. She lays up to 2,000 eggs a day, 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day, going from one cell to the other and depositing one egg. And um, she, doesn't, she doesn't feed herself, she doesn't groom herself. Those attendant bees, those worker bees, take care of all that. If she has to poop, they collect it and take it outside and dump it. So it's, it's the queen's life. Then th there's the drone. You won't laugh at this. <laughs> the drone doesn't do anything. <laughs> well, that's not quite true. They don't feed themselves. They have to be fed. They have to be cared for. Sound familiar? And they really do no work in the hive. But their sole purpose is mating. Not within the hive not within their colony. But what happens is, uh, in the summer, you know, in the late morning, once they get up and have been fed breakfast, they will leave the hive and they will uh, cruise around looking for a virgin queen from another hive. And if they don't find one, they come back and have lunch and supper and go to bed. But occasionally, a wonderful thing happens. They go out, and there's a virgin. And they mate with that virgin queen. And then they drop dead. <laughs> I also get a standing ovation at the women's club. <laughs> There's even more sad news. Suppose they made it through and they didn't even get a chance to mate all season. And it's beginning to be the fall and now they can really relax because it's the winter. The girls are all sitting around saying, you know what? All these guys do is eat all day and we have to feed them and take care of them. That's going to be a real pain all winter. So they kill them all. <laughs> so all the drones are gone for the winter. They're either exiled from the hive, stunned to death, or otherwise <coughs> made rid of. So it's not a good life. It really isn't. <laughs> you know about the language of bees. This is really interesting. This is another thing to fall in love with. They say next to primates, they have one of the most complex and effective language systems in the animal kingdom. They have the ability to communicate in amazing ways with each other. Uh, some is by touch and smell and taste. You know, taste this, that, that's apple nectar. Ooh, I, oh, apple nectar, let's go to the apple tree, yeah. Um, the other is by scent. 
They produce different pheromones. I mentioned the queen had pheromones that are unique to her. Um, each worker bee has pheromones that are unique. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the foragers and all uh, will have a pheromone that can waft from the hive and allow other bees to find the hive again. Uh, the, the guard bees have an alarm pheromone, which smells like bananas, by the way. And you can smell it if they're squirting their pheromone, but you gotta watch out for that because when they do, the bees attack. It's their alarm system. And if you've seen bees with smokers, you know, the smoker, uh, when they go into a hive, they smoke the hive. Uh, they don't do that to put them to sleep, as some people think. It really masks the pheromone scent. So that when the alarm goes off in the hive, nobody smells it. They, well, they say, you smell smoke? Oh, I smell smoke. So it, that's what the beekeeper uses the smoke for. But uh, the other thing they do is a dance. And the worker bees who are out foraging can find a terrific source of nectar or pollen, or pollen, come back to the hive and do a special little dance that is a wiggle and a waggle, and it goes this way or that way, and depending upon the number of wiggles and the direction, it can communicate with extraordinary precision to the other bees where this source of food is. And they'll go right to it, not close to it, right to it. It's very accurate. So that's amazing. So anyway, as a beekeeper, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, wild, the bees might typically live in a hollow tree or something like that. But as a beekeeper, you've seen beehives, I'm sure. They're really wooden boxes. They're different kinds, but uh, this is the most popular type. Uh, it's just a bunch of square boxes with frames inside upon which the bees build their um, comb and store their honey and nectar, uh, honey and uh, pollen. So, uh, and they stack up one on top of each other like so many stories in a building. And that's what you work with. And then as equipment, it's really simple. Uh, there's the smoker I mentioned, that, that metal thing there. Let me get this to That's a, a smoker. This is a hive tool, which is like a pry bar to pry the frames apart. If you must use gloves, you can. I don't, usually. And I usually encourage my students not to. It's sort of only because the bees are really very gentle. And you can work your hive. The bee, there are beekeepers here. Do you, you think they're violent, any of you? No. They're, they're very gentle. They don't very seldom will sting you. But anyway, if you feel more comfortable, you use gloves. And then there's the uh, veil you might put on. And I do recommend that. And that's not because they're aggressive. It's because they're curious. And they love to explore dark places like your nostrils <laughs> and your ears. So if you don't have something on your head, they'll, they'll be all over you and they're not gonna attack, but if they go up your nose, you'll probably do something that'll make them attack. So having a veil is a good idea. Bees come in the mail, typically. I mean, you can get them delivered, but, um, or pick them up locally if you have a beekeeper selling them, but uh, either way, they come in a wooden box with screen sides. There's about 10,000 worker bees in there. And a little, whoops, let me go back again. Hold on. And a little um, cage here, which the queen is in. The queen and a few attendants. So with that in hand, all you have to do is dump those bees into an empty hive. Just shake them right out. And it's very dramatic and everybody, all the neighbors come to look and think you're nuts because you got 10,000 bees you're just dumping out so casually. But, you know, nothing happens. They, they're not protecting a hive yet and uh, they're happy to have a new hive. And uh, it's, um, I've had my daughter when she was younger help me with that, so without consequence. By the way, I mentioned they're, they're gentle and all. I've had bees now for what, now 35 years, I guess. And, um, not one of my family members or any of our guests or friends or visitors to our home has ever been stung by my honeybees. And my daughter has taken, when she was much, she's grown now, but so she'd bring her whole school over and we'd have maybe 20 or 30 kids in the yard and she would open up the hive and, and uh, sort of 
uh, well, hold, hold up the frames and everything. Uh, so they're really, they're really quite gentle. Uh, where do you put them? Really anywhere. But a picture-perfect location might be on flat ground so you can get a wheelbarrow to it to take honey off. Uh, maybe a windbreak at the back, some dappled sunlight, and easy access to water. Uh, if you had a stream or a brook, that's great, or a little pond, but you don't have to have that. Uh, they do need water, because they go through a lot of water. They collect the water to help cool the hive in the summer. And uh, if you don't have the water, they'll find the nearest source. And that source might be your neighbor's swimming pool. <laughs> so that's not a good idea. So if you have bees, you probably want to provide water to them near the hive. But there, there's the idea, how it's, it's fun for the family. It's a great little hobby. Um, and, and you know, when you pull out a frame, that's what it looks like. Uh, and you see the bees on it, you see up in, uh, oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. Here we go. Up in this quadrant up here, that's honey, capped honey. Down here is uh, pollen, and this area down where all the bees are, that, those are the, ba the baby bees. That's the larva and pupa developing in that metamorphosis process. <clears throat> If you cut cells open, this is what it looks like. Uh, that circle indicates an egg. That's what an egg looks like. It looks like a little grain of rice. That egg hatches in a couple of days into a larva, which grows very quickly. Um, and it's this uh, worm-like thing you see here. And then as it matures more and starts to develop eyes and so forth, they actually cover the cell with some wax. So they seal it off. It's not airtight, but it seals it off, and they finish their development into a pupa, and then emerge as a fully adult bee. It takes about 20 some days. Um, that you can see the queen here going from cell to cell, and maybe if you're close enough to the screen, you can see those little white larvae in there. In some of those cells. By the way, that queen does not come born with a yellow dot. <laughs> That's added by me and other beekeepers. And why do you do that? You do it because what, what do you do when you look inside a hive? Well, you're really looking mostly to see, first of all, are they there? Is everything well? But you want to find the queen because without the queen, you don't have anything. So it's very important to find the queen and make sure she's as healthy and doing what she's supposed to do. But if you got 40, 50,000 bees in there, it ain't so easy because she doesn't look a whole lot different than the rest of them. So the beekeeper will often mark their queen with a, a little dot or a little daub of paint or something so that you can find her faster. There's even a color coding to it, so certain colors go to certain years. So you can tell how old your queen is. She will live for several years, uh, but that she starts to get not so productive, as, as we all do. But, but here are the problems. This gets to the uh, nitty gritty of this. The problems are these threats to the bees. Why are the bees having trouble these days? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, one that came about in the last couple of decades has been the emergence of these parasitic mites. And there are two kinds that we focus on. One is called tracheal mites. And that's, a, that's an electron microscope picture. That's very highly, or at least it's magnified, maybe not electron microscope, but it shows uh, these tracheal mites inside the tracheal tubes of the bees and they start to reproduce inside the bee. And of course, if the population gets big enough, the bees sicken and the colony will die. Um, another type of mite are called varroa mite, and you can see those, I think, on the back of that bee. They're kind of like a tick, looks like a tick, kind of. And uh, they suck the bee blood from the bees, and it can also sicken and weaken the colony, and that can be a problem. The good news is we kind of know what to do about that now. So as beekeepers, we know how to watch out for it. We know how to identify it when it happens, and there are different techniques for dealing with it that are of varying um, effectiveness, but we know what to do. So that's not the real issue. 
the real issue happened not that long ago first, and that is this thing called colony collapse disorder. It's even made the cover of Time magazine a number of years ago. And when it first was sort of identified, you would see it on the evening news and everything else. I mean, it was very prominently publicized and still is to a degree. It's, um, it's where colonies simply disappear. I don't mean the, the box, I mean what's inside the box. The bees go. And uh, without explanation, or uh, it's, it's unprecedented the way this has been happening. And it's uh, mysterious what's causing it. Well, there have been all kinds of theories, and I'm, at least I'm glad to say there's some very smart people working on it, but I'm sorry to say we don't know the real reasons yet. Uh, there's probably, it's like a cock the perfect storm, uh, a bunch of things. It was first reported in 2006, so not all that long ago. And some of these professional migratory beekeepers that provide pollination services to farms, they reported up to 90% of their hives dying. That'll put someone out of business. Um, and we see it among a hobbyist too. Eric, right, you lost a hive to uh, colony collapse. So what's causing it? Well, again, nobody knows for certain, but we're starting to narrow it down. It's probably a perfect storm of several things. Uh, parasites that we mentioned, uh, different uh, viruses that bees get, and there's quite a number of those. Um, but then one that we look at quite closely are pesticides. We have any uh, folks from the chemical industry here? Yes? Did I hear yes? Well, maybe you can help us with this. So one that's gotten a lot of notoriety among um, beekeepers, at least, is a product that's made from neonicotinoids. And uh, they're certainly toxic. Uh, and uh, a lot of people think there's a correlation between the you know, relatively recent use of those classifications of chemicals and um, the decline in the bee populations. But it hasn't been, the, the people make it say it's okay and the other people say it's not so okay. So, and I'm not a chemist, so I can't tell you. Uh, I can tell you that these particular products that you might have at home do contain neonicotinoids. And uh, I, 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 don't, I don't use them just to be safe in case there's a connection there. I certainly don't want to increase the chances that something's going to happen to my bees. So I, I stay clear of that and sort of, I guess you'd say, farm, I don't farm, but garden organically as much as I can. So what else can you do? You can support local beekeepers when you buy honey at the farmer's market and encourage the beekeeper to keep working and doing stuff. And just the fact that they have bees is a good thing. Um, you can let beekeepers know, neighbors, if you're gonna be spraying your plants or go lawns or trees. Um, you can plant bee-friendly plants to give them more forage material. And they, they like a whole bunch of stuff. And of course, you can support the research that's being done by some of the big universities. Uh, or you can become a beekeeper yourself. I happen to know a pretty good book. <laughs> you can join a regional club. It was mentioned in the introduction, but probably the largest club in the nation is right in uh, Weston. It's uh, monthly in Weston. Uh, latch on to a mentor, find somebody like me to help you get started. Uh, order a startup kit, order a package of bees, and start that love affair that I began 35 years ago. And gentlemen, that's it, and I have you there. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. We have a little time. Thank back. you very much, Alvin. Questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. What is a mason bee? A mason bee is um, a, uh, one of those uh, solitary, well not solitary, but they're a type of bee. They don't make honey. Uh, they are pollinators. They've become quite popular among gardeners. Uh, I believe they're stingless, aren't they? I, I've never had mason bees, but uh, they, they can be used for pollination too. And introduced at will by the gardener, although they're a little trickier to manage. Well, they've never done it. Yes, sir. 
Uh, well, hold on, I'm sorry. I didn't see you had a microphone. Can I take you next? Because he has the mic. <laughs> Okay, uh, you, you mentioned that they all go out and search for the same type of uh, flower or blossom to, um, to collect their pollen. What dictates that? Because there must be different plants available in season at, at the same time. So what, I mean, who says, I'm going to go for clover well, or, or dandelion? I don't know the exact answer. I'm not sure anybody does. But the, they do, com uh, that communication back to the hive spreads like wildfire. So that's where they go. They, it's the communication, I believe, that drives it. It's, it's not entirely by chance because the, if the blossom is in full bloom, that's the time that triggers that kind of response. So, but uh, yes, in the back we had somebody back over here. I, well, if you wouldn't mind. You do the alternate. You do all the Yeah. I didn't know the rules. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll never be invited back now. Oh, yes, you will. Come here. We're going to break the roast as what's. Well. Quick, quick question. Does every worker bee go through the eight cycles that you described? Yes. Thank you. I didn't see where you were. Well, there you are. Hi. Please stand up and you ask a question. There you go. Thanks for being here. Very informative. Very informative to thank you for being here. But the last slide you had with the do not buy uh, the neo uh, uh, is, is there a safe brand? Is what, I went in recently to buy something from my wife's uh, garden, gardens, and they all look familiar. What would be one that would be the well, safe that we could get? I, I, I would ask your garden supplier. Uh, because they know about that and they know which ones are neonicotinoids or not. And there are also um, natural things uh, that you can use. Um, let's see, where are they? Yeah, what they vinegar. vinegar, that's right, yeah. Spraying vinegar and things like that. Yes, next. I'll let you pick them because I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, a friend of mine used to have some bees. She lives in Wilton. And uh, one of the predators you did not mention is bears. Apparently, Wilton, uh, he, he tracks them. There's a one bear colony in Wilton. She said they destroyed the colonies uh, and she's not taken up in it. That's something that a beekeeper needs to worry about. Yes, they do. Um, and, you know, it depends where you live. In Manhattan, that's not so much of a problem. <laughs> but um, the, uh, there are other things to worry about there. But bees, yeah, where I am in Easton, too, the, the bears are popping up. You know, the, the sort of the, the more worrisome thing is much more common, and that's like skunks and raccoons. And they will go to the entrance of a hive at night and scratch on the entrance, and a bee comes out to see what's going on, grab it and eat it. And they'll do that all night. It's like it's like uh, popcorn, you know, and uh, that could be a problem. So, but there are ways around that that you can deter them without really injuring them. And you one, you raise the hive up, because then the skunk or raccoon has to stand on its hind legs to reach the entrance of the beehive. And when they do that, they expose their belly, which doesn't have much fur on it, and the bees take it from there. <laughs> Occasionally, sorry. Occasionally, over the years, you hear about stories about aggressive bees coming up from say, South America. Do they pose a threat to your enemies? Not around here. You're referring to the Africanized honeybees. Uh, bees from Africa that were brought to Brazil in the 1950s as part of an experiment to see if they could produce a super race of honeybee that would produce more honey. And um, that never worked, but some uh, bozo left the cage open and uh, they escaped and have been mating and intermingling with the European honeybees and they've become Africanized bees, or as the media calls it, killer bees <laughs> so and they're very aggressive they have terrible tempers and I probably wouldn't be a beekeeper if I had to deal with them but they are down south they're 
you know, they're all throughout the South, Texas and California and New Mexico and all that, and Florida maybe too, yeah. So um, th those beekeepers have to deal with that. That's why you mark your queen, for one reason. If you go in your hive and you always mark your queen and you see a new queen in there that's not marked, get rid of her and replace her with one that you know where it came from because it's the queen that produces the offspring. So. You mentioned earlier that the bees can detect the absence of a queen or a queen that has died. What, when they find themselves in that situation, what do they do? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. The, um, that's right, they, they'll know right away if the uh, queen is gone. What they do is interesting. They take um, um, a number of, the, first of all, they build what they call queen cells, which are larger cells than the typical cell to accommodate a larger bee. And they will go around and they will collect the eggs that that queen had laid before she died, right? In the day or two before she died. And they'll move it to those new cells. And then they'll do something very interesting. They'll, they'll take care of the hatching larva just like they would any other uh, bee. But the difference is they feed it only one thing. They feed those designated cells royal jelly, which is a product that they produce from glands in their head. Sounds pretty awful, doesn't it? But uh, that's the only diet that one gets versus all the other worker bees who get a mixture of honey and pollen and jelly and all that. So they just, it's the diet that makes the difference. That bee will emerge as a fully functioning queen capable of laying eggs and mating and everything else. Paul, do you want to talk about swarming? Swarming. Everybody's probably at one time in their life seen a swarm of bees. And it's a natural phenomenon. When a colony gets a little too crowded, uh, it makes the decision it's too crowded and so we're going to take the old queen and half of us are going to find a new home because there's no more room in the in the stable and uh, so half of them leave and it's quite a remarkable sight at the exact same moment it's like someone flipped a switch and say it's 11 o'clock in the morning all of a sudden 10 or 20,000 bees just come pouring out of the hive with the old queen. Uh, and in the meantime, they made sure their cells left behind, those queen cells for her new queen. And they'll fly around for a moment or two and then usually find a place to land on and, and rest or to, to outside of the hive. You might see them on a mailbox or up in a tree or on somebody's car antenna, you never know. But uh, they won't stay there because there are scout bees in there and they will go out scouting looking for a new home, a more suitable home like uh, maybe uh, somebody's attic or something, you know, or another empty beehive or a hollow tree. And uh, then they'll come back and do their little dance and all that and communicate where it is and then they'll all take off exactly at the same time and go to the new home. That's, this is why I love these things. I mean, it's fun stuff. So where does the drone be in his search for the virgin queen? Come in. Wait, are you, are you searching? <laughs> the, I'll pass that. <laughs> the, I don't know what you mean by where it comes in. They're, they're doing it throughout the season. They Every day they'll fly out looking for virgin. No, no, it, it just uh, I, I has nothing to do with the procreation of the new queen. I mean, it has everything to do with the procreation of the new queen of another hive. Correct. If the, you got to remember, they're all brothers and sisters. They're all a offspring of the queen. So that drone cannot mate with his sister, right? Correct. So they look for bees, uh, specifically queen bees from other hives who have just had a emerging queen come out from one of those cells and is of course born a virgin and needs to be mated with several drones actually 
kind of slutty, really, when you think about it. And she returns to the hive, and within a week, she starts laying eggs, fertilized eggs. Oh, you want to hear something else interesting? If the queen lays an egg and fertilizes it because she holds the sperm from that mating with several drones for all her life, right? She mates once and she holds the sperm. So if she deposits sperm on the egg that she holds in her body, it becomes a female worker bee. If she lays an egg and does not fertilize it with sperm, it becomes a drone. <laughs> But, but but the drone never uh, would a drone enter a, a strange hive? No. Well, not no. They, they wouldn't be allowed in. I don't. I, think, I don't think that would happen. But they're 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 looking for action. <laughs> but they find action out there. They, it's always up in the air. There's, they call it drone mating area, a queen drone mating area, and the queens are flying up. 100 feet in the sky, and drones are circling around looking for a queen doing that. Pheromones play a role, you know, they can smell. Any others? Would you please explain the warming mechanism? Explain the warming mechanism in the hive. In the winter. In the winter. It all has to do with vibrating muscles. As they vibrate the muscles in their wings, it creates heat. And, um, and also, the, the fact that they're packed together, they're in a cluster. Did you see the movie on penguins? Did you ever see that movie? Do you remember how in the, in the Antarctic, it was like 50 below zero, they all huddle together, and the inside of that huddle is warm because of just the body heat of the animals. Of course, the, the ones on the outside are freezing, <laughs> but they take turns. So there's this undulating mass of bees changing positions, jockeying for a warmer spot. The queen's always in the center, but um, that's how they do it. It's the same principle. I think we go to the other side. I know the rules. It's the other side. <laughs> One more question. Jim Phillips knows all about lead steers, and we all know about lead cows in, in a dairy barn who always arrange themselves in the same sequence. Is there a lead bee that begins the decision-making process, or does it all simply happen by? Uh, it's it's course? it's. <laughs> no one's ever asked that question. I don't know. I really know the answer, other than uh, it's really the most remarkable teamwork. Now we know the queen is the center of the universe, so she guides a lot of what's going on, but on the other hand, the worker bees will guide the queen into how many drone eggs to lay versus worker uh, fertilized, you know, by, by building the cells to different sizes. The drone cells are slightly larger, and she recognizes that, so when she gets to a larger cell, she'll put a non-fertilized egg in. And they control that, but uh, she controls other things, so it's on his teamwork. Do you know the answer to that? Um, no. There you go. On this side now, yes. Okay, how much honey can you take from the hive without harming the, the hive for the winter? Is that the honey is their food for the winter? Yeah, that's a, a very good point. You have to leave, what you're harvesting is what we call surplus honey. That's more than the bees need for the winter. And the answer to your question depends on where you live. Here in Connecticut, you want to leave about 60 pounds of honey for your colony. Um, so that's quite a lot of honey, but that's what you need to leave, because the winters are long. In Florida, they don't really have winters like that, so it's a whole different thing. It's, beekeeping is done a little differently. But up here, you leave 60, and if they, assuming they've made 60 pounds or more, it's the and more that you can take. Do we have time for another one? Yeah. If I have one box or one hive, I can understand so the queen is centric. What if I have a dozen boxes? Do I have 12 queens? Yes, you do. They, they, they don't, they they don't, they don't, they don't need or anything like they don't have 
wars against each other? <laughs> well, not typically. I mean, sometimes if there's a colony gets very weak, it's not a strong colony, it's ailing for whatever reason, another colony may come in and steal honey because you know, they can't defend themselves. But the, there's only one queen per hive. She doesn't go from hive to hive or anything like that. Okay, so 12 hive, 12, 12 federated you know, states, you know, it's like one. It, okay. Exactly. All right, thank yeah. you. It's like your neighbors, you know, they you know, each have their own house. On that side? Can you say something about the business of renting bees? Do farmers do it to improve their production or for honey? Renting bees. Uh, farmers do rent bees from usually, usually commercial beekeepers who make a living from that. Uh, and it's gotten to be a pretty good living because they're in more short supply. But uh, you'll see apple orchards even around here where they're really like Silverman's up at, uh, in Easton where I am. <coughs> They bring bees in. Uh, you have to, I mean, to get the optimum. You want those 1,200 apples per tree, right? So uh, so they, they charge a fee for that, usually on a per hive basis. Uh, if you're just a resident of Darien and looking for bees, um, you, you can even contact that club that's been mentioned a couple times, the Backyard Beekeepers Association, because some of the members uh, in, enjoy and like keeping bees on other people's property. And, you know, you, you as the property owner don't really have to do anything, but they're always looking for more land to put their bees on. So you can work out a deal with someone like that if you want your garden to be better pollinated. And it does make a difference. It really does. You, you say the queen bee lives, what, three to five years? About three years. Okay. What happens to all the queen bees that are born over that three-year period? Do they get killed off by the rest of the colony, or what? Well, I mean, they can't all disappear. Well, they, there, there are not new queens being produced while you have a reigning queen, queen that's healthy and doing all the right stuff. If the hive, we talked about swarming, if the hive gets too crowded, they will make cells for new bees because they know their current queen, the old queen, is going to leave with half of them. So they don't want to leave their sisters behind with no queen. So after the swarm goes, in a matter of days, the new queens emerge, usually within, if not at the same time, within days of each other. And the first one to emerge is the winner. And if any other ones emerge, uh, they're killed. Yeah. So there's only one queen. It's not an easy line. <laughs> Question on this side. Okay, if I'm following you, the drone sounds like an immaculate conception kind of <laughs> because there's no male involvement. And is that the drone is that is, true, or is, or is that unique? It, it, the drone, the, is, the drone is a male with a penis and everything. But he was, but he was not conceived. He, he was unfertilized, so there was no, uh, there's no male component in his. You know, it's just. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's a true statement. So now I'm a little bit lost. How? I'm a, spe I'm a specialist at that. So where do those queens come from that get up to the, uh, you know, that are flying around and the drones okay, take see. them out? Okay, let's see. Good question. The are killed. All right. Now, well, it's a matter of sequence. Okay. Swarm's going to happen. They're going to take the new queen away. They leave these cells, one of which is going to emerge as a new queen who may go around and kill all the others. So there's just one left. She's so virgin. She can't do anything yet. She can't lay eggs. She leaves the hive for the only time in her life, flies off in the air, 100 feet in the air, looking for drones. The drones find her, they mate, she comes back to the hive. Now they have a fertilized queen for one, two, three years. And um, that's how that happens. Any other questions? Yes, it's about our time limit. We've got time for two more questions. Two more. 
<laughs> they look good. <laughs> Jermaine, this is one about uh, Who, who's Boston. going first? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, what I was interested in is, is anyone with a business like this, anybody looked at the DNA and the genetics of bees, like all the other species that are part of our food production? Have they, have they looked at that? Oh, sure. I mean, I'm not an entomologist. I'm a hobbyist beekeeper. Sure. But, but there, there's some wonderful folks that have been right. looking into that. Jermaine, to his question, what, you know, or Roger's question about the immaculate conception, <laughs> it seems illogical that in biology that you would have a male that didn't share some DNA with a female. Well, that's over my head. I don't know the, the details of the chromosomes. Okay, the lab. thank you. Yes, sir. These bees died quite often. Is there a huge pile of dead bees? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, actually, unless something really traumatic happens, like poisoning or something like that. The um, Remember I said there were different jobs for the worker bees? One of them is undertaker. So bees do die. You probably lose, in the middle of the season, maybe a thousand bees a day. <clears throat> you also get a thousand new bees, you know, or more. Uh, but the undertaker bees will take that bee, dead bee, pick it up, fly way away from the hive, and drop it in a field or something. So you won't find any dead bees all piled up around the hive, unless I say there's been poisoning, pesticide poisoning or something really traumatic that happened in the hive. Just the normal day-to-day -day life and death, you don't, you don't even notice it. They don't allow them to stick around. They clean up very well. Was that uh, it? Uh, no, one last question. <laughs> Since the bees have a range, and I can't control what pesticides my neighborhood uses, are there any safety issues in eating honey that's been harvested by, uh, by amateurs where there's no testing or anything? Uh, um, I, I think, in theory, yes, you could say so. You, you raise an interesting point. So, you, you know, if you go to the market in the health food section and see honey and it says organic, don't believe it. Because uh, at least the way they define organic today, it, it just can't be. Be. It can't be. The, uh, the reason is that uh, bees will fly several miles in every direction from the hive and that translates into 6,000 acres. So they're covering a forage area of 6,000 acres. You don't know what people are doing, uh, you know, a mile from here, two miles from here. If you had a farm and you had 6,000 plus acres and you were growing crops without any chemicals or anything, I guess you could say organic if you could prove that. But um, I think th that um, around here, I don't think you need to worry about it terribly. I mean, um, uh, well, it says I. I don't know. It's not tested. Um, but uh, I haven't heard of any incidents with buying local honey. It's probably a lot safer than buying it from China, <laughs> which is where a lot of honey comes from, <laughs> commercial honey. I guess that's it. On right? that note, thank you very much. Humanity is not lost, you know. These are people doing good things for you and they're not looking for anything in return. My name is Angel. I'm a 42-year-old Norwalk resident and I am a proud client of person to person. When I lost my job after having my baby, they welcomed me in, they told me that day to come on and start shopping. Oh, these are nice big potatoes today. So food is really the first point of contact for a lot of people. And they'll get introduced to the breadth of our services and understand that they have other pressing needs that can be met here. We provide a number of different programs that help people achieve economic stability. We have a clothing center, college scholarships, mentorships for first-generation students. They have assistance for summer camps, emergency financial assistance. I've had help with my rent. 
they brought me through a lot. When COVID came about, it took a toll on everything. I've signed up so many new clients for our services during this time. We are all just a paycheck away from having to utilize a service like this. And that's really what happened to a lot of people in our community that we're one paycheck away and then those paychecks stop coming. There's definitely been a lot more people coming to our doors with eviction notices. Landlords are giving three days notice and clients have to either pay or get out in three days. There's not a lot of affordable apartments. We know rent is increasing, the cost of food is increasing, the cost of gas is increasing. Inflation is really harming our clients significantly, creating such a squeeze that people are rightly terrified. What we do is help get them through the short-term crisis. We help them figure out a plan. What is that pathway to get to economic stability? My caseworker is Claudine. <laughs> and I can always get a smile about that. Our caseworkers have built tremendous trust with our clients. Well, I was really depressed for a while, and um, she was a shoulder to cry on. She's been a life changer. I, I appreciate her so much. We do get emotionally invested in our clients and their situations, and just seeing so many people struggle. We work very hard to make sure all of our services are being provided with kindness and with dignity and with respect. Because they're but for the grace of God. I knew a mom who lied to her son every day and said that she had eaten before he got home from school so that he didn't feel bad about eating. He didn't have to feel like he was taking food away from his mom. But I think that that's part of the beauty of what we do. Because of that emotional investment, we're able to go the extra mile. Our name is Person to Person. We recognize that humanity doesn't exist within the confines of a paycheck. It's not like you're invisible. You are seen. You know, you're really seen there. Angel and I are friends. And there's blessings everywhere. This is every day. This is what we do every day. Because of P2P, my future, it looks a lot brighter. We absolutely give people hope because they know that at least one person in this world has their back and is fighting for them. They don't have to do this alone. They are training me to get my independence back. Person to person is really a game changer. The past couple of years have been so overwhelming. It can feel difficult to even know where to start. Can anything I do really make a difference? And to those people I say, start where you are and just do something. The people who donate to person to person are phenomenal. And I don't even think they know how life-changing their, their generosity is to people. That little bit will be a ripple that has an effect on many, many more people. Thank you. out that the patient had had an allergic reaction to something and was having trouble with their breathing, swollen tongue, and lips. 
The person also had a history of obstructive sleep apnea. And if you were going to say, well, what doctor could take care of this patient? Uh, Dominic Roca is that person. Number one, uh, he is certified in internal medicine so he can take care of the hypertension. Number two, he is a pulmonary doctor certified in pulmonary medicine so he can take care of the chronic obstructive lung disease. Number three, he is certified in critical care medicine so he can take care of the patient in the ICU. Number four, he's certified in allergy and immunology so he can deal with the allergic reaction. And then number five, he's certified in sleep medicine. I don't know of any other physician who is certified in five different uh, areas. Uh, really quite remarkable. Um, he has been on the list of uh, Connecticut top doctors for a number of years. Uh, he is the director of the uh, Connecticut Center for Sleep Medicine, and he's here to give us an update on sleep medicine. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me, Jack. Um, this is, I've heard from people that are in the group, uh, in this club that, or association, that you have some pretty uh, remarkable speakers coming. I uh, hope to keep you entertained and to teach you uh, as much as I know about this field. And I'm planning to give the discussion in a classroom-like manner, which means I'm going to stop at various points to ask if you have questions. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing and then ask questions. We may not get to the entire talk, but you're, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions about anything you have about sleep, and I'll be happy to answer them. And I'll have some time afterwards if somebody wants to say some personal questions. So I am the director of the Sleep Center. Um, at Stanford Hospital, and we take care of anything that happens in sleep, whether it be sleepwalking, whether it be snoring, whether it be acting out your dreams, whether it be having difficulty trying to sleep at night. So we try to handle all of those things. So what I'm going to cover today, or hope to cover today, is we're going to talk about the function of sleep, how sleep changes as we get older, then I'm going to talk more specifically about sleep apnea and insomnia. And then I'll finish up with some tips on how to improve your sleep. So why do we sleep? This is actually a question that we still do not know the answer to. Approximately a third of our lives is spent sleeping. And yet we still don't know the detailed biological reasons why. We know that if you don't sleep, that in animal studies anyway, that an animal can die. If you keep a rat alive for uh, awake for a long enough period of time, they will die. They don't just act funny, they eventually die. So sleep has an imperative biological function. And we understand some of it, but much we don't. We've obviously never done the same study in humans. We've tried to keep patients or volunteers awake for extended periods of time. The record supposedly is 11 days, but now in retrospect, the feeling is that that person was dozing off. And if they had electronic ways being measured, we would have known that they were asleep or he was asleep. What we do know is that sleep helps us to remember things and to learn things. So without sleep and without certain stages of sleep, if I give you material and I compare you to someone who then gets to take a nap or sleep overnight, the person who gets to sleep will learn the material better. The other thing that we know is if you look at individual connections in the brain, that those connections get strengthened as you sleep. So there's direct 
anatomy changes, anatomical changes that occur while we sleep, as well as functional changes, that is, our memories are enhanced. Now, there are many different stages of sleep. We tend to think of it as possibly five stages. Wake. Wake is part of your night, everyone's night. We spend approximately 5% of even a great sleeper's night will be awake. Most of the time, you're not even thinking, worrying about that. You might spend 5, 10 minutes to fall asleep. You may be awake for 2, 3 minutes in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom, come back. But wake is part of it. So when people say, I keep waking up during the night, it's just a matter of, are you waking up too often? But being awake in the night is part of a normal night. Then we have light sleep. And light sleep is when you sort of are semi-aware of what's going on around you. The scary thing is they've done studies with truck drivers and have measured their brain waves while they're driving. And at times, they get into stage one sleep while they're driving. So we've all had that experience. You're reading a passage, and you get to the bottom of the page, and you're like, what the heck did I just read? You obviously didn't fall asleep, but you do go into a sort of a light sleep. Stage two sleep, you're asleep. You're not aware of what's around you, and that makes up most of your sleep. It's still sort of light sleep. Then we have stage three sleep. That's the deep sleep. That's the sleep when you wake up. Where am I? What day is it? Did I forget the meeting? Did I forget to go pick up my son or someone? You take some time to try to get oriented. That's deep sleep. Fortunately, a deep sleep takes place in most sleep, the beginning of the night. So you don't have that confusional arousal. But if you're really tired and you take a nap, sometimes you can get into deep sleep and you wake up confused. Where sleep is stands for rapid eye movement sleep. That's when we dream. And dream sleep is actually not a deep sleep. People tend to think that REM is deep. It's not. It's a lighter sleep, but that's when our dreaming takes place. Other things that happen during dream sleep is your body cannot regulate its temperature very well. So your body temperature starts to drop. The other thing that happens in dream sleep is you lose function of your muscle. Your muscle tone goes dramatically down. And erectile tissue becomes engorged. So those are some of the things that happen during REM sleep. This is an example of some of the brain, what the brain waves look like when you're awake. You have this fast, low amplitude. When you're in deep sleep, you have these large amplitude. Now, unfortunately, we don't get as much deep sleep as we get older. Sleep tends to cycle during the night. In the beginning part of the night, you go from light sleep to deep sleep, and then you get a little bit of REM. As you get towards the end of the night, you have more REM sleep and less deep sleep. This is what I was alluding to before. As we get older, so this is age on the bottom here, and this is the amount of sleep we get. Newborns will get about 16 hours of sleep, and then as we get older, it drops down. The thing to keep in mind is that from age 19 up, you pretty much need the same amount of sleep. It's about eight hours. That's an average, eight hours. So as we get older, people often say you need less sleep. You actually don't. You tend to get less sleep because we have various aches and pains and different things going on that make our sleep lighter. So if you look here at deep sleep, this, this color here, you'll see deep sleep drops down dramatically as we get older. If you take a three-month-old, you've had the experience, you take them from the car, bring them upstairs to their crib, change their diaper, they sleep the whole time. In adults, that, that doesn't happen. A little thing moves, and all of a sudden you wake up. Like I said before, we need an average of eight hours of sleep. Adolescents need about nine. Our high school students that are forced to go to bed really late doing all their homework and athletic activity, and they get up early in the morning, almost never get that. Children need about 10, infants about 14. That's a rough approximation. And then, this is sort of redundant, just basically showing that as we get older, our sleep requirements start to drop down, but then again, once you're 19, 50 years old, it's about the same. 
As we get older, as I said, sleep gets lighter. You don't have as much deep sleep. It becomes more fragmented. You have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. You have a little bit of aches and pains. If you have some medical problems and you have some trouble breathing, you're going to wake up. So your sleep gets lighter. But in general, we still need the same amount of sleep. So that's it for just basic sleep physiology. Does anybody have questions about basic sleep? Yes, sir. How do you explain, I know uh, we used to talk about kids here, only used to get four or five hours of sleep a night, and obviously it was very productive. How do you explain that? Oh, when you're younger, how you can get by with, with less than that? So, it's actually... It's, well, he was, he was pretty old in his 60s and 70s. <laughs> Oh, you're talking about a specific person? Henry Kissinger. Oh, Henry Kissinger. Actually, there's a number of very famous people that, that needed a few hours of sleep. And it's a bell-shaped curve, right? So I said eight hours. So you have on that bell-shaped curve, <clears throat> you have people who might need nine hours. You have people who need about six hours. In general, when people start saying they can get by with less than six, if you study them, they're actually quite sleep deprived and they can fall asleep pretty quickly. Now, if someone is brilliant, right, they can function with less sleep. They, they're going to be better than I am with eight hours simply because their capacity, their brain capacity is better. So people can drive themselves to function at a pretty high level with very little sleep. If you look at the high school students in Fairfield County, many of them are going to school with six hours of sleep or five hours of sleep, and they function at a very high level because they have that capacity. So everything is, is on a continuum, and you're just talking about someone who's on the edge of the Belgian curve. Yes. You showed some pretty marked uh, delineations between different segments of REM sleep during the night. Uh, is there continuity? If, if somebody's having a dream at uh, 10 o'clock to 10.30, and they go back to a lighter sleep and then come back later on to REM. They go back to the same dream? Yes. <laughs> Only if it's really good. <laughs> Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> yes. There's a newspaper or radio pieces in the news about uh, the lymphatic system and whether it's connected to the brain or it is, and so on and so forth. And one, uh, several times in the last couple of days, I've heard of, of a phenomenon, I suppose you'd say, where the brain gets rid of its toxins or whatever while you're sleeping. And uh, one of the consequences of people who don't get enough sleep, I shouldn't put it that way, there's a, there's a correlation between people who don't get a lot of sleep and uh, uh, Alzheimer's and things like that. Yeah, so, so that data gets really, really tricky. And I would urge you, this is a general statement about reading research, and, and one of my other things that I did in my life is I did get a PhD in neuropharmacology. So, so I, that's what I real love is basic science. And one of the things that happens in the news is that papers and things will be published that are association type data. And what I mean by that is many, many years ago, it was reported that people who drank coffee had an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. And then what, when they studied it a little bit in more detail, they realized that it wasn't the coffee. It was the cigarettes that they were smoking with the coffee. <laughs> so, so when you, when you look at association data, you have to be very careful. So there is a lot of data that states if you, if you just follow people over years, and you look at people who sleep like nine, 10 hours, or you look at people that sleep like six hours, those patients have an increased risk of things like um, cardiovascular disease and malignancies and death rate. But that does not mean that if you are feeling great and you get up at six after six hours and you feel good the whole morning, that you should try to force yourself to sleep. Or if you need eight and a half hours and that makes you feel good, that you should force yourself to sleep less because these are observational studies. So observational studies 
bring up questions that need to be explored. But unless they're perspective studies, you can't draw many conclusions. In other words, if I did a study and I took 100 people, and they all slept about eight hours, and I forced some of them to sleep seven, and I forced some of them to stay in bed nine hours, and I studied them for 20 years, and then I said, hey, the group that I forced to sleep seven hours, when they really wanted eight, they died sooner. Now I have something I can talk about. But as an association, there's so many other factors that come into play that make drawing conclusions like that very difficult. And I caution you from doing that. I mean, people talk about it because it's, it's news and it's a way to get people excited, but it makes people jump to conclusions. So we don't know. We don't know. It's possible that as a person develops early Alzheimer's, they may begin to sleep less and have problems at night sleeping. And so now, it says, oh, this person had trouble sleeping for 10 years and now they developed Alzheimer's. But maybe it was the Alzheimer's all along and the dementia all along that was triggering their light sleep. You follow what I'm trying to say? Yeah? What's your view on naps? Uh, I'm going to talk about naps. I will talk about naps. I will take one more question about physiology, and then we'll go right there, back there. The, uh, uh, some people like myself can hit pillow and bingo out in 60 seconds. My wife, on the other hand, has a lot of trouble getting to sleep, and she wanted me to ask, do you have any advice for people who have turned the lights off and have trouble getting to sleep? So I'm going to talk about insomnia. I'm going to talk about insomnia. Okay, so I'm going to go on, and then I'll stick around to ask questions, to answer any questions. So we're going to talk a little bit about sleep apnea because it is a very common disorder. Some people in the audience have asked me about it and know about it already. Uh, so when we sleep at night, air typically goes into our nose, into the back of the throat, and into the lungs. Along the way, it passes by your adenoids, the roof of your mouth, your tonsils. In some people, as they sleep, they relax, and this airway becomes more narrow, or it can become completely blocked. So what does sleep apnea look like? <laughs> so basically, you have a situation where someone is sleeping and they sound something like this. So I hope you can appreciate the fact that like, as I'm doing that, that's hard work. It's hard work to breathe through those smaller airways. And that's where the problem comes in with sleep apnea. Most people who have it are not aware that they have the problem. It's the spouse that's aware of it. <laughs> and it's only until the spouse says, you have to go sleep on the couch, do they then come in to see me. <laughs> So the most important thing when talking about sleep apnea is does the person snore loudly most nights? If you snore loudly most nights, there's about a 40% chance you have sleep apnea. Now this is, this is a really cool study that looking at nerve activity, okay? So you're looking at nerve activity on a particular patient. So this is the patient when they're awake. Their sympathetic nerve activity is high, helps them stay awake. Now they're asleep and the nerve activity goes down. Okay? When they're awake, their the blood pressure typically drops down. Now, what happens in a patient who has sleep apnea is when they're having trouble breathing, their sympathetic activity goes up because their body feels like they can't breathe well. It's, it's just picture yourself being intermittently choked. You can imagine your blood pressure and heart rate go up. And that's exactly what happens in patients sorry, who have sleep apnea, is their blood pressure is going up during the course of the night when it should be dropping down. So as a result of that, 
Patients who have sleep apnea have a much greater risk of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, even MRIs, compared to people who have sleep apnea and are treating it or don't have sleep apnea. What about death? Now this is one of these observational studies. So again, be cautious of, of the interpretation. But what they did is they found patients who had significant sleep apnea and were told to wear CPAP. And they followed them over a total of about seven years. And they found that those patients that did not treat their sleep apnea had a 60% death rate. Now, I said be careful of observational studies. The reason why you have to be careful about that, the doctors told these patients you need to treat this. They didn't. Now maybe they didn't heed the doctors warning about their weight, or their cholesterol, or their alcohol. Right? So there's a lot of other factors that come into play here. And so, but this has been repeated a number of times by a number of different investigators, and they found the same thing. People with significant sleep apnea had a higher death rate if they didn't treat it. So sleep apnea, or OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, is associated with things like high blood pressure, irregular heart rhythms, stroke, and even death. So if we suspect sleep apnea, what do we do? Well, there are two ways of doing this. One is in the hospital. We put patients in the hospital, we put a lot of wires on them, and we measure about 16 different things. We measure their brain waves, we measure their oxygen level, we measure their heart function, we measure or their heart activity, we measure their breathing, we measure their leg movements. It's just a lot of different things that we measure. But in order to save costs, because these tests are expensive, you can also do a home test, which obviously entails a lot less um, equipment. Now, if a person has sleep apnea, there are many treatments for sleep apnea. There are not just one. <laughs> one of the treatments is an oral appliance, a special device made for your mouth that pulls your jaw out. You probably can't see from the back of the room, but I can make a snoring noise. If I pull my jaw out, retreat my jaw so I look like Kirk Douglas, <laughs> now I can't make the same snoring noise. <laughs> because my tongue is pulled forward. So that's what that device does. Some people only have sleep apnea on their back. So you can wear something to prevent you to lie on your back. Some people opt for surgery. Surgery, interestingly, is about 50% effective. It's not a guarantee. And then this is something called ProVent, which is a sticker that goes on the edge of your nose. There's also more elaborate treatments where they do surgery and they put a pacemaker that stimulates the back of your tongue so that it opens up. Weight loss, if you lose weight for some people, that can be a treatment. And then the treatment that many people know about is called CPAP. And what CPAP does is it pushes air into the back of the throat. By pushing air into the back of the throat, it opens it up. CPAP is a guarantee. If you wear CPAP, you will not snore, you will not have sleep, sleep apnea. But the problem is it's difficult to do. If I put 100 people on it, at the end of the year, 50 will still be doing it. So it really takes a commitment. It's a guarantee to work, but if it's in the closet, it doesn't work. <laughs> so regarding sleep apnea, it's very common, approximately 15 to 20 percent of men have sleep apnea, about 10 percent of women have sleep apnea. <laughs> if you snore regularly, there's an increased chance that you have sleep apnea, about 40 percent. The treatment, um, there are many different options, and if you are willing to take the time and keep trying, we can generally treat almost every single patient. Any questions about sleep apnea? Yes. Do the patients that have the CPAP, is that the device that's in the So, the question is if you wear CPAP, 
Will it limit your ability to fall asleep? The answer is yes, for some patients it will. Most people who have significant sleep apnea, however, tend to be sleepier because their sleep is not of good quality. And so they can adapt to it. But there are some patients, I would say about 15, 20% of patients, who right off the bat say, no way, I can't do it. So yes, there are some patients that are not able to easily adapt to it. Yes? If you're using a CPAP machine, can you take a day or two off during the week without any risk, or, or is it seven days a week? So I equate sleep apnea to high blood pressure. So if you have pretty high blood pressure and you don't take your blood pressure medications that day, what is the risk of you having a stroke or some complications of that high blood pressure? The answer is mathematically it's a small risk. It's a small risk. So I'm not going to say there's no risk, but in general sleep apnea as with hypertension are a risk factor for diseases that occur over years of time, not over a day. So with a few exceptions, if someone has really bad hypertension, what pressure goes to 220 over you know, 150, taking them off that medication one day can cause a problem. If a person has really bad sleep apnea, where their oxygen level is going really low, and they have really bad heart disease, can they go off in one day? Yes, but that's, that's rare. That's rare. So most times when patients ask me that, I say it's okay. You know, you, you, can, you can do that. Yes? I see on your illustrations uh, you show people with pillows. I have found just recently that if I stand with my back toe to a wall and my head against the wall and breathe, there is no restriction. If I sleep with a pillow and with replicating the head movement of a pillow or the angle, I found that it is restricted depending on the angle. Would you speak to that, please? I, now I am, I have a CPAP, but now I am sleeping without a pillow. It seems to help. I, I agree 100%. Uh, and, and anybody who works in critical care and has to intubate people, put people on a breathing machine before going to surgery and you have to be knocked unconscious, knows that you have to have the head in a certain position to have the airway open. And so 100% positioning of the head can make a big difference in, in a patient and whether they, they have sleep apnea. Um, so there are techniques to try to improve that. They have special pillows that they make. The problem with it is you can't always control that. And particularly if someone has significant sleep apnea and they're going to have surgery, you want to let your anesthesiologist know, hey, I have sleep apnea, because you're going to be in a situation where you're not going to be able to control your neck. But to answer your question, yes, 100%, you can change the severity of sleep apnea by moving your position. Back does, every, back does everyone that snore have sleep apnea, or can you snore without sleep apnea? Approximately 40% of people who snore every day will have sleep apnea. So the answer to your question is you can snore and not have sleep apnea. Yes, sir. The mouthpiece that you were talking about, um, is that as effective as the CPAP number one and number two? There seem to be lots of them. You can get them online for like 50 bucks, or the person my wife was referred to wanted 3,000, I think, and the dentist said if they could do it for 500. Where do you go? Can we say the most? I got Um. So. You're 100% you're correct. You can online um, order these oral appliances. And in general, what I tell patients who are trying to decide, if they don't really have severe sleep apnea and they want to try oral appliances, what I tell them is purchase one of these. You know, I have some that have been out there for many, many years. The one I particularly recommend is Pure Sleep because it's been out there for like 20 years. So I know the device, but I think you can purchase one of these devices, and if you find that it eliminates your snoring and you feel good with it, I think that's great. <clears throat> However, the materials from which these devices are made generally are not that durable. And the other part of this is your teeth can move over time with these appliances. 
So what I generally tell people is, look, to try it out you can get one of these ovary counter things. See if this works for you. See if you can tolerate it. See if it affects your snoring. It only costs you about $100 or $60. It's a cheap, a relatively cheap way of trying out, is this going to work for you? And if it does, then I generally recommend that they see a dentist to have someone that's going to produce for them a more durable device and that can follow that patient up. Now, the, the good thing about this, the ones that are rather expensive, if the dentist is set up as a DME, a durable medical equipment provider with Medicare, uh, they can then distribute those devices to patients and it gets covered as a medical device. So they may charge $3,000 for the whole thing, including the visits, but that whole thing gets covered or a large part of it gets covered by your insurance. Yes? Um, you mentioned or you referred to bad uh, sleep apnea. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the symptoms of bad and very light sort of dose of sleep? Uh, so it's very interesting. Again, the person that knows the severity of sleep apnea is generally your spouse. Because there are patients who can have very severe sleep apnea and not recognize it. The gentleman in the back here had brought up uh, uh, Henry Kissinger and said he was able to get by with five or six hours of sleep and function really well. So if you curtail someone's sleep dramatically, if they happen to be someone who can get by with six hours of sleep and you're knocking out a third of their sleep, they still may function pretty well. So I've had patients who have very severe sleep apnea, yet have no cognitive symptoms of that sleep apnea. So the severity of sleep apnea really is a, a numerical, the, the answer to your question is really numerical. I can tell you the number of events, the, the severity of the drops in your oxygen level. But in terms of function, you could have someone who has mild sleep apnea and feels really sleepy during the day, and someone who has really severe sleep apnea and says, I feel fine. I, I'm sorry that's not the answer you wanted, but that's that's totally I went through your sleep status test at the Tampa Hospital. Uh-huh. Uh -oh. and, and my sleep apnea was not such that I woke up, but my breathing was interrupted a number of times during the night, so I was losing uh, sleep. I went for the test that had the mask on. Now, the mask I had on was large. It was almost all over your face. Uh, the noise was uncomfortable about the hum of an air conditioner. You see it was hum of air conditioner. It could keep you awake. Uh, but I noticed the picture you had of the mask. And I had three straps around my head. And the big machine there was the size of a, a large clock radio, bigger than that, really. But I saw the picture you have up there is very small, one strap around a very small machine. Uh, what, are there different kinds of CPAP? So, what are so the main difference with CPAP over the years has been the evolution of the masks. The masks have gotten substantially better. There are literally dozens of masks that are out there. So if a person is willing to keep trying, we almost guarantee that we'll find a mask that works for you. So the masks are the thing that have changed. The machines themselves have gotten smaller, but what they do is basically still the same. Yes, sir. Uh, can you have sleep apnea if you do not snore? It's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. I wouldn't say it's, there's zero chance, but it's very unlikely. I'll take one more question about this and then we'll go on. Yeah. What's the relationship between sleep position, sleeping on your side or your stomach or your back to sleep apnea? Well, as the gentleman here was pointing out, it, it may even be as subtle as your head position, but when you sleep on your back, your muscles are going to go in a front-to-back direction. So your tongue is going to slide back. The roof of your mouth is going to slide back. So as you slide back, you block your airway. When you're on your side, gravity's not working so much against you. So your sleep apnea tends to be not as severe. Make sense? All right, I'm going to move on to... Um, some other topic, uh, insomnia, I think is next. And again, I'll, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. <coughs> so, 
Insomnia is defined as a difficulty falling asleep when you want to sleep, basically. And there has to be... <laughs> there has to be a consequence to it, right? So if Henry Kissinger is sleeping six hours, he feels great, and other people sleep seven hours and they feel terrible, and they feel really wired and, and, and irritable and nasty the next day. So it's difficult to sleep in what you want, and then there has to be a consequence to that the next day. The amount of sleep is not part of the definition. So it's not like, oh, if you sleep less than six hours, you have insomnia. It's not being able to sleep when you want to sleep. It is more common in women. It is more common as we get older. <clears throat> it is more common in people who have an underlying psychiatric issue, whether it be depression or anxiety. And 20% have concomitant medical problems. So it's oftentimes not a disease in and of itself. It is a consequence of some other factors. The most common reason why people have insomnia is this. They come to me because approximately 10 years ago, there was a financial stressor in the household and they had trouble sleeping. And as a result of that trouble sleeping, <clears throat> they started to try different things, maybe different over-the-counter medications, going to bed a little earlier, fall asleep on the couch. Now that stress has gone away. Financially, they're set. But they develop bad habits. And then the, the bad habits continue the problem. And that's why they're having problems 10 years later. So this is a, uh, a common scenario. Someone comes in and tells me that they're having trouble falling asleep <coughs> and staying asleep. And sometimes they fall asleep pretty quickly, but then they'll, they'll sleep for a couple hours, they'll be awake for 30 minutes or, or 20 minutes, sleep for another couple hours, then wake, then maybe sleep in half an hour increments and waking up. And meanwhile, they're going crazy, right? Well, I keep my job, my wife really snores really loud. And are my kids okay? Why can't I sleep? I hate not being able to sleep. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So you create a monster. The bed becomes a monster. So how do we, how do we correct that problem? And I'm gonna go through some of the ways that we do it. But basically, I always equate insomnia to a performance. So if you're a tennis player, and you get on the court, and your first three shots, boom, right on the line, they're beautiful. You're not thinking about anything now. Just, I'm gonna destroy this guy. I'm gonna win this match. And you're having fun, and you're not even thinking about it. But if on the other hand, your first five shots go wide, or three shots go wide, now you're thinking, is my hand grip right? Are my feet right? Am I attacking the net wrong? And you start second guessing yourself. And that's what happens with insomnia. If you start having trouble sleeping through the night, then every time you wake up, you're like, damn it, here I go again. So sleep hygiene is the common sense kind of things. You really don't want to have your cup of espresso before going to bed. You don't want to <coughs> Um, use alcohol before going to bed. Alcohol helps you fall asleep, but the problem is, is that as it wears off, it causes you to wake up. So these are some common sense things. The room to be quiet and dark. Um, you don't want to have a large meal. You don't want to be trying to sleep in a large, uh, well-lit room that's really loud. Common sense stuff. Stimulus control, very important. You really want to associate the bed with sleep. If every time you went into bed, you had to listen to some political pundit speaking about something that you completely disagree with, you can imagine you're going to get pretty frustrated. If every time you went into bed, you were dealing with family sagas, family problems, and, and, and trying to, to deal with these things, you can imagine over time, the bed would not have the same feeling for you that it should. It should not be a place of thinking about all these different things. It should be a place where you relax and go to sleep, which is why <clears throat> if you're coming to me with insomnia, 
I'm going to tell you there's nothing that happens in bed except for sleep and intimate activities. No reading in bed, no watching TV in bed, no listening to music in bed, because you want to train your body that bed is sleep. Just like the, a rat in a cage, if every time the rat was in a cage, that area of the cage, they get shocked. They to, as soon as they go to that part of the cage, their blood pressure go up, their heart rate's going to go up. If another part of the cage is soothing quiet, then everything sort of relaxes. You want that to happen when you go to bed. So the only thing that happens in bed is sleep. And now the next part is crucial. We want to increase your sleep drive. We want to make you more sleepy. So if you come to me and say, hey, I'm only sleeping six hours a night. I, I fall asleep, it takes me half an hour, 45 minutes to fall asleep, then I'm awake, <coughs> then I fall back to sleep, then I'm awake. I'm in bed from 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> So you're now, from 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the morning, you're now in bed nine hours. The average person in the United States sleeps seven. So what the heck's going on in those extra two hours? You're guaranteeing that you're going to be frustrated. So we've got to shorten that time in bed. Spend less time in bed. So I'll take someone like that and say, all right, you're going to go to bed at 12 midnight, and you're going to get up at 6. And you're going to do that for a few days until you're falling asleep and staying asleep. Once that happens, then you can add like 15 minutes to your time of day. But I want you to gain that confidence that you can fall asleep and stay asleep. And then we can add things back. It's not easy to do. And some of my patients can't do it. But if you can do it, it works about 85% of the time. So again, this is a typical pattern, fragmented sleep. They're in bed for eight and a half hours, and they're only sleeping six. So what I do is, they created this monster. So now what I'm saying to them is, all right, I'm only gonna allow you six hours in bed. Now in the beginning, they're still gonna wake up. But if I keep this up, they get so tired that eventually they're able to fall asleep and stay asleep, and now they have that confidence. And then I can gradually add time back. <clears throat> and maybe give them a total of seven hours. So, in general, you want to spend less time in bed, you want to only do sleep in bed, you want to get that confidence that you can do it, avoid drinking the alcohol right before going to bed, avoid drinking excessive amounts of caffeine, and if you follow all those things, we can get you sleeping better. Any questions about insomnia? Mm -hmm. Yes? Are there any other activities prior to going to bed that you can avoid? You know, kids tell me about the screen. So, excellent question. He asked about there are certain things that you need to avoid before going into, um, into bed. And bright light will generally decrease melatonin secretion and make sleep harder. It will push your circadian rhythm later, so make it harder for you to fall asleep. Intense exercise right before going to bed generally doesn't work. A light walk for some people might work very well. Like if I have a patient who's going to bed at 10 o'clock and can't fall asleep for two hours, I might tell them to take a little bit of a you know, light walk, especially if it's not that cold out. Take a walk to take your mind off of things, to force you to stay awake. Because some people will then fall asleep on the couch or watching TV or the TV's watching them. Right? So in those situations, I'll tell them maybe take a little bit of a light walk so that you can force yourself to stay awake, calm yourself down. But intense exercise would not be good. Caffeine, um, exercise, I guess those are the things that you really want to try to avoid. Another question about something, yeah. Yeah, you said that if you stay awake for a half hour or so, get up and do something relaxing. Playing a game on your iPhone or watching TV, is that relaxing or is that? So actually, it's, that's an excellent question. Yes, what can you do if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep? What should you do? And he's asking about using iPhone or watching TV. <laughs> So the best thing when they've done studies is having people do different things. The best thing that works is doing math problems. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm, I'm being 
serious. Doing math problems works because what's happening is you're forcing your brain to be fo focused on something else as opposed to whatever you're worrying about. It takes brain power, which makes you sleepy, and it's rather boring unless you're a math nerd and love doing math problems. You're very excited about that. But, but actually, that works well. Obviously, the thing that works really well, unfortunately, is driving. Right? That's why people fall asleep driving. <laughs> So, but, you, but things that require you to use your brain and are rather dry. So what I generally tell people is technical material works well. <coughs> History works well. It forces you to think about things, but it, it's not necessarily super exciting. So that kind of material is what you need to do. It works best. TV doesn't generally work because you have the guy, do um, you remember Crazy Eddie, and this job and this thing's insane, screaming at you, it wakes you up, right? So TV generally doesn't work well. I mean, it's meant to keep you stimulated, so it doesn't work. So reading, technical material, math problems, that kind of stuff, puzzles, those kind of things work well. Yes? Do you recommend taking a, a supplement like melatonin before you go to bed to help you sleep? So every time I give this lecture, people will always... Especially if you're older. Yeah, all, people will ask questions like, I drink uh, a little shot of vodka with milk before going to sleep, and I've been doing it for 15 years. It's like... If you've been doing something like that and it works for you, that's fine. The data is not great showing any of the supplements are great sleeping pills. Melatonin has been shown to work in children, not so much in adults, but it's not gonna hurt you. If you wanna try it, you can try it. But, but none of these things have been shown to work well in randomized studies. They're not big studies, unfortunately, but they haven't been shown to work at all. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, I sleep very well. Uh, if I wake up and get for more than five minutes, uh, but I, I think I break the rule about not reading in bed, for example. I turn in maybe at 11 o'clock. I have a, a book that I'm gradually going through. I read for about a half an hour, and that makes me fit especially sleepy. And then put the book down and lock the door. So uh, I, uh, I went straight to bed after whatever activity I'm engaged in the evening. Uh, and I don't think I drop off to sleep right away. I have to think, why am I here? <laughs> well, you're not a person that would come and see me, right? <laughs> So if you're doing something that's working for you, that's great. My dad could drink espresso and then go to sleep. So everybody has ways of, of falling asleep and habits. And if it works for you, that's great. You shouldn't change anything if it's working for you. I'm telling you what we do with patients who come in who can't sleep. You obviously have great genes and you're able to do that. But not everybody can. Yes. I'm always struck when uh, we have house gas or something, and some people think about insomnia. And in fact, if you observe, it's during the day they're napping all the time. Right? And, and so the total hours of sleep is there, but they don't understand. Right. They're screwing it up by sleeping. Like right. the common, the common thing is the patient will come to me and say, I can't sleep at night. I, I get into bed and I'm going to wake for two hours and I can't sleep. So I go, okay, what time do you eat dinner? Okay, what do you do after dinner? I, I'm watching TV. Do you have a dose of fall asleep watching TV? Oh yeah, I always fall asleep watching TV. <laughs> and I said, and so then what happens? Well, I, I, I fall asleep around 9 o'clock. I get up around 11 and then I go into bed and I can't sleep. <laughs> Alright. So yes, that is a very common problem. And in nursing homes, that is one of the biggest problems, you know, with people who have some dementia, one of the big problems is they get put in situations where they're not active during the day. The staff is limited and, they, and they, they don't have the resources. So these people are in situations where they're just sitting in front of a TV that they can't really see very well and they're not doing anything. And so they doze off. And then at night time, they were awake and they're sort of wandering. And, they, and, and then they get medication to try to make them sleepy. And then they get more confused. And it becomes a vicious cycle. 
So one of the things that have worked in it, and uh, Phyllis Lee at the University of Chicago has done some great work in this area, where she's gone into nursing homes and have created activities for these people to do so that they're up, they're, there's bright light, and they're active. And simply by doing that, all of a sudden now they're sleeping fused. So sometimes the answer to your problem at night is what you're doing during the day, for sure. So it's a good point. Right? So uh, I, yeah. my, my solution is uh, I replay the last golf round. <laughs> I'm usually asleep between the third and fourth hole. <laughs> if I made it to the fifth hole, I usually go out and play golf. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. We've talked about afternoon naps and, and they're, they're either assisting or hurting evening, you know, nighttime sleep, and whether the 15 minute power nap versus the longer nap, you know, which is, okay. is any good. All right, so we're. I, I, it's obvious, I'm not going to get through much more of my talk, so I'll talk to you about the naps now. I think naps are very, very important, and naps are very, very helpful. Entire societies have been based on siestas, right? Where people would, would come home after, say, 1 o'clock and have a meal and then sleep for a couple hours, then go back to work at like 5, 6 o'clock at night and sleep and work till like 10, right? So that they would have this entire culture where they would be taking naps. And if you look at our ability to stay awake, in the afternoon, our ability to stay awake drops. In almost everybody, it drops a little bit. Now, some people it's really profound, and they have to reach for a cup of coffee. And other people it's rather subtle. They go for a little walk around the office, and they sort of feel better. But that tendency is there. And if you can take a short nap, some people are very, very good at it. They can take a five, 10 minute nap and feel refreshed. That is far more healthy than, than drinking coffee because you're getting something your body can't get from coffee, which is you're getting a little bit of REM sleep, you get a little bit of that sleep that helps you retain and relearn information. And that's why some of the more cutting edge companies will have nap rooms, right? Because you're thinking about things and you go to a quiet room and you nap a little bit, then you can come back recharged. Now, not everybody's able to do it. And it depends on the person, and some people are so chronically sleep deprived, they're, go, they're working really late at night, they're getting up early, that they go to sleep and take a nap, and then they go into deep sleep. And if you go into deep sleep, then you wake up really groggy, and that grogginess can last for a couple of hours. So in those situations, you have to be really careful. But in general, if you take, and, and they've studied this, somewhere in the range of 10 to 25 minute nap, that generally is short enough that you don't get into deep sleep, but long enough that you feel better from that. So a short nap is ideal for most people. And you have to just judge it. If you take that 15, 20 minute nap, it's unlikely to affect your sleep at night, but for you it may. Um, so everybody's different. Back, back there. Uh, let's suppose you try to take that 10 to 25 minute nap. If you don't fall asleep, is it still beneficial? So, if you're dozing off slightly, yes. If you're not dozing off, the data is a little bit unclear. Like, what if you just meditate for that few minutes? And the data there is, is, is less clear in terms of learning material, uh, understanding complex material, getting ideas. The data is not as good as, as if you actually Take it down. Yes, sir. What is the role of hypnosis in the sleep process? Excellent question. So we have used, we don't do it ourselves there. Um, at the integrative um, care pavilion, we have some docs who will do hypnosis. And I've had patients go for hypnosis, for insomnia, for sleepwalking. Um, those are, I guess, the two that we have used. Uh, hypnosis for. Hypnosis is a deeper form of meditation, right? You just sort of learn to sort of control yourself and control activities and then associate that control with something else. I don't do hypnosis, so I can't give you the details, but that's generally where I've used hypnosis and I've referred patients for hypnosis. Did that answer your question? 
Yes. Uh, what's the mechanism by which Ambien works and what are the pluses and minuses? So now this gets to some of that association data that I was talking to you about. If you if you go on Google and you start looking at Ambien and you look up Ambien associated with dementia, you will find this association written down. However, Ambien has been around for decades. And obviously, there are millions of people who have used it without any difficulty. And so I don't generally have the same reservation. That was better if I could get someone to sleep without medication, of course. But there are going to be patients that need something. And I think it's, it's a medication that's been out there that's tried and true for many years and, and, and works quite well for some people. What I always advise people is if the medication seems to stop working or it's not working as well, is follow the recommendations I had before. Shorten your time in bed. Take the medication about 40 minutes before bedtime and it'll work better. You asked about the mechanism of action. So, Ambien and a lot of the sleeping medications enhance a neurotransmitter in our brain called GABA. And what Ambien does is enhances GABA binding. GABA is a neurotransmitter that slows things down, that inhibits neural function um, from firing. So it just quiets the brain in that regard. Yeah. Um, thanks for keeping us all awake the show. Actually, <laughs> there were some people that fell asleep. <laughs> My question is, why and when do we breathe in, in the same So, many years ago, right, Freud thought that dreams were sort of repressed emotions and that kind of thing. We no longer believe that. Dreams are felt to be a manifestation of our mood prior to going to sleep. So if you are anxious, your, your dreams will tend to be anxiety provoking. Um, if you're sort of calm, the dreams will be calm. So the mood of the dream tends to reflect the mood that you're, you're in. The actual content of the dream is not really clear. People believe that different areas, if you look at where the brain is getting stimulated during REM sleep, it's areas that are not necessarily working during wake. So you're sort of stimulating areas that sort of help you so that if you need those areas, they're available. But as these parts of the brain get stimulated, certain areas of memory get stimulated too, and it will trigger those memories. And then it tries to put it into a context so that it makes some sense. But the actual you know, object of the dream, you know, the rose on the table doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's more of a global sort of feeling that the dream gives you that, that reflects what's going on inside of you. Does that answer your question? But when, when does this happen? That happens during REM sleep. Okay. Uh, REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep, and it tends to happen greater, a greater percentage of it happens in the latter third of the night. So in the beginning part of the night, you have very little REM, and as the night goes on, your REM starts to increase more and more. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so when you wake up, that, that's when you have a big break up. You only recall a dream if you wake up during the dream. If you do not wake up during the dream, you sleep through it, you will not remember the dream because the sleep is amnestic. It makes you forget. So if you're dreaming and you continue sleeping, you won't remember that dream. But if you're dreaming and you happen to wake up, you have to go to bed and something wakes you up, then you will recall that dream. Yeah, Jack. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Yes. Uh, three Americans. Yes. And uh, their work is related to sleep medicine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that's my favorite area of sleep medicine. It has to do with circadian rhythm. And what the scientists did is they were looking, they're doing gene studies, and it started off in flies. And they were noticing that some flies were not keeping the same kind of pattern, daily patterns, and then started studying their genes and see where the genes different. And so there's a number of genes that are closely associated with circadian rhythm. But what's even more fascinating is you can take certain cells out of the body and look at those individual cells, like an individual neuron, and look at that, the metabolic activity, and notice a periodicity in that, in that single cell. 
Now, the periodicity gets lost over time in culture, but they do have it initially. So there are certain genes that help keep us on a biological clock. And the way it works is really fascinating. I don't want to bore you with details, but basically certain proteins are stimulated to be produced. Then as they get produced to a certain level, then they feed back on the system and slow the system down. And this goes on on individual cells. Um, the pineal gland is, is one of the areas that is, is a key component um, of circadian rhythm and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Suprachiasmatic nucleus is right behind where the, the tracks of the eyes are. And that is the control center that helps control circadian rhythm. So their work uh, demonstrated the genes that control the periodicity that, that, that is infecting in all um, animals in, 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 that are on Earth. It's, it's really a really cool thing. And it's actually in plants as well. You can have, you have plants too. Um, I can talk to that. Yeah. Getting back to the uh, nap, if you are taking a 30 minute nap, yeah. and someone wakes you up, yeah. you don't call the parents very much. Does that have an adverse effect on the nap that you're trying to Well, this has an adverse effect on the person who woke you up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're waking you up, then that's, that's curtailing your sleep, so that's going to make your sleep um, less efficient. Now, if you're, if you're a person who will tend to have a nap and sleep for three hours, then obviously if they wake you up and shorten that nap, that'll actually be a good thing for you because it prevents you from getting a deep sleep. So it depends on the situation. Uh, yeah, I, I lost track of who's next to get Some people are night people. Yes, right? yes. And, uh, as a daughter in the graduate school, I always said, do all the best work between midnight and five in the morning. Yep, 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 yep. Can you just speak to the, uh, you know, what, what's going on there? Is that biological or is that just a habit that you can use? Well, it's, it's a little bit of both. There are larks and owls. And there's actually, you, there are the genes that you can f search for that show what your tendency to be more of a lark or an owl. So there's a genetic basis to it that's clearly been worked out. Um, but then there's also habit. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're pushing all day at school and you're learning complex stuff, your brain tends to get tired. So then the tendency is to, is to take to sleep. And then you wake up and you recharge and then you stay up. So then you also get into cycles too. So your habits are also factors in that as well. So it's a combination of your genetics and your lifestyle. <laughs> Yes, sir. An observation. I wear a Fitbit. My find the most useful thing about it is it tells me where I went to sleep, where I woke up. It also tells me how many times during the night I was about to sleep. Right. And I think that is quite useful and it plots out over many months. No, so it, it's actually a very cool thing. From, from my perspective, it's great when a patient comes to me and says, I can't sleep at night. And I'm not quite sure they're being very active and they may be falling asleep on the couch. If they have a Fitbit, it's perfect for me because then I can now challenge them and say, hey, you were doing nothing from 7 o'clock at night to 10. You know, what was going on? Are you sure you weren't sleeping? And I have the Fitbit to prove that I'm right. So it's very helpful for insomnia work as well. But it also goes the other way, where I have patients who feel like they're sleeping well, they wake up, they feel energetic, and they come to me because they say, oh, my Fitbit's saying I'm awake for most of this, this night, and, and I, I'm sleeping horrible. I'm like, wait a minute, but you, you don't feel bad. So what are you worried about the Fitbit? So people can get fixated on this stuff. And the way the Fitbit works, just so you understand, it's basically an accelerometer in the device, so it detects motion. So there are people who tend to move a lot when they sleep, so that's going to be recorded as being weight. And then there are other people who are ready to be very, very sedentary, really hardly move anything while they're sitting around, and that will be recorded as sleep. So it doesn't have any magic powers to figure out what's going on in the brain, but it is a good rough estimate of things. But you shouldn't take it literally. Yeah. You mentioned at the very beginning that sleep is beneficial for memory. Can you explain or talk about 
So I can tell you some of the work that was done to prove that. They've done, they've done hundreds of studies like this where they give people challenges of material to, to learn and then um, give them the equivalent type of material and have them sleep deprived and find and how well they pick up that material. Also, they, they cross over people. So they have one group where they're going to be giving questions and learn a, uh, a, uh, a maze. And they'll do this with animals too. So they learn a maze. And how well do they adapt to that maze and learn that maze if they're sleep deprived versus awake? And then if they then sleep and then come back to the maze, do they, are they better at it? So there's, there's hundreds of studies just sort of like doing experiments. And then they've even done experiments where they deprive people of just REM sleep and see how does that affect their learning versus deep sleep and how does it affect their learning. And they find REM sleep's a little bit more important for learning. So I'm not going from answering your question. Now, go ahead. I, I, I actually heard a talk by a, a guy named Dr. Rudy Tom. Mm -hmm. So, so there are there are studies, more recent studies, that have looked at um, various proteins that build up during wake, and then when you sleep, those chemicals are dissipated, and so that has raised the possibility that sleep is somewhat protective for dementias. But again, that's, these are sort of observational studies, and we don't have respective data to, to prove that that to be the case. But adenosine is, is the drug that has been, the chemical has been studied the most, where as you wake, as you're awake, the longer you're awake, your adenosine levels in your brain continue to increase. And then once you sleep, the adenosine levels drop down. But, but so there are sort of byproducts that occur just from your own function that build up while you're awake, and then sleep sort of helps get rid of those things. And the beta proteins are one of those things that people are speculating. But whether that has to do with Alzheimer's, that's, in my opinion, that's a little bit of a stretch. Yes, sir. Um, could bygone trauma experience um, cause repetitive dreams? Yes. So he was asking about previous traumas in your life. Can those cause repetitive dreams? So there are people with post-traumatic stress that will have repetitive dreams. Now, what area of the brain, why is it that having exactly the same dream over and over again? No one knows that. But, but they're usually anxiety-provoking dreams. And there is, a, there is a way of treating that. But we don't do it at our sleep center. Um, Saul Rothenberg at Greenwich is one of the few people in town that, that do that. And they do something called dream rehearsal therapy, where they will have you rehearse the dream as you're, as you're currently experiencing. And then you change the dream a little bit to make it more pleasant. And then you rehearse that. And that has been shown in a number of studies to be quite effective for people. There are also medications that we can use uh, to treat that, and that we've done in our sleep center. But, but exactly what part of the brain, why does that happen? Don't really know. Dr. Roca, we're, we're approaching noon, perhaps one or two more questions. All right, you decide which questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing very well pointing out people. How about this side? Okay. Right here, um, so are you able to take uh, the, uh, the laboratory to test somebody for possible apnea, either with or without insurance? Can it be done privately? Um, can people do that out of pocket? I mean, we've done, yes. we've done, yes. Yes, but the hospital studies are crazy expensive. The hospital studies, the hospital charges like $5,000, $500 for a hospital study. For a home study, the, the, the costs are, are not as bad. It's about $1,500, $1,700 for a home study. But if a person doesn't have any resources, they don't have insurance, 
there are ways that we can sort of get around things to do sort of sort of studies to try to help a person out. I don't know if that's true. Really but yeah, you can always pay for these out of pocket. Yes. Yeah, it's presented a tons of information. Is any of this available? You can't retain it all. Available on the internet or? Well, you have it videotaped right here. <laughs> um, there is a, a website, sleepeducation.org. That's a, that's a pretty de decent website. And then the, the, the National Sleep Foundation is also a pretty good website. Um, so I, I'll let people go. And if you, you want to come up and ask questions. Or, that's you know? perfect. Let, let's do that. Let's first thank Dr. Rosa for his time. Darby. Um, I'm uh, a representative from Darianne CPAC and I just wanted to start the evening to thank everyone for um, joining us this, this evening. We've been doing this program, College of Support, Support Service Aid, for many years and um, we're thrilled um, to have um, such a wonderful pa panel this evening. Um, we want to start off by thanking our sponsors. Um, we want to um, thank uh, Darianne High School Director of Guidance Megan Emanuelson. We want to thank Darien Library, the Darien High School uh, Parents Association, and this year a new sponsor. We're thrilled to have um, Spednet Wilton joining us as a sponsor. Um, uh, one thing that we wanted to just start off is also just to make sure that the audience knows if you, um, when we get towards the end related to questions, to please put them in the Q&A feature at the bottom. Um, and those questions will be going directly to the panel. So especially want to mention that for any students who are joining us this evening, um, we are doing that just to make sure that, you know, you know, no questions that you have specifically are going to be disclosed to the entire audience. Um, we're going to, we would want to make sure we're respecting everyone's privacy. So um, a huge thank you to our moderator and this phenomenal panel of experts that we have. And without any further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Director of Guidance, Megan Emanuelson. Thank you, Courtney. Welcome, everybody. Um, I was so thrilled to be asked to join this program again this year. It's truly one of my favorite events. And so thank you so much to um, CPAC for inviting me back to be a part of it. Um, and as Courtney said, we're so fortunate to have this amazing panel of um, my higher ed colleagues to share their expertise and their wisdom. Um, they have such information to share on the guidances, um, guidance and services and programs that are available um, in the collegiate setting for students with IEPs and 504s. Um, the format for this evening is that I'm going to ask each panelist to share a little bit of information about their institution and also about our offices. Um, we have some questions that they will respond to and we'll certainly try and save some time, as Courtney mentioned, for those questions that will be in the Q&A feature. Um, a reminder that your school counselors are also deeply involved in your post high school planning um, and they're a wonderful resource for any questions that you have um, after this panel as well. So I would love to take an opportunity to introduce our wonderful panelists that are joining us this evening and once again extend our gratitude for your time and expertise this evening. So joining us from the University of Maryland is Tessa Cahill. She is the Interim Director of the Counseling Center Accessibility and Disability Services. Um, from Hobart William Smith, um, Susan Pliner. She is the Dean for Teaching, Learning and Assessment and Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. From Sacred Heart University, Kathy Rajunas, who is the Director and of the Office of Student of Accessibility. From Hofstra University, Julie Yindra, who is the Director of Student Access Service. 
And joining us from the College Steps Program, Brian Emery, who's the Director of Admissions and Enrollment, and Nancy Tishner, who is the Regional Director in the New Jersey Metro Region. So I think, as you can see, um, really awesome variety in our panelists, and I know that um, they have a lot to share with you this evening. So Tessa, can I ask you to tell us a little bit more about your school and your program? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so at the University of Maryland, um, I think one of the really neat things about my office is um, that we are underneath the umbrella of the Counseling Center. That is not the case, um, as you'll hear from other um, folks on the panel. It's a unique relationship that we have. And what that enables, um, I feel, for our students is that it kind of provides a one-stop shop for them to get comfortable with a whole variety of help seeking um, on our campus. <clears throat> um, we share a building, um, but we don't share records. So we have folks who are connected and heavily plug into whether it's counseling or accommodations. Um, but we also have folks who just rely more on one. <clears throat> And so um, for us, it, it kind of helps destigmatize help seeking where folks think of the Shoemaker building as a variety of services rather than um, you know, singling out one particular um, type of disability. Um, the University of Maryland as a whole um, is located just outside of DC. So we have a lot of cool programming um, and things that gets folks out into our nation's capital. Um, and this kind of idea of collaboration across um, all different areas um, holds true within our campus community as well. Um, there are um, a lot of efforts on our campus to strive for offering a variety of programs for all different types of students with disabilities that are not run through my department. Um, one of those is known as Cigna, and that is specifically, it's a social resource group for students who um, identify as having autism. Um, and so that support provides social coaching, um, helping with the dynamics of college readiness. Um, and it provides a lot of social support, which is really great. <clears throat> There's also um, a program called Succeeds, and that enables students to get a diagnostic evaluation in addition to year-long group or individual coaching for ADHD. And then we um, similarly have partnerships within um, our writing center, our oral communications office, and our career center. So we have liaisons in those departments specifically for students with disabilities so that they can plug into resources that are available to all, but also have a, a, a particular person with an expertise um, with a disability lens. Um, so I think all of those programs kind of help round out um, Maryland. <clears throat> So I hope that um, kind of gives you a snapshot um, for us at uh, University of Maryland. <clears throat> that was awesome, thank you. Susan, can I move to you? Thank you all for the invitation. I'm Susan Pleiner and um, I am uh, in front of Hobart and William Smith Colleges, the, the main buildings. Uh, we are a small liberal arts college in the Finger Lakes in upstate New York, in Geneva, New York. Um, and if you've never been to the Finger Lakes, you should definitely come. It's beautiful here. Um, uh, I am the Dean for Teaching and Learning, and I oversee our Center for Teaching and Learning. And our model, um, much like Tess was talking about the uniqueness of her model. Our model is a little bit different um, as well. So our Center for Teaching and Learning um, serves all students. Um, and so there's kind of three arms of what we do. It's uh, student enrichment, disability services, and also um, faculty enrichment. Um, and that unique combination of having students and faculty engaged together in teaching and learning um, really kind of um, speaks to the way that we operate on campus and faculty mentor and students mentor one another. And um, so I think it makes us unique. And one of the things that, um, that uh, I think benefits our students that are making use of our uh, disability services is that all of the services are open for all students and uh, of the center um, with the specifics of disability services, making sure that you are provided the kinds of accommodations that you need for the courses um, or your campus life. So, um, so we have things that supports, we have um, programs that support students like 
writing fellows that are available for, for all students at any point in the writing process. We have study mentors that help with the transition to college life um, or all through college. Um, so time management, note-taking, reading, kind of managing um, schedules. Um, and we also have teaching fellows, which is one of our largest programs. And that is um, not supplemental instruction per se, but it is um, inquiry-based uh, support for learning in, um, right now 16 departments have teaching fellows. And so they're available every night of the week, except for Friday and Saturday night, uh, to support student learning in those courses in those departments. And um, on top of the study mentors, if you have an athlete um, or are an athlete, we have embedded in athletic teams, study mentors, they're athletic study mentors that are um, trained and supervised to support their first year athletes and the transition to college, um, but also being a, a scholar athlete. So all of those programs are available to all of our students and our students with disabilities in particular um, make good use of those as well. And um, so Disability Services sits, sits in that center. And so we're, we have uh, staff that will support uh, students to get the kinds of accommodations that they need in their classes. Um, and we will help to navigate that kind of relationship building with a faculty member in order to um, get specific within each of those courses. Happy That's to answer the questions. That's great. Kathy, can I ask you to go next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my office is also um, going to be under our new Center for Teaching and Learning, so I'm very interested in maybe catching up with you later on. Um, we work with students who have disabilities, um, help them to get their uh, accommodations. We have uh, uh, myself and an assistant director will meet with students weekly if that's what they need to have a little bit extra support. Um, what we also have, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting over a good old fashioned cold. Um, we also have student success coordinators that can meet with students weekly, bi-weekly. We have students who come in just before finals and, and midterms because they get anxious. And they can work on everything from time management, study skills, helping students to transition and connect with their professors because the first thing you wanna do in the first two weeks when you're a freshman is make sure you make an appointment to meet your professors. And that can be an awkward and uncomfortable um, situation and we can help you write the email. We can even have scripts that will help you um, negotiate what to say when you first get there, especially if you're not going because you have a problem. The student success coordinators are there, sometimes just to give you someone to talk to, someone to listen. Um, they can really help out a lot with that. They also will help connect you to all of our other services that we have. We have an amazing um, tutoring center that for every freshman class, there is a tutor available for you. Um, we have peer tutors. We have professional tutors, which often are professors. And if you get in the upper level classes, um, and we can't possibly have a tutor for some of those more um, succinct classes, we have an online service that 24 seven, you can get a tutor for some of the upper level, even graduate courses if you need it. Um, we also have a pre-fall program. Um, our department puts on, it's called Start Strong, and that's primarily students who come to our section, our students who have disabilities, and you'll come a week early to campus, get to stake your claim in your dorm room, what bed you want, and then from eight o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, you attend different activities. A lot of them are social, a lot of them are to get you used to the campus and get to know it around, but we also have you write your first paper. You do your first um, group presentation, you do some math work, kind of taking the sting out of that first time um, so that when everybody else moves into onto campus, you're kind of the campus expert and you end up helping everybody else out. That is a fee-based program. I do want to let you know that. Um, I talked about the tutoring. We have our online writing lab. Um, a lot of our students with disabilities to take advantage of where you submit a paper and it gives you back, edit, edit, edits it and gives you back some recommendations. The professors love when you do that. Um, we also hired last year um, brand new learning specialists. 
and we're finding that we can take a student who's struggling um, and has accommodations, they can spend time with Wendy and she'll help them learn about their learning style, which is really important information for a student to have. And then she will help them to discover tools that, that work within that learning style. And then they can go back to meeting with the student success coordinator or they can do, go back and try it on their own. Um, and we also are working to create resources for faculty so that they can understand different people learn different ways and they might have to address something differently for a student. Um, I think that, oh, we also have an ASP program in our, for freshmen in the second semester. Um, a student who is struggling and has a lower GPA um, is, is, ends up in this program. It's just an hour a week and we go over a lot of those transition tools, a lot of the, the um, test taking skills, writing skills, um, and resources in general. We talk about perseverance and grit and help give students a little bit extra support um, so that they can try to bring their GPA back up and, and stay with us. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Julie? Hi, everyone, and um, thanks for inviting me to this event. I visited the Darien Library for this event a few years ago, and, and I'm, I'm glad to be back with you all again. Um, I am the Director of Student Access Services at Hofstra University. Hofstra is on Long Island, about 20 miles east of Manhattan. Uh, and so we uh, definitely, in terms of our curriculum offerings and internship offerings, take full advantage of being close uh, to New York City. Um, Hofstra is the largest, I'm, I'm going to put my admissions cap on for about two seconds. Um, it's the largest private university on the island. Um, it is known for uh, a couple of things. One is its school of communication, radio, television, film. Uh, it has um, an award-winning radio station on campus. In fact, in the 13 years that I've been at Hofstra, uh, most of those years, it has been voted the best college radio station in the country. Um, so the school of comm deserves a, a lot of props. They, they do some, some terrific work. Uh, also, the fastest growing programs that we have right now um, are uh, programs in our School of Health Professions. Uh, we have a brand new um, undergraduate school of nursing to complement our graduate school of nursing uh, and our medical school and law school. Um, and we are also a, a very quickly growing uh, school of computer science and engineering. Uh, those are gaining in, in popularity. But uh, as far as, as what's going on, um, on my side of campus, um, I, I'm hearing um, a trend from the things that other folks have been talking about. Um, when I first went into this line of work, the disability services office was in the basement at the end of a hall in a corner and the door was always closed. And it was kind of like that making sausages analogy like nobody ever knew what was going on behind that closed door, but somebody would emerge with a letter that said, these are my accommodations, right? Um, that has changed. We are a large and vibrant office. We serve a large number of students and we are part of um, the student success team uh, at Hofstra. So we are partnered along with the department that runs all the tutoring uh, offices, the writing center, the math learning center. We are uh, we have a close partnership with the career center because we really believe at Hofstra that my job in providing disability support services um, doesn't end right before you graduate, right? My job not only is to make sure that you have a smooth transition into college, but that you also have a smooth transition to the next step after college, which might be graduate school and might be uh, a, a job in your, your chosen field. So we do a lot of collaborative work. We serve a lot of students at Hofstra, um, about 15% of the undergraduate population at Hofstra is registered with my office for one reason or another. We are an umbrella office, uh, student access services that provides all accommodations and supports for students with any kind of disability. So on my staff, 
Uh, I have um, folks that are mental health um, and counseling certified. I have professional learning specialists. I have an assistive technology specialist. So we really are a full service uh, operation um, that serves a great many students. We have, in addition to the general services that we offer to any student who comes through our door, we also have some very intensive and uh, fee-based and specialized programs. We have the PALS program for students with learning disabilities and or ADHD that's been around since the late 70s. Um, we have an academic coaching program that I started about 10 years ago, uh, which is also fee-based and which is really aimed at helping students with that, you know, developing more effective time management, organizational skills, getting that GPA up, uh, working with a specialist uh, on specific, you know, goals that the student may have. And I am also very proud to announce that after several years in the making, we are launching uh, this fall the Lattice Program, which is a program specifically designed for meeting the, the social, emotional, and academic needs of students on the autism spectrum. Uh, so we have a lot going on. Um, a little bit about the background of Hofstra and, the, and, and kind of the reason I went to work there. Um, I've been in this line of work for 30 years and uh, I packed my bags and sold my house and moved to Long Island to take the job as the director at Hofstra, knowing a couple of things. One, that that PALS program for students with learning disabilities has been around since the late 70s. And also, um, you can't tell because you can only see me from the shoulders up, uh, but I'm sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, and I know, um, one of the things I know about Hofstra is that it is the first private university in the country to become fully wheel wheelchair accessible. Um, and so that was part of the reason, that legacy is part of the reason that I came to work at Hofstra. We are a large university that's busy and has a lot going on, but disability inclusion has been a hallmark of our culture for decades. So that's my spiel. Thank you so much. Um, Brian or Nancy, can you tell us more about the College Steps program? Absolutely. Good after, good evening. <laughs> Lost track of time here today. Um, my name is Brian Emery. I'm the Director of Admissions and Enrollment here for College Steps, and I'm joined by my coworker, Nancy Tishner, who's our Regional Director. Um, to tell you guys a little bit about us, we are a nonprofit organization that partners with colleges and universities to provide personalized learning plans to students working in kind of like an IEP segment. So we created our own ICP, we call it that as a play on words. So an individualized college plan, focusing on four key areas. So students creating goals around academic enrichment, social engagement, independent living, and pre-employment training. And what we're really there to do is to bridge the gap between where a student was in high school and having their school really help them with self-advocacy and all of the components that they now have to be responsible for in the college, bridging the connections to all of these departments um, that my colleagues here have talked about with tutoring services and, and so on and so forth, including career services and all the other offices on campus. And we do so through a model of peer mentorship um, so while we're all wonderful, um, we hire other students who have been through the process who can help our students learn that, learn their college, learn where to go, be comfortable on the campus, access not only the resources that every other student's already accessing, but also providing that social support as they learn that new environment. And that's really crucial to the students we work with, especially around um, being advocate advocates for themselves for all those supports. Um, what's really unique about what we do as a partner is that we partner right now with 13 campuses from Vermont to Virginia. So in Connecticut, in your region, that includes Norwalk Community College. 
uh, we partner with both high school districts for 18 to 21 services. We also partner with families privately after graduation, and we can talk more about that individually. I work with every family who applies or is interested to our program. Um, so there's always step-by-step um, -step instructions. You never have to you know, feel like you have to figure it out on your own with college steps. We're walking you through the process from the beginning, whether that's with your school district or uh, post-grad. Um, I think one really unique thing about our program too is because we're not a siloed program and our students are students of the campus, we don't give tours of our program, but we do offer se sessions where families talk about their experiences. And often, while I can talk all day about our programming uh, and tell you all about it, and so can Nancy, it's often really wonderful to hear directly from our students and mentors and teams about their experiences. Uh, Nancy, do you wanna add on? No, I think you covered it all. Thank you for having us. Thank you all for that amazing overview. Um, I'm so excited to learn more about your programs. And certainly I think it's evident, you know, just the variety of different services and how we can look different at each university, which is important for our families to know um, as they're, you know, exploring their post high school options um, to ask these questions about the kinds of programs and services that exist. So one of the most common um, conversations that we're having is that a student's IEP or 504 in high school doesn't necessarily directly translate to the support that they'll receive in a collegiate environment. And so can you talk a little bit about maybe just some of the common supports or some of the typical supports on extended time, of course, you know, I think is, is fairly standard, but what, what are some of the common um, supports or accommodations that students might receive at the collegiate level? We have over 900 students to get accommodations and almost 700 of them have extended time on test or separate testing environment. It's very common. Um, <clears throat> depending on the disability, it, it, it is something that will help remove a barrier for a lot of students. Um, the other one is extended time on assignments. Right now, we usually try to keep it at 48 hours beyond due date because if they have the full semester, then they get really sacked at the end. Um, somebody else want to add in? I'll jump in and, and say that, you know, there's a lot of students um, that can either sit quietly in a classroom and watch the professor and listen and digest and understand what's happening, or they can take copious notes, right? But they can't do both things at the same time. I have students come into my office and I'll say, how was your biology class? And they'll say, oh, it's great. I have six pages of notes. And I'll say, what was the lecture about? I don't know. <laughs> you know, so we, um, you know, the traditional note taking um, accommodation used to be either here's a tape recorder, right? Or I'm going to give somebody in the class a piece of carbon paper or ask somebody in the class to make a copy of their notes. And, you know, there's problems with um, that methodology for lots of reasons. One is that it's very passive right? To stare at somebody else's notes is, you know, not an active participation in the learning process. It, it makes you dependent on what somebody else thinks is important. Uh, the other problem that you have with note takers in the classroom is you have other 19-year-old students who say, oh, sure, I'll do that, no problem. And then three weeks in, your student has their first exam coming up, and they say, I'm not getting my notes. And you go chasing down the note taker. And he says, I dropped that class two weeks ago. Right. So we now are at Hofstra. There, there's a lot of technology out there that can accommodate this particular need. And we are at Hofstra using a note taking program called Otter Artificial Intelligence, Otter AI. And it audio records, it provides a transcript, and it allows the student to pull in multimedia pieces like PowerPoint slides and other pieces that will sync with the audio and allow the student to create their own set of notes after the fact using the audio and the notes provided by the professor 
uh, as well as the transcript. And so uh, those are fairly common things, but I think the question may also be asking what's maybe things that my student might be getting in high, high school that are not appropriate in college. And I'll tell you one that I see all the time. It's called priority seating. It's for the kid who has difficulty paying attention. You know what priority seating is in college? Schedule your classes to have breaks in between your classes and go to class 10 minutes early and sit in the front. Having worked with numerous colleges, I think it changes um, based on the college too. Some colleges will offer things that they find appropriate while other colleges do not. Um, and I was a K through 12 educator for a number of years before coming to college steps and having worked with families, I think the biggest and most important piece families can take into consideration is that there are generally no modifications in the college curriculum. So any changes to the curriculum, what's being learned, even on many college campuses, due dates are not flexible. Um, and what we found is students with skills for self-advocacy who have that support to talk with their professors earlier. The good news is, even though there's no modifications, professors are more and more increasingly being very compassionate to their students and want to set up their students for success. So giving students the skills to talk directly to their professor early on about what their struggles are can sometimes take the place of some of those other um, supports that they received in high school that they won't receive in college. We're, uh, we, again, we're a small liberal arts college and we um, really focus on kind of the uh, mentorship and, and community building, et cetera. So um, we do have a traditional note-taking um, program, but we have technology where the students are getting those, those notes right away. So, um, uh, but it's on campus and we have students that, you know, have it as a job and it's, it's, it's part of uh, their identity on campus as being note-takers and courses. Um, but one, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example of, of one of the things that, um, uh, we, you know, we, we also also offer, you know, digital, um, uh, digital texts, you know, um, students that are, that are listening to their, to their, um, their readings, we will provide that. I mean, that's pretty common as well. Um, mm -hmm. and like Nancy said, there's the modifications to the curriculum aren't necessarily, um, uh, an accommodation. They're not an accommodation, but for instance, I got a call, um, last week right before spring break from one of our um, physics professor and said susan i've got the student and the student's disability is bumping right up against this particular unit that we're that we're having and we're having an exam and i and she's already approached me about it and um, i don't think that she's going to do well on the exam is the way it's written and i just don't know what to do Right. So because I'm also the faculty developer and I work with faculty on their teaching and their scholarship, she felt like she could call me and have that conversation. And so we were able to have a conversation about, well, what about the material do you want for her to actually know? Like, does it does she have to represent it in the way that you are giving the test to everybody else? And it turned out that this is a really the faculty member really wanted this this student to be able to articulate their learning and uh, gave her that section of the exam um, uh, verbally um, and everybody was happy. So, um, so while there's no modifications to the curriculum per se, um, students that, um, like Nancy said, are able to self-advocate and we work with them on the, those skills and helping them to understand. And what I would say to you as parents and students, the more you know yourself and the more you're able to articulate what you know about yourself as a learner, the better off you're going to be um, in all settings. Um, so that's one of the ways that we are. Um, that's one of the that's one of the things that we do on our on our campus as well. But there, I also just want to say that there are some common. Obviously, um, IEPs don't don't travel over to higher education, um, but but the process of individualized accommodations do, right? So it's not a checklist that you pick off of. It really is dependent on who you are as a learner, what, you know, what kind of disabilities that you, that you have, how those are connecting to one another and the setting in which you're in. And it may be different in a 
biology course than it is in a Shakespeare course. And so those are the ways that we're talking um, to you based on the courses that you're in and the type of learner that you are. Well, at University of Maryland, we are a large, we're a D1 um, institution. Um, and we uh, are just shy of 50,000 students on our campus. So we're, we're a very, very large research-based institution. But what I will say is as you're exploring where you want to go, it's very important that you find where you're comfortable. You don't want to, um, I'll say, be distracted by the shiny types of things. Um, you know, um, uh, so I, I know um, I read an article, I forget there's a school down in Texas, but they have like one of those lazy pools where, you know, for studying where, you know, just lazy river where <laughs> you sit. So that's a great feature, but that may or may not be helpful to the, the purpose of getting your degree. Um, so I always think it's very important for folks to first and foremost feel comfortable where you're going, whether it's how far away from home you are, um, you know, my parents, um, I'm originally a New Yorker. And so my mom drew this three hour radius because she said she wasn't driving, you know, to the other side of the country for me. Um, but <clears throat> back to the, sorry, I got off on a tangent there. But when it comes to accommodations, um, I think what is also important for you as families to understand is what is reasonable. <clears throat> so um, uh, throughout the, the COVID um, I'll say era. Um, University of Maryland, we're an in-person institution, very limited classes that are offered online. And so um, when we had to transition, um, we have started to have a lot of students request that they be allowed to attend their classes virtually or that the attendance requirement does not apply to them. Um, so we have seen an increase of folks asking for those types of things, but at the end of the day, you have to think, is it reasonable? Um, so in in high school, it may be appropriate that if you have a, um, a significant medical condition that maybe your high school is going to send a home tutor um, to make sure you don't fall behind in the curriculum, or they might say, um, you know, uh, whatever semester, trimester, or quarters you're on, um, those timelines don't matter. We'll just say you can have until whenever you get it in. But in college, a uh, semester start and ends at a particular point. And our offices, we can't change that. So like if you're absent for um, the tip at Maryland, we have 15 week semesters. So if you miss a month of school, you have to then also be realistic is, can I make up a month of work while still having to turn everything in on time as I go? Um, so some of the things that may be appropriate, um, as we were talking about in that in the high school environment, it, it may not be reasonable. Um, but that's why uh, there are university-wide policies or procedures like deadlines to withdraw um, or the ability to work with your professor and, and take an incomplete. So you do have that flexibility, but it's, um, you know, equity for all. And that's why big umbrella policies and procedures help all offices on campus have um, uh, an outline for how should we strive forward moving together. Yeah, you know, I agree with what everybody's saying. And the word reasonable, Tessa, is is important for uh, a, a couple of reasons. Several folks have said to you know that the IEP doesn't really carry over from high school to college. And that's because the IEP is a function of IDEA, which is the education law that governs the provision of special education uh, and Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1974 provides, you know, for uh, mandatory accommodations for uh, students with conditions that may be an impediment. But when you transfer to college, Section 504 and really the, the prevailing law that governs college is not education law. It's the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is civil rights law. Right. And so the reason the term reasonable is so important is because the Americans with Disabilities Act says that higher education institutions have to provide what is determined to be reasonable accommodations to level the playing field for students with disabilities so that they can have an equal opportunity um, in competition with their non-disabled peers. The problem with that 
uh, is that colleges kind of get to define what reasonable means with within certain boundaries, right? So you have to shop, right? You have to visit the colleges in person. You have to talk to the people who do what we do to find that right fit. And part of the right fit is going to be the services and the level of support that you feel that your student needs from the disability service the access office. But it's also going to be what majors do you offer and how big are you and are you, you know, in a suburban area or um, a metro area, you know, all of those things are going to be factors and you really have to shop for the right fit, the place where your student's going to feel like they have a home for four years or more. So Julie, that's actually an amazing segue to my next question. It's perfect. <laughs> set up there. Um, so as the students start to look towards the admissions process, knowing that, you know, most of you are not necessarily working in admissions, you are working with admissions usually. Um, does the student's disability or plan play any role in admissions? And we always get the question, should a student disclose their disability or their, their plans and their needs in the admissions process? And at what point should they do that if you advise that they should disclose? I think what is very important for families to understand is that our offices really um, shouldn't, I'll, I'll use the term, influence the admissions process in that um, at here at College Park, I have no idea if you write a beautiful essay on um, how your disability intersects with fill in the blank, our offices don't communicate with each other in that manner. So I think it's very important if you decide to disclose, know that you, if anything that is disclosed to the admissions office is not shared with any other office. Um, uh, that's how it works at the University of Maryland. Um, but I, I do feel when it comes to um, your admissions essay, uh, more often than not, you get to pick a question. They give you a variety of, of essay options. And my best advice is answer the question to your best ability. And if you're, if it's like talk about your favorite pet when you grow up, um, if your disability is related to that relationship with your pet, then it is your decision to put it in there. But you don't have to feel obligated to disclose or share any information if there's no nexus to what you're writing about. I, so I, I think you can disclose um, as much as you'd want, but it's also it, it won't um, hurt you in any way if you decide um, to not share. Um, in the same way, it won't hurt you if you do share. Um, so the best advice I have is to answer the question and write the best essay that shows why are you a rock star and why that wherever you're applying to, why should they pick you? Um, and that's what you should focus on in your admissions um, essays. <clears throat> At College Steps, we'll help students through that process. But I think the <clears throat> most important advice I can give um, is to make a plan together and with your other support people about what the student is comfortable with, because I think it will be individualized. And I think a few key things that uh, families and students don't always know, it is it is up to the student to disclose. Um, even when you're in classes, that will not be disclosed by anyone except the student if they choose to, if they have a disability and what that disability is, and even their accommodations is something that they can choose to disclose or use, um, and it's completely up to them. I think another important piece is this is the first situation for all 18 year olds where they have to take on full adult responsibilities. Um, colleges are going to be communicating with the student. Um, they're going to get emails to their email address. They're going to be requested for their um, paperwork um, for the Accessibility Services Office. And while everyone is as supportive as possible, we've heard the numbers that many of these campuses. Um, so definitely understanding how that's the disability informs the support the student needs should also be a part of that plan. Um, and talking with that together and the other support people so you know where you can lend your support behind the scenes versus where the student is really going to have to start to take the wheel themselves. I also want to add something to what Tessa said, uh, and I uh, agree with her. Um, it is totally up to you how to disclose, when to disclose, if to disclose prior to enrollment, right? 
Um, of course, you have to disclose if you are coming to the university and want to seek accommodations, you have to do what we call self-identify. Find the person who does what we do, make yourself known to them and provide whatever paperwork. But the college can't ask you if you have a disability. And if you do happen to disclose that information, as Tessa said, they're not allowed to discriminate against you in terms of your admission to the university. But I'm also gonna say something else. Um, if you are applying to a college and you get the sense that upon disclosing that information, there is some discomfort from coming emanating from the university admissions counselor, or you know, if there's some you know clearing of the throat or rolling of the eyes, or if you get the sense that this is problematic for this university, whatever accommodations you may require, I, I guess my question is, why would you want to go there? Why do you want to go somewhere where you're not welcomed? I think a, a good way to kind of test that theory out is when we have students that come in for um, tours or whatnot, a lot of the students that work that are students that are very comfortable in working with our department and have disabilities. So you almost see them kind of beam if they get a question with that. And, it, and they'll give a true sense of how folks who do disclose having a disability are treated throughout the campus. Um, and it's usually the feedback I get from the parents later on is that it's usually a positive experience and really help them, like you said, tease out whether this is going to be a place that's, you know, um, it, it's it's kind of the who you're going to be around can be more important than the, like you said, the shiny new building or that fantastic gym. Um, and that, that's one way to tease out if that is a true genuine part of the university. If you're at the beginning phases, even just checking the website, um, sometimes the website isn't accessible and that can be a clue right off the bat as well. So, and just to add, so one of the things that our school counselors will do when a student has decided where they're going to enroll is to help do a little bit of that research in terms of, um, you know, helping the student to identify what documentation they might need to bring if they wanted to seek supports or who they might need to contact. The timing of it, every university seems to have a different process and, and different timing. Sometimes they want you to do it, you know, in the spring, sometimes it's over the summer or when you arrive on campus. And so that's one of the things that school counselors are happy to do with kids and families is to um, help to do some of that research about what's going to be needed if you want to seek supports. Um, so thank you all. That was super helpful. Um, a lot of our students with IEPs are receiving um, direct service through like a resource room. We call it a learning center. Um, is there a model at the collegiate level like that where they would be working directly in a, in a learning um, center or resource room support or with a case manager? How does that service translate or does it translate? Some of us have mentioned what we call our fee-based programs, like Kathy uh, oh, and, well, and mine's not fee-based. Sorry. Oh, I, I thought it was. was. No, it's was not fee-based. Fee not at all. Program. Tessa. So, if it's fee-based, it's probably something that is direct instruction, one-on-one, -on -one, and it's probably over and above the general support services that are offered to any student at the university. Our, our student success coordinators are one-on-one -on -one and above, um, and any student with or without disabilities can meet with them, and very often freshmen kind of need that for the, the transition aspect of it. But And they have had students that they stayed with the whole time, um, the, the whole four years, and, and met with them. Um, but we don't have any sort of a, a resource room. Um, I think that it would be a specialty program like you talked about, Julie, that um, you know, checking in the morning and making a plan and then checking how you're doing it and executing it in the evening kind of thing. Um, but there are other supports. We um, each, each um, college has a Dean of Student Success in it also, in addition to academic advisors. So there's a multiple layer that it might work for you here, but not there. I, one thing I think, um, uh, bear with me, I really like corny analogies, so hopefully this will make some of you smile. Um, but at the high school level, um, 
oftentimes the only way you're eligible to plug in for extra help, whether that be connecting with your teachers or any of the support offered in resource room, um, one of two categories are really the only way you access those things. One is if you have a disability or two is if you're failing. <clears throat> so when I work with a lot of students who transition into the college environment, sometimes that doesn't always leave um, the best taste in their mouth, whether it was you felt like you were smothered, that no one listened to what you actually needed and you were um, overly supported, or um, it felt like you were getting your, having you having to pull teeth where you're like, just because I get A's and B's doesn't mean I don't need accommodations. And so when you step over into the college environment, um, as Julie was mentioning, the laws change. So you go from education laws to civil rights laws. But the other thing that changes for all students, regardless of disabilities, is um, the the change from a, a, an entitled K-12 through in, in uh, education to now this is people in college are going there because they want to be there. It's not something that you just get because you live in the United States. And ultimately, supports are offered for everybody with or without a disability. That's why offices like a writing center exist. Um, on my campus, we have something called an oral communication center. So that's all things help public speaking and presentations. Um, tutoring is available for all students. So it really is this mentality shift of, why are we limiting who we allow to plug into all these extra supports? And it now becomes the folks who plug into those, those are now your AB students because they are engaged and take ownership of their education rather than viewing it as, oh, tutoring's for people who are failing. Not true. On the college level, it all flips. Um, and so my corny analogy is if you um, or a student who likes to watch YouTube videos, like you know that, oh, if I don't know how to do something, I'll watch a video, someone will show me how to do it. Use that same mentality to plug into any of these support services on your college campuses, because you're just, it doesn't mean anything about you not having the capabilities. It shows that you know where to go to someone who knows more than you. And if, if anything, if you just take that silly analogy away, um, you know, that will be invaluable no matter where you, you end up going, um, not only at college, but in life, knowing that there's no way you can know all of the things. So just go to someone who knows more to help you figure it out. I think my piece of advice there too is to know why you're receiving those things. So again, we were talking about the difference between modifications and accommodations. Actually going to a resource room is a modification because there's a drastic change in the environment and how you're being taught there. So, and my, and what I've observed is most colleges do not provide a resource room setting, not just the colleges here on this call. It's just not something that's done in college. But I, so I think knowing why, why do you need a case manager? Why do you uh, learn better in a resource room? If you can empower the student with the information that went into making those decisions, which might've been made in kindergarten, right? They might not have been ready yet, but if they're a junior or senior, make sure they know why. Um, and then who, and figure out how you can lean on your current support. So, you know, college steps, we do have someone similar to a case manager. We have a program coordinator who will help monitor the student progress, we'll touch base with them daily. It looks very similar to a high school case manager. Um, and so if you know you need that, then you're going to be looking at schools or other programs that do provide that high touch situation. But if you're really in a resource room setting because you need that extra tutoring, then you might not need uh, someone in a case management position. It might be better if you know that you can go to the tutoring center or you know that your professors teach in small class sizes. So it's all about, again, making sure the student knows why they receive that modification, why they receive those services, and helping them them discover the equivalence that will still serve that same purpose in the college setting for them. Nancy, that's really important. Um, but I think that we don't want to miss the fact that you can't get accommodations if you don't request them. So these other resources are phenomenal and will help you out in addition or sometimes in place of. It depends on what your needs are. But I can't tell you the number of times that I've been frustrated mid-semester after midterm, students come in, I need my accommodations. I had a 504. I didn't think I, I wanted to do without it. I didn't want to be that kid anymore. 
and then they are sitting there and they're suffering and and needlessly going through extra work that they didn't need to do, going around the back of the barn, I call it, um, to get through the front door. Whereas if they come in at the beginning, they get their, bring their documentation, they don't have to hunt for it, have mom and dad trying to dig for it at the school. They get it all signed, sealed, we uh, sign the accommodations, and then they get to decide who gets that information. So they might be a biology whiz and they're not gonna give the accommodation letter to that biology professor, but writing is really hard for them. So they're gonna use their accommodations there. And at any time, a click of a button, they can enact that letter in that class if they start struggling. So again, it's always their control. It's always their choice, but it's so much better to have it there just a click away instead of having to take the energy when you're high stress because you're struggling and try to gather everything up together. That that was all such great advice. I appreciate that so much. And, and as the mother of college age students, um, one of the biggest adjustments for myself and my kids was that like parents really have no interaction at the collegiate level. The expectation really is that the kids are managing it. And so for students where that self-advocacy that you mentioned might still be an emerging skill or they just, you know, they're going to a school and they just don't know what the resources are, or how to access it. Like, is your office the place they should start? Like, how do they get comfortable having those conversations and knowing what supports are available to them? We tell all of our incoming students during the um, admitted students days and the summer orientation uh, periods that our office is one-stop shopping. We invite students in a very friendly way to come chat with us. Of course, when students come for orientation, our office also gets flooded by parents who want to come in and say, here's my son's paperwork. He needs extra time on exams and a note taker, but you can't tell him. Every year this happens, right? And so it, it is a really harsh reality in an, uh, an education for parents. But what I always tell parents is, look, we're happy to hear from you. We're happy to hear what you have to say. We're happy to have you introduce your son or your daughter, but they have to be driving the bus. And the phrase that I always use in terms of what our attitude is about parent involvement is um, a, an old motto from the disability rights movement, which is nothing about us without us. So if you wanna come in and have a chat with me, that's fabulous, but your son or your daughter needs to be in the room and be part of the conversation. Can I, can I also add in, I mean, I think I made reference to it and I think it, it, folks are also making reference um, as well. And so for, for students that have had IEPs for a long time, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, they um, know more about their learning um, than they probably think they do, right? Um, even though they've had IEPs and they've, you know, you've, you know, had meetings without them and their teachers have meetings without them, et cetera. The um, goal is for them to, to, the goal is for them to understand their documentation, their testing, um, and what it really means with the examples, like, right? So, you know, I have an auditory processing deficit. That's what my, do my, do my documentation says. What does that mean for me in a classroom? How is it different for me in, you know, this type of environment or this type of environment? And the more that they are able to engage with understanding that and knowing that for themselves, um, will be, will, it, that is like gold, right? So if you have a kid that has not seen their documentation and you haven't reviewed it with them and they don't understand it, that is gonna be a real deficit for them when they come to college because um, like Julie was saying, you know, they have to navigate for themselves. And I know from my campus and I've been on a lot of college campuses, so it's every college campus, faculty have individual, um, privilege to run their courses the way they were going to run their courses. And um, we are all really good. And I know my faculty really well, but I'm not going to be the one sitting in the classroom with them and um, hearing the assignments. And so the only way to be accommodated and, and, and have 
full access is really for them to be able to communicate with a faculty member what they know. They don't have to say, hey, I have this disability, but they do have to say, you know, remember that letter that I handed you? This is what it means in this context. And I'm wondering if you and I can talk about how I can um, best demonstrate my learning to you. I think this is a struggle for all college students, not just neurodiverse students. Um, you know, I was housed on my campus for a long time, right in the student center, and I could see, you know, students walking up with their parents to the window or calling mom or dad in the middle of the day. So I think something that makes our program a little unique is that we do coach the families through this process, right? Many of our parents will come to us that first week and be like, I have to email the professor. He doesn't know his accommodations. And we're there to be like, no, actually, it would be kind of detrimental if you email the professor and also the professor is not going to talk to you. Um, so we provide that coaching to you if it makes you really nervous as a parent to think about your student having to do all these things on their own, we do provide that support in our program through our program coordinators. And then we also help you identify what the student can take on their own. On, in an ideal world, your student is attending their IEP meetings, probably starting from middle school, I've heard some experts advise, but ideally in their senior and junior year, and they are having these conversations, but we know 17-year-olds, they're not always ready for this. So if you're 17-year-old or 18-year-old, you're really nervous about them handling all this on their own, looking for a program that does have someone who who is going to have an advisor specific to their accessibility services or their disability services using a program like College Steps that will provide that high touch person um, to also facilitate communication to you so you know what's going on um, and can be coached on how you can support the student in a very different environment. That's awesome. Um, Courtney and Sarah, I think we had some um, questions that were submitted. So I think we'll maybe turn it over to some, um, certainly people can continue to add to the Q&A, um, but we'll, we'll take some family questions. Perfect, and just as a quick segue, because I know this was just sort of referenced, was um, could someone speak a little bit about the kinds of documentation typically requested for accommodations? I'll try it. Um, your 504 and your IEP is great information for us to have. It provides a lot of insight and it'll help guide you through our conversation. But it's not considered the legal documentation for um, ADA accommodations. So what we need is something from a clinical specialist um, that has to do with your particular disability. So if you have ADHD, at some point somebody diagnosed you. Hopefully it's within three to five years that you have some documentation from that clinical specialist that says you still have ADHD. We usually require some sort of testing also. Um, if you have a learning disability, it might be a learning specialist at your school that, or, or it might be your, um, your psychologist, your school psychologist might provide documentation, but it does need to be dated and signed by that uh, clinical expert. Um, and a lot of times they will make recommendations for accommodations that will help you, but we are not bound to facilitate those exact accommodations. It's a conversation that we have with you. To be honest with you, once you get the documentation and our intake form completed, the most important part of the process is our conversation with you and what you know works for you, what you've tried and hasn't worked. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is with the documentation, we can revisit it if things aren't working for you. So it's, a, a, it's an ongoing changing process. As you change, we can change with you, but we will go back to that documentation um, for the um, original diagnosis from the clinical specialist. I, I will also say it's important for folks knowing in the K through 12 environment, the school district is often responsible for paying for <clears throat> updated evaluations, um, typically either on a three or five year cycle. But once you leave the K through 12 environment, if you do ever need to get updated documentation, um, it would be the individual's responsibility um, to pursue getting that. Um, <clears throat> and my office and, and uh, every office um, nationwide, there's a, um, 
a professional organization known as the um, Association of Higher Education and Disability, and they give guidance to us um, that, uh, and this also ties into the Americans with Disabilities Act. When the Amendments Act were passed in 2008, they basically told us as providers, stop being the barrier for people to access things. So if, if you've had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ADHD, or you were diagnosed when you were seven, you've had an, an IEP throughout, and what you're coming to college for is, I just want to have extra time, and here's a stack of documents this big that all support that, we would not then say, oh, your stuff is too old, you're out of luck. Um, that would uh, be um, uh, unreasonable for you as a family. But if, if you came in and, and said, um, I want to have uh, a foreign language substitution, um, we might need to have some updated documentation. So it all it all comes down to what are you asking for? But we do, um, just because it is of a certain age, you're not automatically disqualified. So that's why, um, as Kathy was saying, that conversation piece is so important because it's going to help us understand, do we need more to be able to know if something's uh, reasonable and appropriate? Absolutely. And I, I think yeah. what these... I think what what Kathy and Tessa uh, were saying is, you know, it used to be there was very strict rules about what current documentation, how it, that was defined. And that has, you know, that has changed over time. If you can show a lifetime of a condition and a consistent, you know, support for that condition, that's, you know, that's going to be very helpful. The the documentation that's required will depend on, again, on the particular college or university, right? And what their particular documentation requirements are. It'll depend on the scope, uh, the, the, the nature of the disability. So if you have a psychiatric condition, a detailed di you know, letter from a, a psychiatrist that outlines your diagnosis and how it impacts you is probably gonna be sufficient in order to demonstrate your need. It really, it, it's individualized to a great degree. But the other thing that a lot of us have realized is that during COVID, um, even those of us when who have had fairly you know, strict standards in terms of the the currency uh, of your documentation. We know that across the United States during COVID, lots and lots and lots of students never got retested when they were supposed to, according to the triennial evaluation schedule um, dictated by IDEA. A lot of school districts just did not provide that service. So, you know, we're 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 mindful of that, and we're being. Um, we're being as as lenient as we possibly can to make sure students don't you know, come to college and not be able to get the services that they need. I'm going to add on one little extra caveat to that, though, because um, you know we definitely have guidelines and for documentation, and totally COVID has messed that up. But what I would say is, if you're in a school district, and um, certainly it's this is disability dependent, right? Like if it, you know. Um, if you were blind at birth, you don't need to to get reevaluated to be blind, you know, um, at 18, right? Um, but there are some disabilities where you know the developmental process, um, you know, growing up, getting strategies, those things change, right? And so. Um, not it, the documentation, you know, like we asked for documentation within the last three years for a couple of reasons. One is it is the most accurate representation of who you are as a learner, which then helps us the best to help you in the differing, um, you know, types of learning environments that you're going to be in, right? So testing from when you were five, year, five, five years old, even if you still have ADHD, isn't going to help us to make sure that you are getting all the things that you need in your classes. So, and also if you're intending to go on to graduate schools, if you're going to go to um, law school, or you're gonna take the, G, the GREs, those things matter in terms of updated testing as well. So just to, to balance those things out, yes, it's not like there's a barrier, but it's also a benefit if you're, if you're able to have updated testing. 
Yeah, and um, I think I would also add that the valuation can be waived by the IEP team. So even if sometimes we just, the student doesn't want to sit through the test. This is the one where the psychiatrist meets with them and maybe the speech therapist, and it can be lengthy. So a lot of times I've noticed teams will waive that for a few years. Um, So it's always helpful to just check with your IEP team. And most of the time it's actually right on the IEP to make sure that you are getting, um, you do have an evaluation that has been within the past three years. Great, thank you so much for that. Sorry, Kurt, I, just want, I just want to let families know that um, we can provide copies of, of whatever, you know, whatever the testing that we've done, anything in our files, a copy of the most recent IEP or 504. So we can certainly help in providing families with putting together the, the documentation package that they'll need. And again, the school counselors are happy to help to look at, you know, again, it varies depending on the disability, depending on the school, what is required, when it's required. And um, so we'll certainly assist families in getting that together in any way that we can. And having been through that for myself, I will say Darianne's fantastic about getting you and helping you through that process for sure, too. Um, One other question that we got was about um, any kind of living accommodations or social supports that your schools might offer. We offer housing accommodations, again, establishing that there's a true barrier, either accessing the housing or accessing other um, school amenities because of your need. <clears throat> we just finished that process today, as a matter of fact. Um, so you have to go through the same process, even if you have already received academic accommodations, the housing requirements are different. Um, and we will do our best to meet your need, but sometimes it has to do with the availability of resources. Um, limited number of single rooms for an example. So if I have a student who has um, needs uh, someone physically to help get them dressed and ready for the day, I'm probably going to give them a single room before I'd give someone who needs a single room who had anxiety or something like that. It's not that one is more important than the other, it's that the need can be met in different ways compared to the other one. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that that's our, our housing accommodations. Um, it, you do have to provide additional documentation that speaks specifically to that need um, for a housing accommodation. Yeah, we have housing accommodations too. And um, like many others, the student has to work not just with our office, but also in compliance with the, the timing and the required paperwork through the resident's life office to provide what they need on their timeline. And as Kathy said, there's a finite number of rooms on any campus. And so, yes, we do provide single rooms for students when it is determined that that it is in their best interest. But one of the questions that the provider has to answer on the form that they have to fill out for this says, given the additional isolation that is inherent in a single room, is a single room still in the best interest of the student? So, you know, we're cognizant that for some students, it's they may think they might feel more comfortable in a single, but it might not be medically in their best interest. Um, and also, there's a limited number of wheelchair accessible rooms. So that single, like Kathy said, might have to go to somebody who's a wheelchair user who has a personal care attendant that comes in and out every day to assist them rather than somebody who would like to have a single for a variety of reasons. Um, At Maryland, we also do um, housing accommodations um, and and pretty much any accommodation you would need because you're a student, whether it's employment, housing, dining, um, all is through um, our office. Um, But one thing I think is important when it comes uh, particularly to housing, Um, Some institutions um, have certain features that are just standard for all, like air conditioning, as an example. Um, At the University of Maryland, not every residence hall has air conditioning. So um, some of the things that um, in our documentation that you would give to your provider, we're looking at not only in terms of medical necessity, um, but we're also asking them, do they have any other recommendations for things they think could be helpful? Um, so um, when it comes to um, housing-based accommodations, uh, not everything, oh, this applies for all accommodations, but just because it's 
recommended doesn't mean again that it's reasonable and some things fall outside the purview of having a nexus to disability so for example asking to have a roommate um you know that there's a, a separate process for a roommate request that you don't have to you know disclose the disability just to live with you know your best friend um so just being mindful of that too so for college steps as a you know nonprofit, and we're we're not the college we work with the colleges we do not provide residential support however we provide extensive social support to students so providing them a mentor to go to clubs or activities uh, on campus or sometimes even off campus um, are really important for the students that we work with and we also provide some of our own internal clubs and activities as well through our cross-campus sessions yeah, something I'd like to add that I don't think we've mentioned yet is that our mentors are hired, paid, and trained by us. Um, so that means our social support can actually become very individualized. Um, our mentors are required to attend a weekly supervision with our instructional coordinator, where they are able to say, here, th this is what the student's struggling with. How can I best support them in their clubs or meeting people on campus or they're oversharing in conversations? How do I help? And then on the other end, we are also providing group trainings about the skills of what makes a great support person be able to help socially. So they're learning kind of those professional skills as well. And then they can just blend in. Like they're, it's never going to be obvious that they're a mentor going to the cafeteria with them on campus. So it's a really great support system. And then I've mentioned our program coordinators a couple of times. Um, they also provide intensive social support. Um, our program coordinators are highly qualified qualified professor, pro, pro, professionals coming from the world of education or special services. Um, and they get to meet with the student on a weekly basis in a one hour meeting. Um, and we're like overly qualified life coaches. So many of our students are not living on campus, but even if they were, or they were um, any kind of social situation that they're struggling with, they get to meet with the program coordinator weekly and get their own tips and tricks about how to handle that, how to become um, you know, more engaged in the school environment. And I think that's frequently what we hear from parents and students, how they feel so supported, how they have a little community within the co campus community, how they're able to take the skills they've learned in high school and actually use it in a real world setting has been some of the greatest pieces, I think, of any college experience, um, but specifically getting to work with those trained professionals who can kind of blend in at college steps has been super helpful for our students. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, just, I know a few people mentioned a relationship with counseling, but um, because there are so many comorbidities between disabilities and mental health, I'm just wondering if you could share any, um, you know, connections you may have, or is that a separate process related to getting um, accommodations for mental health? Um. At University of Maryland, even though we're part of the Counseling Center, we do not have uh, mental health therapists um, a, a part of our direct unit, or more like um, sister units. Um, so if some, um, at University of Maryland, um, being that whether we are, as I mentioned earlier, about 50,000 students, there's no way that um, our college would be able to have a psychologist or a therapist for one-on-one -on -one therapy for 50,000 students, you know, year round. So there is a limit on the number of individualized one-on-one -on -one, uh, mental health counseling sessions that they can have. They limit it, um, I believe it's uh, 10 per calendar year. Um, but what they do offer is uh, group offerings um, and uh, free resources. They have like anxiety toolbox things that like you can watch in and enjoy free classes um, and offerings that aren't that one-on-one -on -one therapy based um, related to that. But in terms of accommodations, you can have anxiety and need extra time on um, exams or uh, those types of academic or um, housing accommodations um, for a mental health-based diagnosis would follow the same procedures um, to get accommodations. But if you were looking more so for that treatment-based or intervention-based, that would be a separate office on, on my campus at least. Yeah, mine too. We, we are the office that 
is responsible for providing accommodations, like Tessa said. And we often find that our students that have anxiety, like Tessa said, like to use our testing center where students can receive extra time just because knowing that they have the extra time and knowing that they're in a more comfortable, more inviting environment where there's a water jug and a big bowl of candy and a friendly face, you know, sometimes that helps them to avoid the anxiety that often comes with high stakes testing. But so we provide the accommodations. But again, if you are looking for treatment or counseling, we do have a counseling center at Hofstra and we do refer students back and forth. But even though we're much smaller than the University of Maryland, all of our student, students uh, couldn't go to our counseling center for regular counseling appointments that are individual either. I mean, that's just impossible. Hobart and William Smith has the same model. I think it's pretty standard for counseling services to be separate from disability services accommodations, uh, but collaborative. Ours are separate and too, but I think something that COVID changed is the telehealth is very available to students now, and a lot of them continue on with their own private therapist. But if they do run into some difficulty and need immediately to see somebody, our counseling center can fit them in. Yeah, and, uh, our program coordinators um, do is they will help connect a student's team. Um, what all colleges have set up is a mini world within a world. Um, it models the employment world, the social world, and how mental health services work in, um, you know, after college. So our program coordinators work closely with teams to make sure if a student has a therapist that they're included in our team, um, as well as um, making sure the student's connected to services that are available on campus and giving them the tools to access those independently, to follow through on making appointments, attending appointments, those skills that go into maintaining your personal mental health. We also have a series um, on mind body health where we're teaching students mindfulness and anxiety strategies. They can attend that virtually um, as well as in person as part of our program. Great, awesome. Another question that we got was, um, so your child, you know, gets admitted and is excited to go and <clears throat> The question is like, when? So when is the best time to start to like really reach out and start the process? At our school, as soon as you get your Sacred Heart um, email, you can start the process. And it's always better to do that over the summer. Um, we um, will meet virtually with a student if that's easier, or if they wanna have their family involved, that's certainly their choice. But just so that students know, if you have that good solid documentation, it's a matter of us reading it and then we're meeting together to decide. So you could have accommodations in a matter of hours and your professors get their accommodation letters electronically. Um, so you could work it very rapidly. But like I said before, it's best to not wait till the last minute to do that. <laughs> um, Same at Hobart and William Smith. As soon as you get your credentials, um, we'd love to hear from you. And you can set up your portal and um, submit your documentation. And um, we will be um, connected and we will start that process. Same with me uh, at Hofstra. As soon as you... As soon as you know you're going to be part of the pride, we want to hear from you. Um, similar at Maryland, but there is one change for us. Um, for incoming students, we just ask you, you can get on the calendar prior to this, but we, we won't be able to confirm your accommodations um, while the spring semester is still underway, just because we have to make ourselves available for students who are currently taking classes. So. Um, Maryland graduates, uh, uh, what is it, May, almost th this time and two months from now, uh, end of May. So I usually welcome families to get on our, our calendar um, after Memorial Day. Um, but uh, as um, Kathy said, it's, it's a big shift because you can go from a process that may take months in high school to like, I, I've literally met with students an hour before their first class and they have everything they need. Um, so uh, you can also meet with someone in the middle of July and they never disclose until after Thanksgiving. So that, that personal 
piece, um, you know, we, we work pretty quickly. Um, and then it's up to the student to then take the next step to disclose. Uh, so with college steps, we start the process with you pretty early. It's a little bit different um, on our end. We start, I'm already accepting students for next fall now, and we start our process through our ICP, sitting down, talking about goals and planning um, pretty early. So right away in, in the beginning of the summer, uh, and then we're working with students through the process at the college, making sure that you're ticking off all those boxes to get in touch with these offices. Yeah, we work pretty closely with the directors of accessibility services to help with all the submission of paperwork and making sure students have those meetings as well. And, and then we have one or two kind of more specific questions. One was, um, could a lesson be video recorded as an accommodation? Uh, again, COVID, COVID really yeah, it threw a wrench in that one. <laughs> I think we all used to have a patented answer, but we, we had to transition because um, we were remote for a while. We transitioned to back to being a full in-person college with some hybrid courses. And I did have one student who still expected to have the, the video recording. Um, it really would depend on your documentation, what your diagnosis was, and if it was reasonable. Mm -hmm. So I had a student who was in the graduate program, in the OT program, and it was not reasonable, first of all, because they're discussing client, uh, confidential information about the clients because they're actually doing clinicals. And they're also expected to go home and do a clinical evaluation based on what they learned that day, and then they discuss it the next day. So she would have all the answers. Um, kind of thing. So it, it, we, we have to consider the essential functions of each course that you're taking. And your accommodation, regardless whether it's a video recording or any other accommodation, cannot interfere with the essential functions. And, and what that means is what you're there to learn. Um, the, the, an essential function wouldn't be the way in which it's taught or the way in which you demonstrate it's being learned, but what you're actually supposed to be learning, can the, in, the uh, accommodation cannot impact that. If you're taking a speech class on giving public speaking, um, you, you can't have an accommodation of not having to do presentations. Uh, so it really comes down to the essential functions. Um, many of our professors kind of list the essential functions in a program in the syllabus so that students know what they're contracting in to learn and, and how they're going to learn. But we always help both the professors and the students to tease out what the essential functions are. I have to say that it is odd. Um, it's not very often that we would give that particular accommodation. But we do use, um, I think Julie was talking about software for note taking, and that is technically a recording of the class. It's not a video recording, it's an audio recording. We use Gleam, which you can put a marker in to where you need to pay attention to that particular part of the class and then go back and just listen to that section of the lecture. So that is a recording, but that is specifically for students who are having great difficulty with note taking and couldn't pass the course without that. Yeah, I would add like, that may not be as useful as many people picture it because of what Kathy said, right? If you have a three hour long class and you're recording it, then the student needs to find time to go back and rewatch that three hour long class and they're still gonna have to find the important information. So typically when teams ask us for that or sometimes even sound recording or asking for the mentor to write down everything the professor said, um, that's not as useful as we would picture. The, these uh, technologies are really super helpful in teaching the students the note-taking skills so that they can pull that information out is more useful um, than you know taping the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I was gonna say, um, I, I think some people, it's a knee-jerk reaction to ask for that because during COVID, they got people, people got accustomed to it, right? That was the, the mode of uh, delivery for, in, for a lot of students and they just got used to it. And so they're asking for it. It's probably not in your best interest most of the time, right? Um, and also what Kathy said, at Hofstra, it depends on your program and the course requirements and the professor, right? In, in some college environments, 
that kind of technology has probably been used for a long time and is readily available. I mean, I remember seeing YouTube videos of MIT lectures years ago, right? Um, but at, it's really, you have to ask, right? And at Hofstra, I can't offer that as a blanket accommodation. I have to consult with the professor and find out if that is acceptable given the course and the professor. I, I would also say part of the process to determine if that's appropriate, um, we also have to look at um, uh, is it an equitable education experience? Um, call, a lot of college classes involve, um, like uh, if you're in a writing class, for example, let's swap papers with each other and you know provide feedback. Um, there's a lot of, um, at Maryland, um, our classes are actually broken up into lecture and a discussion section. And so if there are any types of um, like small group work, um, if you were, um, you know, logged in like we're on right now with a lecture and everyone else is in person, is that equitable if you're almost ignored, right? Um, how do you get equal attention to people who are physically in the room and also on the screen? Um, but the other thing is we, we can't um, change the modality of the course or um, uh, some classrooms may not be equipped to video record. Um, is also important. You, know, you you could have a lecture hall that has all the bells and whistles with the recording equipment, but then you could be assigned in a room that literally just has a chalkboard. So it may not actually be uh, capable of, of recording things either. <clears throat> uh, and then one last question um, that we received was, um, and this is going to be so different according to every student is so different, but any, uh, so for a student with significant dyslexia, you know, what kinds of um, accommodations would you you generally see at your schools? I think this was mentioned by someone else earlier, but accessible books, right? Accessible um, reading material that is provided in an accessible format and dictation software, right? Students can learn how to use dictation software so that they don't have to write or type individual letters and and these uh, these softwares are often um artificially intelligent so they learn the students patterns and language and vocabulary over time right so it requires investment by the student of time and effort um, but well worth it for students who really can't decipher the printed word. Sometimes it's as simple as um, in our testing center, a, a student, uh, we okay with the professor, but they needed to have scrap paper that had grids broken up into it so that they could compartmentalize the different parts of a very complex math program. And once we were able to have the professor approve that they could have, you know, five pieces of scrap paper, the student just took off. But with with trying to write it in the very small little, you know, straight line um, wasn't going to work for him. Um, but the speech to text software is wonderful, and they do have that for math now, which is um, Equatio, which is wonderful. So it, it, again, it's something that we tease out when we meet with the student um, and, and then we will dig for resources and work with the professor. Yeah. I have also seen folks with dyslexia benefit from um, an ability to not fill out a scantron or those bubble answer sheets. Um, if that's a particular concern of, um, you know, mismarking those or then just figuring the time lost in navigating filling them out correctly. Um, so I've also seen, um, on the, what, no matter what the level of severity is for dyslexia, where that has been uh, quite helpful for folks. <laughs> well, on that note, just because I like to be very on time too, we are going to wrap up the panel. We are so appreciative to this like phenomenal group of experts. Uh, every every year it's amazing, and this year is no exception. I mean, just such a wealth of information. I wanted to let everyone know that we, we are recording this, and we will be sending out the recording along with contact information for our for our wonderful panelists, which they have graciously offered. Um, so we appreciate all your time and thanks for everyone for joining us and have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you all. all. Take care.
Good night. so diligently and so hard in our community. Um, we welcome the dignitaries who are here this evening to celebrate the generous work of the Darien neighbors. Um, we have U.S. State Representative Jim Hines is with us. Um, members of the Darien's Board of Selectmen, Monica McNally, our first selectman, will be speaking. And if I left anyone out, I'm really sorry because I didn't see you. I apologize. Um, the mission of the Community Fund is to inspire people and mobilize resources to strengthen our community. Since our founding in 1951, we have distributed over $20 million to local nonprofits and community initiatives. Since 1979, this is our 43rd year, that we have been recognizing individuals who have made a difference in and around our community. That's why we're here this evening to honor and applaud, I encourage all of you to do a lot of applauding, Darien residents who give of themselves to make a difference. I hope they inspire all of you to create the ripple effect and give of yourself in the community. Volunteering is so important to the community fund that we established the Volunteer Hub last November. We have two local residents who volunteer as our hosts. They will interview you personally and place you in an organization where your interests match. Um, we started in November and we've had many individuals take advantage of our program, so please check it out. We're happy to launch you in your volunteering career. So we updated our celebration this year and we invited our entire community to celebrate this evening. We have the following categories. Outstanding adult volunteer, 19 to 64 years of age. Outstanding senior volunteer, 65 years and older. Outstanding emerging volunteer, 18 years or younger. Outstanding volunteer duo. Outstanding volunteer team. Outstanding volunteer family. And outstanding new volunteer. This evening, our presenters will recognize each awardee by name and will read a short summary of their volunteerism. Each summary was written by their nominator because we felt that came straight from the heart. Following the presentation, there'll be a reception. Please join us in the back of the room. This evening could not be possible without the help of our volunteers. I want to personally thank Robin Ackerman, who has crossed every T and dotted every I for the past two years. Thank you, Robin. Um, thank you, Kate Maydich, who is a Darien High School student, who is our volunteer photographer today and at our Darien Road Race. Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you, Amy Bell and the fabulous DCA staff for hosting us. You've done this for years. Thank you. Um, the Community Fund Board of Directors, Honorary Board, and staff team are indispensable. Thank you all for your support. And thank you to our longtime sponsor, Brown Harris Stevens. We go way back. They've been sponsoring this event for years. And a great big thank you to Cross Private Insurance for your generous sponsorship. Thank you for making it happen. Finally, thank you to all of you Unsung Heroes this evening. Our world is a better place because of your generosity. Thank you. We're going to announce each volunteer, and we ask if you are here to please come up, accept your certificate, and return to your seat. Kate will take a quick photo of you, and then at the end, we ask all honorees to come back up for a group photograph. Um, we'll then have a reception at the back of the room with Carolyn's absolutely fabul fabulous events. I highly recommend the cookies. Um, I'd like to welcome Amy Bell, the Executive Director of the Darien Community Association. Welcome to the Darien Community Association, and thank you, Janet. Um, as you know, as a fellow uh, community nonprofit and a longstanding one, um, we're very happy to continue our strong partnership with the Community Fund of Darien and provide our venue for this wonderful event and um, celebration of volunteers. The DCA is proud to be the place in our community for nearly 100 years where people gather, give, and learn. 
And I just wanted to share a few examples uh, just from the last few days of the range of what we offer to the community. Last Friday, 3,000 Easter eggs were snatched up in record time, and I think record time is about 45 seconds, <laughs> um, as young families enjoyed a beautiful morning for our annual Easter egg hunt on the front lawn of the DCA. Everyone loves a good book, and we just announced with their bookstore a May 10th event with actress Juliana Margulies of ER and the Good Wife fame, and we're doing that with their bookstore. Tuesday, our board of directors approved more than $65,000 in need-based scholarship awards, which will be presented later this spring to Darien High School graduates, um, as well as reapplying DHS graduates who are currently in college. Tomorrow, we commemorate Earth Day and the DCA's contribution to open space and conservation in Darien, our four-acre bird sanctuary, right here on our Middlesex Road property and open to the public. As part of Earth Day, we also celebrate the DCA thrift shop where reused items not only help those on a budget, but support sustainability and environmental efforts. And tonight you're enjoying the DCA in our role as an event venue that is available to all for any kind of special gathering or occasion. Tonight's certainly one of those special gatherings and occasions. Uh, so we hope we'll see you soon at the DCA for something else. And thanks again, congratulations to all of the honorees. Please welcome Mon Monica McNally, our first selectman. Um, I'm going to start with the proclamation. So, whereas the Community Fund of Darien is a leadership organization that improves the lives of our neighbors in need in Darien, Norwalk, and Stamford, by increasing, by investing wisely in local human services agencies and community initiatives, and whereas for 43 years, the annual Darien Volunteer Recognition Day has honored outstanding members of our community who give their time and talents and resources to help make a difference in the lives of others. And whereas the Community Fund of Darien is proud to celebrate our community's spirit of volunteerism for individuals and projects that have made a significant difference in our town over the past year, and whereas we welcome all of you and are pleased to honor you during this special day. Now therefore I, Monica McNally, first selectman of the town of Darien, by the virtue of authority vested in me, declare Thursday, April 21st, 2022, the Community Fund of Darien's 43rd Annual Volunteer Recognition Day and be it further proclaimed that I encourage every resident of the town of Darien to support the community fund of Darien through their generosity of time, talent, and charitable donations to this unique not-for-profit organization and join me in celebrating all of our outstanding, extraordinary volunteers. This is dated April 21st of 2022. Thank you. So I have a few additional remarks. It's an honor to be here, to have this opportunity to thank all of you for all you do for Darianne. Volunteerism is something that I feel very strongly about. The people being recognized here today have dedicated their time, their energy, and their expertise to a wide variety of services and organizations that benefit all of us. The town of Darien simply cannot exist without its volunteers. We run on our volunteers, and it's impossible to even count all of the countless hours that people have volunteered. All of the town boards and commissions, there's over 30 of them, are staffed by volunteers. We have numerous volunteers stepping forward day and night to handle emergencies that come through to the fire department and post 53. Parents are serving on countless committees throughout the entire school system. Coaches help, teams, ever, all, all different sports at all different levels, and there are all of the church and not-for-profit organizations as well. We all know that Darian helps state neighbors. 
whether it's bringing meals to fam a family that's in need or groceries to an elderly neighbor or helping out with giving a ride or helping out shoveling some snow in the winter. We all know that there are countless ways that our neighbors help each other. And while these may seem like small gestures, we also know how much they, the people that are receiving them appreciate it. As I read through the list of honorees and all the work you've done, I was so impressed by the diversity of organizations and the variety of programs that are served. Among us today are people that have used their skills to raise funds, communicate messages, and engage other volunteers. Volunteers have dedicated their time to programs for children and teens at the ABC House, the Depot, and the Boys and Girls Club of Stanford. We have people here that are providing pro bono legal work to immigrants and architectural knowledge to our town projects. Others have worked to preserve history by creating the Heritage Trail and honoring Darianne's 200th birthday. <coughs> Looking at you, Al. The volunteers present here include individuals that have aided in the distribution of books to underprivileged communities throughout the world and have helped teach English as a second language. I've mentioned just a few of the services that are being provided by our honorees, but you'll learn more as the program continues. When I was young, my dad taught us, our whole, all, all four of our, the children, that it wasn't enough to leave a place as you found it. You really should work to make it a better place. Darien is a better place for all of you. I am quite sure that if a mountain needed to be moved, I would be looking out at the faces that could get it done. So I applaud you, I appreciate you, and I wish you continued success in all your endeavors. Thank you. There are a few folks standing in the back, and I hate when people do this, but there are a few seats up here. Please come forward if you'd like a seat. Please make yourselves comfortable. Um, I'd like to welcome Ned Saunders, who is the Executive Director of Operations for Brown Harris Stevens, one of our sponsors to present some of our volunteers this evening. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, it's great to be here. We appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. You know, this is my 15th year coming to this. Earlier, um, in most years it was the luncheon, and, but I do like the forum tonight. So I've been coming for 15 years attending this event, and we're always so honored and proud to be a long-term partner with the Community Fund of Darien. So let's get started with recognizing some of our volunteers. The first volunteer to be recognized is the Outstanding Adult Volunteer, and this is Diane Boston, the Mather Homestead Foundation. Diane is a relatively new member of the Mather Homestead Foundation Board of Directors who has had a major impact in a short time. Her experience as an architect and her education in grant writing and at Yale's environmental school have made her a uniquely qualified to lead the foundation in the award of a substantial grant to perform a condition assessment of the Mather home and property, which will enable the foundation to property preserve its home and plan for its future for years to come. Diane is also mission-focused and a great partner to those who help the Mather Homestead Foundation fulfill its goals. So let's recognize Diane. Congratulations. So the next honoree is Michael Catano of the Darien YMCA. Mike Catano served on the Board of Directors for the Darien YMCA since 2015 and as president since 2020, but his involvement in the Y started long before that. Mike volunteered to coach his son's youth basketball team for five seasons starting in 2012. During his tenure on the Board of Directors, Mike also has also served on the Membership and Marketing Committee and Development Committee, along with heading the Executive Committee. 
Mike's leadership has been instrumental in navigating the why through the pandemic and rebuilding. When asked in 2020 what the why means to him, he stated, the why is all about community first, about ensuring the vitality, the physical, and the mental well-being of all members of the community to make sure that no one goes without. If someone needs assistance, the why is there for them. During Mike's tenure as president, he has also assisted in guiding the Y through updating financial policies, increasing our con contributing income, recruiting new board members, and creating a succession plan for the future of the board. While his time on the board of directors is coming to an end, it is certain that Mike will always be a supporter and advocate for the Darien YMCA and the community. Come on up, Mike. Our next volunteer is Carolyn Cavallo with the Darien Arts Center. Carolyn Cavallo joined the Darien Arts Center as a member of the adult dance troupe in 2007 and has been volunteering and serving on committees since then. Carolyn joined the DOC Board of Directors in 2017 and has served as president of the DAC Board for the last year. Additionally, Carolyn serves on the DAC Lighting Committee, which was formed to properly upgrade their theater lighting system. Whether Carolyn is dancing as the chosen adult cast member in our annual scenes from the Nutcracker performance, organizing friends to attend a theater performance, or selling t-shirts at Rocktoberfest, she always goes above and beyond. Her leadership abilities, impeccable organizational skills, nonprofit knowledge, and overall work ethic make her a valued volunteer leader. One of the DAC board members said it best. Carolyn is the gold standard of what it means to continually generate growth ideas for a nonprofit. She is selfless with her time, brings best practices from other businesses for consideration, strong leadership, and most importantly, really big heart and soul poured into every interaction she brings to the DAC. Congratulations, Carolyn. Our next volunteer is Elizabeth Fitzpatrick with the Building Woo! Water Community. Since joining the Building One Community's Immigration Legal Services team as a volunteer attorney in 2019, Elizabeth Fitzpatrick has shown enormous dedication and results in improving the lives of immigrants in Fairfield County by helping them apply for and receive the immigration benefits for which they are eligible. During 2021, Elizabeth was the volunteer attorney who contributed the most time to this pro bono legal work. She devotes one day a week to holding consultations on immigration issues, and she can be found frequently at the office on other days for client meetings and case preparation. She worked with more than 60 individuals last year on a wide range of issues, naturalization, applying for green cards for eligible family members, helping immigrants who are victims of serious crimes or domestic violence, renewing the status of the DACA recipients, renewing work permits, and helping an Afghan refugee family apply for humanitarian parole. Elizabeth is a shining light for the immigrants she works with and for the staff and other volunteers of Building One Community. Congratulations, Elizabeth. So our next volunteer is Christine Gould with A Better Chance in Darien.
Christine Gould first got involved in ABC in 2016 as a committee chair for its 35th anniversary gala and worked tirelessly running the live and silent auctions. She joined the board in 2018, immediately took on the role of fundraising chair, and quickly stepped up to be a co-president in 2021. Christine truly wakes up every morning thinking about how she can help each of the eight students and their two resident directors. She is always anticipating the needs of the students and willing to drop everything to help them. In addition to the day-to-day -day responsibilities of running this program and managing a large board, Christine also volunteered to cook the weeknight dinners for the house. She cheerfully cooks and delivers dinner for 10 several nights each week out of the goodness of her heart. Christine does the work of a dozen volunteers for ABC, and she does it all with a smile and genuine love for the girls and the ABC program. Congratulations, Christine. Next, we have Carrie Kelly of the Darien Foundation. Carrie, who joined the Darien Foundation Board in 2015, puts in extra hours as chair of the DAF Media Committee, a joint venture between the Darien Foundation and the Darien Athletic Foundation. DAF Media provides STEM and teamwork opportunities to high school students who live stream Darien High School varsity athletics, student concerts, as well as many community events. During 2021, Carrie worked closely with an innovative team at DAF Media to expand programming to include performances at the Darien Arts Center, as well as lecture series at the Darien Community Center. Carrie also serves as our design chair, lending her eye to graphics and visual pieces related to grants, outreach, and benefits. During her tenure at the Darien Foundation, a refrain they continue to hear from their community partners is, we need a Carrie Kelly. <laughs> Not only is she enthusiastic and eager to embark on collaborations, she is also perceptive, diligent, and kind as a teammate. Carrie has made significant contributions to the work of the Darien Foundation, as well as to the benefit of Darien. Congratulations, Carrie. Next, we have Laura Mosier with the Darien Book Aid. Laura Mosier's volunteer work has been critical to Darien Book Aid's operations this year. Every week, they receive boxes and boxes of gently used book donations in their lobby, and Laura has consistently sorted through the donations every Wednesday morning. This is a crucial role at Darien Book Aid and one that few people volunteer to do. This job ensures that the books they donate to underserved populations around the world are relevant and in good condition, and it also ensures that other book donors will have space to drop off their books when they arrive. Laura is an active board member of the Darien Book Aid and has been co-chair of our book committee for two years. She was also a member of the nominating committee in 2021. Congratulations, Laura. Next, we have Rita McKenna Olson, uh, the Family and Children's Agency. Rita has been an active volunteer and donor of Family and Children's Agency since 1996. In the past year, Rita has helped organize specific food collections and a winter accessories collection for clients who are struggling with food insecurities and to help keep them warm through the cold winter. 
Rita recently was voted in as the chair of the board of directors after becoming a member of the board in 2008. As, and she is also co-chair of this spring's gala committee to celebrate the FCA's 80th anniversary. Rita is also a hands-on food sorter for the Senior Umbrella Services Program, which provides fee free food to low-income seniors living in Norwalk. She is sensitive to clients and their needs, and her warm demeanor and bright smile make her all around make all around her feel comfortable. In 2020, Family and Children's Agency awarded Rita the Ann C. Carey Volunteerism Award. Congratulations, Rita. <laughs> Next, we have Ann Reed of the Town of Darien. The Town of Darien is honored to acknowledge this volunteer work of Ann Reed during the coronavirus pandemic. Ms. Reed was a valuable resource to the health department by aiding in the coordination of many volunteers needed to hold the 60 vaccine clinics that were held at Town Hall. Her demeanor and organizational skills were part of the reason so many volunteers came back to work at reoccurring clinics. Ms. Reed also volunteered to work shifts at the clinics herself. She has provided a great service to our community and it is with sincere appreciation and gratitude that the town of Darien acknowledges Ann Reed as an outstanding volunteer of the year 2022. Congratulations, Ann. Our next volunteer is Depika Saxena of the Darien Nature Center. Yeah. Topeka leads the Darien branch of the Pollinator Pathway Initiative along with Juliet Kane. Topeka has served as an invaluable member of the Darien Nature Center's Board of Directors for the past five years and works on the community programming. Subcommittee to the Champion Green Living and Environmental Stewardship. She sits on the steering committee of the Pollinator Pathway Northeast and in addition to her roles, is in the process of updating their website. She has an ever evolving organic garden that she started in 2010, full of native trees, shrubs, and plants that provide a safe and native habit, habitat for birds, butterflies, and other pollinators and insects all free of pesticides and other synthetic chemicals. Topeka has unlimited energy and passion when it comes to the environment and champions changes at the local and state level, whether that be by writing testimony or joining rallies. Through the Darien Pollinator Pathway, she is spearheading the planting of trees in Darien in an effort to combat rising temperatures and flooding in the town. She is also, simply put, just a joy of a human being to know and one of Darien's most passionately civic-minded individuals. Congratulations to you. Next, we have Amy Sarbanowski with the Darien Land Trust. Amy has been on the DLT board for 10 years and her contributions are tenfold. Amy has worn many hats, many which revolve around her considerable journalistic skills, reporting on many topics during an extraordinary time of growth and evolution for the Land Trust. She has woven together countless DLT press releases, interviews, and stories, and is a stickler for accuracy and professionalism. During the pandemic, Amy began researching and compiling a unique video series on beekeeping and the native gardening and posted on social media. 
Following these hit series, Amy conceived of a video series to run during DLT's 65th anniversary year in 2021. She again did her research, contacting and interviewing past notable DLT trustees and officers, then edited them for final release. The Darien Land Trust is grateful to Amy for leading DLT's outreach committee for many years and for sharing her journalistic expertise. Congratulations, Amy. Next, we have Kathleen Sartorius with the Family Centers. Kathleen is an English tutor who has been working with adult learners who are learning English as a second language for over three years. She gives two to three hours per week teaching her evening classes all while juggling her young family. She unselfishly plans her lessons each week and provides high quality instruction that is rele relevant to their daily needs and she also acts as a mentor to her students. In addition to teaching grammar and vocabulary, she educates them about local community resources that will truly make a difference to them as they strive for independence and self-sufficiency. This academic year, Kathleen took on a new challenge and is teaching a higher level group and is focusing on teaching civics. She engages them in a deeply caring way, helping them learn and understand U.S. history and government, which helps them acclimate to our society in a deeper and more meaningful way. This will also be very helpful as they move towards their citizenship process. Kathleen's commitment and love for teaching is deeply inspiring and truly impactful. Congratulations, Kathleen. Next, we have Shannon Silsby of the Darien 2020 Bicentennial Committee. <laughs> the Darien 2020 Bicentennial Committee is pleased to acknowledge Shannon Silsby for her tremendous work bringing together the Darien Heritage Trail. Shannon, Shannon volunteered as project manager for the Darien Heritage Trail in the spring of 2021 and has taken this project from whiteboard to installation in one year. The trail denotes important historical sites around town. Shannon spent hours gathering the content, text, and images to tell each story, liaising with noted historian Ken Reese, pouring through photo archives, and collaborating with other town representatives. Shannon crafted the layout for each marker, coordinated their manufacture and installation, and shepherded the project through the many final town approvals all while working a full-time job and being a mother of four teenagers. <laughs> Shannon's passion for the project, her attention to detail, her determination in the face of complications, and her expertise in marketing and product management have brought a level of professionalism and excellence to the Darien Heritage Trail. Thanks to Shannon, these markers will be a lasting legacy of rich history of Darien for all of our community to enjoy. Congratulations, Shannon. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Jenny Tarleton of the Depot Youth Center. In addition to being an exemplary board president, and volunteer, Jenny Tarleton demonstrates an extraordinary commitment to our community. 
Jenny has served on the Depot Youth Center's Board of Directors since 2017 and has held the position of Board President for the last three years. Her work with the Depot has been remarkable. In 2021, the Board of Directors, led by Jenny, engaged in a reflective and thoughtful planning process that resulted in a strategic planning document and led to key changes at the depot. Jenny led the search for a new executive director and program director of the depot while Janice Marzano retired after serving as the depot's youth center's program director, director for over two decades. Throughout a year marked by significant change in leadership at the depot, Jenny has helped steer the ship to ensure the depot's mission to serve stu the students in Darien remains on track. Jenny goes above and beyond in everything she does for the depot. She exemplifies the term unsung hero. Congratulations, Jenny, and thank you. Next, we have Natasha Tomei of the Boys and Girls Club of Stanford. Natasha Tomei has served on the Board of Directors of the Boys and Girls Club of Stanford for the past 15 years and has volunteered in many impactful ways, including fundraising and connecting with other volunteers to the club. Natasha deeply cares for the well-being of the youth of the club and provides N95 masks, sanitizers, and various PPE items during the pandemic, as well as providing healthy snacks during workout activities and several turkeys to the club families for the past several Thanksgiving holidays. Natasha exhibits sincere belief in the safe, and nurturing environment of the club provides and has continued a mentorship relationship with a youth who has gone on to live a successful adult life. Most recently, Natasha leveraged her relationships to secure the village, a highly desirable new location for Boys and Girls Club of Stanford to host their annual corporate 5K and the title sponsor for the club's annual spring gala. By volunteering and serving on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Stanford for the past 15 years, Natasha continues to fill a significant unmet need in the lives of Stanford's most underserved and deserving youths. Congratulations, Natasha. Thank you. Next, we have Terry Vandegroff. With her understated intelligence, inclusive management style, and breadth of experience in the community, Terry could not have been better suited to help lead the DCA as co-president during a challenging time. One of her noteworthy contributions is her role on the DCA's Technology Task Force to identify, assess, and implement a hybrid event technology platform. Terry not only helped with higher level concepts and processes, she also continued to roll up her sleeves and assist with, with the execution of events. In her role as co-president, Terry has a gift for fostering positive and productive group discussions so that participants, especially volunteers, feel recognized and appreciated. When working with the staff, she offers insights and suggestions in an encouraging and supportive way, and they always have merit. Terry embraces all aspects of the DCA's work in the community whether spreading wood chips in the DCA's bird sanctuary and nature trail or helping to secure donations to the DCA thrift shop. 
The DCA is grateful that Terry will remain on the board as well as join their scholarship committee to help fulfill the DCA's longstanding philanthropic commitment and support of Darien High School graduates. Congratulations, Terry, and thank you. Okay, next we have Mary Beth Wright with the Domestic Violence Crisis Center. Over the years, Mary Beth has donated her time and energy to countless nonprofit organizations. For many years, she served on the board of the Dwelling Place of New York. She also had numerous senior management positions in the magazine publishing industry. She moved to Darien in the fall of 2020 and has already become an active volunteer and fundraiser with the Domestic Violence Crisis Center headquartered in Stanford. The DVCC is grateful for Mary Beth's contributions. Thank you, Mary Beth, and congratulations. Next, I would like to do. Uh, I would like to introduce my co-host here tonight. Uh, so please welcome Christina Gregory of the Cross Private Client Insurance Group. Thank you, Ned. Thank you, Janet, for asking me to do this for you. Um, so I'm going to start by announcing the outstanding senior volunteers. First, we have Kathy Hain from Family Centers. For the past four years, Kathy has been an English student working with adult learners who are learning English as a second language. She is deeply committed to her work with her students and brings a joyful and positive attitude each week. Kathy has a can-do attitude and was amazing during the onset of the pandemic when she seamlessly shifted to teaching virtually. She was motivated to learn new teaching techniques and was fearless learning new technology. She teaches intermediate level students the necessary language skills that help them at work and with their children. Focusing on relevant topics and providing robust learning atmosphere in her in-person and virtual classes, Kathy is deeply committed to the program and regularly attends tutor development meetings and, partici and participates by sharing teaching tips and effective resources. Her kind and generous spirit is reflective in her relationships with her teaching partners and with her students who often give her positive feedback on program surveys. Family Centers is grateful for her generous gift of, of her time. Thank you, Kathy. Our next volunteer to be recognized is Michael Lemieux from At Home in Darien. After caring for a loved one, Michael knew that there were other seniors in need of assistance, and he reached out to At Home of Dar At Home and Darien to offer his help. Michael has been volunteering with At Home and Darien as a friendly driver for over three years. With the utmost patience and compassion, he drives Darien seniors to and from medical appointments, as well as to the senior center and grocery stores if needed. He also accompanies the seniors to their, their appointments. Michael has all of the attributes one looks for in a volunteer, reliable, friendly, and happy to help. One of the seniors, Michael's, one of the seniors Michael drives shared with gratitude, I wish to congratulate Michael for receiving recognition of his service to our community. I am always impressed as a passenger when he gets out of his car to open the door for me. It's a reflection of civility by God, of bygone days. At home in Darien, thanks Michael for being a true gentleman and an outstanding volunteer. Congratulations. Our next volunteer is Bob Marchese, star lighting the way. Bob Marchese has been a member of the star board of directors for many years who is always willing to jump in and help. Bob is a caring and friendly person who is well liked among the star board of directors and star staff and clients. He and his wife have attended all of STAR's fundraising events to show their support over the years, and Bob has never hesitated to help in any way he can. 
Bob helps with the setup for all star events and no task is too menial for him. Bob is an asset to star and they consider themselves very lucky to call him a friend and volunteer. Without a doubt, he has made an incredible difference in the lives of many star clients and star staff. Congratulations, Bob. Our next volunteer is Al Miller from the Museum of Darien. Al was an inspired choice of the chair of the Bicentennial Committee and representative of the Museum of Darien in all of the activities. When Al undertook the role in 2018, it was, da it was a daunting task which involved coordinating multiple committees of volunteers from the community, nonprofits, and town agencies. No challenge was too great for Al, including the COVID interruption that ultimately postponed the majority of activities from 2020 to 2021. Prior to 2020, Al organized and led committees focused on public on publicity, historical markers, and events targeting the entire community. From solemn events like the anniversary day at Slauson Cemetery to the family-oriented beach bash at Weed Beach. When in-person events became impossible, Al quickly switched to online meetings to maintain momentum. No task was too small for Al, whether it involved assembling and dis disassembling a gigantic cake for the Memorial Day Parade and Beach Bash, uh, sporting a costume for the reenactment of the raid of the Congressional Church on, for Heritage Day, or greeting elected dignitaries at opening ceremonies. The tremendous success of the Bicentennial is due to, entirely to his leadership. Congratulations, Al. Our next volunteer is Don Smith. Don is with the Matter Homestead Foundation. Don Smith has been a volunteer, docent, and archivist of the Mather Homestead since the home was generously donated by the McPherson family, Mather descendants, to the newly created Mather Homestead Foundation in 2017. Don spent several countless hours combing through documents left by the family, which has involved lots of time in, in the spooky attic. To understand the family's history over six generations, Don has written 76 blogs and counting, which have enabled the Mather Homestead Foundation to bring history to life at the homestead. Don is also archiving for their, all their documents to create a system which will be accessible to the public online. Finally, he is one of their fabulous tour guides who welcome visitors to the homestead and tell stories of the past, always with a friendly smile. The Mather Homestead Foundation would, like to, would not be where it is today without Don Smith. Congratulations, Don. Our next volunteer is Alec Wigan of Future Five. been a vital volunteer member of Future 5 for the, over the past year and for nearly 10 years prior to that. Alec has been Mr. Everything over his many years, a dedicated one-on-one -on -one co college coach guiding the seniors through their complicated college application, essay, and finance process, seminar coach where he has conducted group workshops on the basics of good writing, job job prep coach working with students on the interpersonal soft skills needed for the whole for the workplace bird watching coach sharing his favorite hobby with our students on an adventure at cove island wildlife sanctuary and future five fundraiser doing everything from stuffing appeal envelopes to advocating for future five with saint luke's church outreach in the darian community Alec Bling brings his humor, his many life experiences, kindness, and a willingness to share all of that with the young members. In honor of Alec's recent 70th birthday celebration, congratulations, <laughs> our founder penned it the following haiku recently titled, Dude Ascending a Staircase. <laughs> he ascends our stairs, bookish birdman, gentle giant, shares his life, God's love. Alec has touched the lives of literally hundreds of students and staff. The Future Five is thrilled to see Alec Wigan honored by the Community Fund of Darien. Congratulations, Alec. <laughs> Our next category is Outstanding Emerging Volunteers. Lucy Brennan of Open Doors. In 2021, Lucy launched 
launched the second chapter of Feeding 500, a student leadership group which helps the Norwalk Social Service Organization open doors, provide food for those in need of our, in our community. Lucy took on the role of president for Feeding 500 Darien, recruiting five teams totaling 25 high school students in less than a year. Feeding 500 Darien has been able to provide the equivalent of over 4,400 meals to open doors through fundraising and food drives. Lucy's team also held an incredibly successful holiday food drive that brought nearly 500 pounds of food to open doors. Is grateful for Lucy's dedication. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next volunteer is Hannah P. Gunn. Hannah P. Gunn, the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut. Hannah was approached by the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut to speak about the emerging mental health crisis to St. Luke's Healthcare Club, a group she founded. Afterwards, she wrote an article about CGC services for the school's paper and organized a fundraiser to benefit our programs. Hannah's passion for community health care helped her see the synergy between CGC's partner, Community Health Center Incorporated, and Operation Med School, a student-run organization focused on educating youth about medical careers where Hannah has volunteered since 2019 and is now a board member and workshop director. She also asked CHC's senior leadership to participate in an OMS International Innovat Innovation Conference she was helping to coordinate, which provided 25 medical and healthy health policy professionals for panels on topics including vaccine equi equity and telehealth's impact on undeserved communities. Hannah now volunteers at CHC's Refugee Clinic, providing hands-on support to Afghan families across all of Connecticut. Congratulations, Hannah. <laughs> Our next volunteer is Alexis Lyons of the Darien 2020 Bicentennial Committee. The Darien 2020 Bicentennial Committee is recognizing Alexis Lyons for the work she performed in constructing the Heritage Trail mini-site and oral histories. Darien's Heritage Trail consists of nine markers placed at points of historical interest to draw attention to the rich history of our town. Alexis created and executed the trail's mini-site presentations focusing on oral histories, which includes three audio interviews per marker that are accessed via a QR code. Alexis conducted both in-person and virtual interviews and edited and incorporated them into a mini-site. Due to Alexis's hard work and creativity, the town of Darien will be able to showcase its proud heritage through oral histories to Darien residents, town visitors, and all lovers of history. Congratulations. Our next category is Outstanding Volunteer Duos. Uh, Jessica Cahill and Celeste Marsh. The Community Fund of Darien. The Community Fund of Darien is delighted to nominate Celeste Marsh and Jessica Cahill as outstanding volunteer duo for their work on the Community Fund's Volunteer Hub, where they serve as creators and hosts. Celeste and Jessica poured their enthusiasm into creating a high-service model to help Darien residents find the perfect volunteer opportunity. They are on call for Darien residents who are seeking to give their time and talent. They reached out to local nonprofits to assess their volunteer needs and then reached out to the local public to find volunteers. They take the time to meet one-on-one -on -one with each potential volunteer so that they may best understand the individual's wants and then place them with a local organization. They follow up with both the volunteer and the organization within a few weeks of check-in. Celeste and Jessica deeply care for that each volunteer finds just the right spot. The Community Fund of Darien is grateful for this dynamic duo to, for following their hearts to engage local talent with organizations who need help. A match to benefit all. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Next we have Joan and Paul Ellis for Person to Person.
Joan and Paul Ellis are among the original volunteer drivers for for Door to Door, the home delivery program that was started in response to the pandemic two years ago. They have volunteered more than 1,400 hours delivering food to our homebound clients, and they continue their two-day-a-week commitment helping their clients receive food and other essential items, such as diapers and household items. Clients who are directly impacted by this program include those who, who were in quarantine, senior citizens and parents who need, need to stay home with their children, learning remotely during the pandemic. Joan and Paul are reliable and flexible, two major attributes that are gold in, many non, in any nonprofit organization that relies on volunteers. Their humble compassion for person-to-person -person clients and its mission is, mo is most admired by fellow volunteers and staff. Congratulations, Joan and Paul. Final outstanding volunteer team, Karen Brennan, Deborah Hertz, and Sarah Newman of the Strategy Group. Deborah Hertz and her team, Karen Brennan and Sarah Newman of the Strategy Group, have been instrumental over the past two years in supporting local agencies and specifically the leadership of the age, at the agencies. On a regular basis, Deborah reaches out with resources, a helping hand, insights, and a regular support group for a agency leadership. There is no doubt that, the, that through Deborah's efforts, Kids in Crisis is a stronger agency. Congratulations. for all the staff that's here. Thank you all for being here this evening to honor these folks. Um, we invite the recipients to come up to the stage so we can get a group photo, but everybody else head to the back because there's some great treats. Thank you for coming this evening. <laughs> So we'll start uh, with the working group introductions. I guess we could start with Curtis. Um, so he can brief us on his background and introduce himself. Sure thing, good morning. So as you know, I'm Curtis Butler. Um, I've lived in Darien since 2013 with my wife, Arlene, and two daughters, Charlotte and Claire. Um, I think one of the reasons I was asked to join this, um, this discussion is our eldest daughter, Charlotte who is almost 17, believe it or not, is um, has verbal palsy and has, is non-ambulatory, so she's been wheelchair-bound her entire life. And But she also is an adrenaline junkie. So we get her out as much as we can, skiing, water skiing, sledding. Um, when we were in New York City uh, on, and at our home um, in Darien, uh, swing all the time. So, um, so yeah, we love we love what we see when we get kids like Charlotte moving and get them out in out in nature. So I'm happy to contribute any way I can. Thanks, Curtis. We appreciate it. You're in a unique position to do that. Should we do a quick I'll, I'll I'm Patty Baumgartner. Uh, we've done this for the ones been on already, but uh, Patty Baumgartner. I've been in Darien for uh, going on 23 years, and uh, I've uh, been on the Parks and Rec Committee for 14 and a half 
I've been on the art camp for 14 and a half years and have been on the Parks and Rec Committee for a long time. And I am excited to be on this working group with you all, um, especially since we have the ARPA money, so we don't have to do fundraising, so we can move forward with these um, three playgrounds, Cherry Lawn, McGuan, and Baker, to get them to the next stage after about 18 to 20 years. Thank you. I'm Susan Daly. Uh, I've lived in Darien since 2004. Um, I've been on the commission for almost, I guess, 15 years, a long as serving member. I did the playground by the sound um, in, um, at Wheat Beach, so kind of a little bit of experience doing that. Um, but I'm happy to be on this committee to see what we can do for the other playgrounds in town. <laughs> I'm Kathy Laura Petty, and I'm on the Parks and Rec Commission. I've been on the commission for about three years. I've been in town for about, I guess, about 15 years. Um, and I apologize for the barking dog. Someone, the garbage man came earlier. <laughs> so, but I'm really excited to be on the playground committee. I think it's a wonderful resource in town, and I'm excited to how we can get it to be used by even more people in town, um, of and new people as well as existing residents as well as as well as your daughter and other kids in town who would love to get outside. Devin, do you wanna go? Could you wanna, Devin or Ruth, can you come off mic? Sure, hi. Uh, my name is Devin Skian. Um, I believe it says McBride on here. It's my maiden name. Uh, we've been in town for three years. Uh, we were in row eight and for seven. Um, Ruth sort of brought me on a couple weeks ago saying that they were looking for some local parents um, from each elementary school to be, you know, part of the playground program. Uh, my kids are fourth, second, and pre-K. Um, so we are still avid users of all the playgrounds. Um, I would like to say that my five-year-old is very vocal about going to all the playgrounds as much as possible. Um, we're big cherry lawners and as we call Baker Park Dinosaur Playground. Um, still absolutely loving to go there, but does I think my older kids have grown out of that one a little bit. So she's always pulling for it. Um, so yeah, I guess I have your live uh, attendees. So we've got a lot of insight onto what they love about playgrounds. So I hope I can help. And I'll jump in after that. I'm Ruth Zakaria. Um, I'm a occupational therapist and I have about 20 years of experience working in pediatrics. Um, so I hope to be able to contribute um, some of my developmental milestones and um, ch knowledge of kids um, to this group. I am, um, like Devin said, I have um, two kids that were very actively involved in the community. I've lived in Darien for about five years. Um, and we, um, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and I was assigned to help with the Baker Park. Um, so we're very excited to um, work together and try to get that park up and going more so for some of the older kids because I've done a little bit of research and realizing it's right now catered more towards the little guys. Um, so hopefully we can bring some new ideas and get that um, up and going. Pam, did you, you can't get through? Oh, you nothing, huh? I guess, Devin, the only other, um, since we're going to move on to the review of the playgrounds, did you have any preference in terms of what committee or, because we've kind of divvied up all the different parks to kind of, you guys can do the market research with your kids, um, give uh, us input. I think Ruth had said, if d did I want to join her um, at Baker? Baker, okay. Was there, do you, you also mentioned you did some cherry lawn too, right? Or um, I'm just being, a, we're just there constantly, whether whatever sport with three kids and sports in town uh, and dogs and all that, we're there quite often. Yeah, no, I was thinking that since you um, are spending a lot of time there, even if you're not officially on the committee, I just want you to make sure that you input because you do have such a great range of ages there. And if you're a heavy user, you know, you could tell us about what's going on at the park faster than anybody else. So I'd appreciate appreciate that. Um, also, um, since Curtis has to jump off at 915, I believe, can we, if you don't mind sharing some of your thoughts on the parks that are being targeted for um, renovation uh, change. Happy to do it. So um, we lived in the city, New York City for a long time and then moved out to the suburbs. And 
some of the observations, uh, we just see things differently, right? We notice stairways that we wouldn't have noticed before, right? We notice how difficult it is to get in and out of places. Um, but specifically to the playgrounds and parks, I think two things are, are um, always welcome. Number one is to see a, a um, kind of special needs friendly swing. Um, and there's a company that makes them of various sizes. We always recommend, you know, the really big ones uh, that can accommodate larger kids. You'll see them sometimes when you drive by a playground, they have these big red or blue, almost rubber looking um, platform kind of swings, like big chairs, but they're more horizontal. Um, it's called Gen Swing. It's a really good company. Um, we've always had them at our home and, um, and we actually um, got one installed at Ox Ridge when Charlotte was there. And uh, so that's always, that's always a big deal. And um, it's even popular among the typical kids. They just think, oh, this is interesting and fun and big. Um, but it's a, it's a really big deal for, for you know, families with, with kids um, you know, that have difficulties being on a regular swing. The other is the surfaces I would think about. Um, you know, one of the traditional and frankly, one of my historically favorite, because I'm a, I'm a gardener, would be like, you know, wood chips or something like that. But that is not very wheelchair friendly. And that's something we discovered at Oxridge. So I couldn't actually get on the sidewalk or the lawn to the swing because it would just get stuck in the dirt. So um, I know, you know, other places around have those, have those kind of rubberized surfaces. Um, with padding underneath, which is great for all kids for fall, but it's also super conducive towards either a stroller or a wheelchair. Whereas the the more natural versions, which would be my my natural inclination, really don't work for that at all. And there's frankly a lot more upkeep for those. So I think some of those more um, you know more revolutionary surfaces, I think are uh, I think are quite helpful with that. And then for playgrounds, you know, in general, yeah. No, I was just going to say, we are looking at poor and play. Pam's been examining that for a while and talking it up. And I know um, Susan used a portion of that for the playground on the ground. And I went over and looked at what um, they did in Canaan at Mead uh, Park. And so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely explore that. Are there one or two parks in other areas of Connecticut that you find are really – um, ADA complaint or, you know, given your choice that if it was closer, you'd go there? That's a great that we question. Could so the place, the place we go most often is um, Cove Island in Stanford mm -hmm. off season, right? Because they charge you like $5,000 a day just to yeah. take a walk <laughs> in the summer. But um, the reason of it is it's flat open and there are paved walkways so we can take a really nice long walk along the water, something we can't do at the beach, right? And I'm not suggesting anyone should change that. I'm just saying we can't do that. What we do love about Weed Beach is that Charlotte can, we wheel Charlotte in and she can sit under cover at the picnic tables that, you know, under the roof. Um, and we have lunch there 50 times during the summer. So that's really nice. But, but, um, Generally speaking, you know, the, the new Highland Park has a nice walkway. Um, so we can do a full, you know, perimeter a couple of times, which is nice. Again, just to get out, you know. Um, and the key is there's good handicap parking. Not that the town should be orienting everything towards this community because it's not, it's a relatively small percentage. But it is nice you pull in there and you see the blue signs right there, right by the path. And it's really welcoming. Um, so that's always something you know that you look forward to. Um, so you know, when considering playgrounds, if there's a way, if you're planning some sort of pathway, that it's you know not be something that gets you know muddy, um, you know, or if it's just a plain old dirt pathway is not going to be conducive towards uh, wheelchairs and frankly even most strollers for the little kid. Um, and I'm not you know I was I was one of the people Patty knows hoping we weren't going to put a lot of hardscape at Highland Park. Um, but to the extent that they, you know, the, the extent that they did put it in has proven to be relatively helpful. 
I was, um, Curtis, when you were talking about um, the paths, you know, I don't know if you know, but we're looking at redoing and expanding the paths at Wheat Beach, and you brought that up. Um, and we did want to do a lot more of those surfaces that are ADA and easier for, it's not just for kids with wheelchairs, but it's, you know, older people that are aging in place in Darien. I mean, I don't think it's a very small, pot. I think it could be more effective, to be honest with you. So that's one of the challenges for those type of surfaces and even with pour and play, since we did it at Weed Beach, the playground, is it does get more costly and the environmental impacts are higher. But I think that we should keep what you're saying in mind because, you know, we do want those spaces for, you know, everybody to use. And it's not as limited as people think. The impacts could be far ranging. So your, your yeah, uh, I mean, input is very appreciated, you know. So. Yeah, we were working with a um, landscape architect when we were looking at doing some work in our old house in Stephen Mather, and he talks about all these more environmentally friendly hard surfaces that are porous, so the water gets through, um, but also retain that you know rigid structure. So you can, and your point is valid about all chairs or walkers, and I'm thinking really like even those little um, umbrella strollers, they do not do well in sand or in dirt, right? So they, they're much better on some sort of hard service. Um, but yeah, that would be, um, you know, the, the community that let's say I'm representing here today, they do a lot of the crazy stuff, like the spinning stuff at the, at the playgrounds. And stuff, right? they tend, it tends to be the more um, kind of uh, muted activities. But again, a swing, the swing in, in the park we went to in New York City, the Gen Swing was the most popular swing at the park. And we had to just, you know, when someone would show up who needed that swing, you had to rely on your neighbors to <laughs> to take their typical kids off. But um, they're never, they're, there's never an issue of them being underused, you know, taking up a spot. I think, can you hear me now, everybody? Yes. Excellent. Um, Curtis, on, on the gem swing, I think the one limitation that I understand is that you need a lot of space. Like Cherry Lawn probably could give you that space. And maybe well, Baker has the larger swing right now, too. So maybe Baker and um, did you notice, in your opinion, that the space was, you know, they needed a lot of space for that gem swing? Um, I wouldn't think so. It would, the swing you know, runs on the same kind of line as a normal swing. So okay. we had, I mean, I can send you a picture. Our swing set at home was two regular swings or, you know, one kind of, I can't even remember what they're called anymore. The little kids love them. Um, but, it, you know, some funky swing, a regular swing, and then Charlotte's Jen swing next to it, all in a typical swing set. Okay. So they so run the same, on the same path. Yeah, they're not a lot wider. Um, there may be some kinds that you're thinking of that have a kind of like 360 rotation. This is one I'm just thinking it's, it's number one, um, the structure is conducive to up to bigger children, even adults, able to sit back and their weight is distributed so they're not going to fall off. Um, and it has belt, right? So they stay in like a harness almost, so they stay in. Uh, but it still works along that same kind of, um, you know, single line path. So I, I wouldn't say it takes up extra space. Okay. It's just a lot more, they're a lot longer, right? I mean, it's, a regular swing is just a strip of rubber. These are these are big, like a almost like a lying down chair. But um, they're fantastic, and it's a it's a cool. reputable company if you just want to check it out. And again, I'm happy to reply to this email with um with pictures from our home swing. You can see Charlotte smile from ear to ear yeah please please send that <laughs> thank you curtis sure is it jen j-e-n jen swing Dub double n double n thank you so curtis, helpful is, curtis this and, is so um, helpful this is so helpful do you ever use the mcguan park because that has an ada sort of surface as i call it <laughs> so it's somewhat um, older yeah, we haven't used the playground. We go to Maguan. We were just there on the weekend for the opening of, of Darren Little League, which is the most incredible thing I've ever seen in a small town. <laughs> it's like the entire town had a uniform on. Um, <laughs> but Charlotte, Charlotte's in Challenger Baseball. So we go to Maguan for that, which is incredible. And thank you, Darian, for supporting Challenger Baseball. 
but um, but no, we haven't used the playgrounds again for us. For us, it was really awesome to have a swing at home. Um, and you know, Charlotte's so busy now; it's less important for her. Um, but getting her out on the walks, I mean, during the winter, it didn't matter how cold it was or blustery. We went to Cove Island two, three times a week just to get out and walk. And then and the, um, the folks at Ox Ridge um, might be helpful if you want to look into the gen swing because they did install one. Luke, Luke's very familiar with it. Great. Curtis, Thank did you. they fix the did they fix the surface at Axridge? If as I recall they did, because um I can't remember if they fixed it everywhere. I think they just may have created a pathway to the swing because the first time Charlotte literally got dug into the ground. <laughs> right. So again, that's life. Sure we we'll, that. we'll just roll with it. I'm sure Luke probably fixed it. Yeah. Yeah. Since we have Curtis here, can we start, why don't we, can we report on um, McGuan because that seems to be the park that we need to focus on because of surfacing issues and I would like to get some of the feedback from that park from our members. Is that okay, Curtis? And then you get to hear what we're coming up with and what we've, and if you have any input specifically on McGuan, it sounds like it's limited except for that recent visit. Um, I'd welcome it. No, we go there just, again, for, for yeah. baseball all the time. What right. what I noticed is, you know, we just have to figure out how to get her around because it's pretty complicated there, right? There's there's sections where you're on a pathway and the stairs go up to the concession, like, oh my god, I'm trapped. <laughs> I have to turn around and go somewhere else. But in terms of access from handicapped parking up to the ball field, not an issue. There's walkways. How about the playground um, getting from the parking lot to the, you know how there's that you know the parking spaces right next to the playground? How's that? Yeah, that's that's where we always park. So Challenger Baseball usually plays at the field right above the playground, mm -hmm. um, directly above it. Um, and actually, when Claire, our youngest, was little, she loved that playground. So Charlotte would be on the field and Claire would be on the playground. So, yeah, we had good experience there. Okay. Does anybody else have feedback about Mugwan so far? I, know I, have, just, I would say to recap for the folks that don't know, they have a softer surface at Mugwan. It's not the wood chips. It is like a rubbery surface. And it's worked for years, but now it's pulling up. And so we're concerned about tripping and safety issues. So that's one of the reasons if we're going to be going in and redoing the whole thing, we definitely are looking at, right, Pam, a, you know, more of a flat porn play surface than a separate tile that can continue to pull up well I think we I think we need to look at the pros and cons right so they're both ADA which is great um, believe it or not the tiled rubber surface that we have currently is more expensive than the port and play um, the port and play surface was the first surface they used at McGuan and somehow it didn't work. So um, I'm, I just was reading on the, you know, the notes through the years and they put the port in play in and maybe a year or two later, it was all, it was all um, lifting or separating the surface. So they went back after the manufacturer, but they, I guess the warranty ran out. So they had to go back to the town to ask the town for an additional $40,000 to put the tiles in. So yes. that's, yes. Yeah. So we, we really need to look at the pros and cons between, I mean, we have a poured surface at Weed Beach. It looks beautiful still, even through the elements of everything. So, right. And um, it sounds like it could be a manufacturing issue as well, meaning that yeah. I'm sure there are lots of companies doing this. There is. Think, How long ago was that, Pam? When the first porn play went in? Do you recall? It was many years ago. That was before my time. That was like 2004, I believe, they put the tiles in. Yeah. It was brand new when I started pretty much the commission on the commission-ish. Right. So the tiles went in in 2004, the porn play went in prior to that, and then got yanked out two years later. Um, right. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, but I've seen beautiful surfaces of porn and play. I was just very, um, I actually was... Uh, surprised that it was less expensive than a tie, I'll tell you the truth. So I'd like to, I'd like to really research that a little bit more. But either or, 
you know, there are, there are things we can do um, to have, have port and play, the port and play surface, um, even with, you know, pathways of port and play and not, if, if, it, if it became a financial issue, you know, you wouldn't have to do the entire surface, but you, as long as, like Curtis said, getting, making sure the pathway from the parking lot to elements that, you know, special needs can use that need to be able to get from point A to point B. So. <clears throat> yeah, I have to say, so access is the most important. Um, I'll just give you a tiny anecdote. We went to 1020 Post as a family for the first time in two years. And the restaurant right next to 1020, I don't know, it changes every three months, but they put, they put tables outside on the sidewalk and there was literally no way to get a wheelchair up because the one, the one spot that had like a, a depression for a wheelchair was blocked by tables. So we had to go up to the road and then back around. It was ridiculous. Like no one's thinking about this. And to, to the point, um, Susan, that you made, it's not Charlotte, it's all the people who go there who are elderly, right? And don't want to, can't really easily get up over that six inch curb. So yeah, I just want to, you always want to know that your community is thinking about access. That's an interesting point for planning and zoning too, Curtis. I mean, I know you're close with 1020, the owners, and they love having your family in Charlotte and everybody there. I've loved watching that over the years. But um, yeah, that's an example of the next door restaurant not even thinking about it. We're thrilled planning and zoning is allowing outdoor activity to occur to continue to occur, but they really have to think about those things. I'm going to give that feedback to Steve Albany. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Great. Um, going to back to this, the surface, I think there might be an issue there with drainage, Pam, because that tile is used all over. The reason that was when we put that in, that's the tile they use in all the New York City playgrounds, and they're obviously well loved and well used too. And I think just hearing what you just said about the previous pour and play, if you look at where all that water settles, it's gonna be right by the playground. That's the low point of that whole property. So I think if we do go with whatever surfacing we go for, we need to make sure that the contractor figures out a way to make sure that, because that's what happens when you have water and you have settling and then it freezes and all this stuff and it just takes, it'll damage it quickly. But the tile itself is honestly, was awesome when it was working because if we had an issue with one tile, we just replace it. It's like a carpet tile when you have it in the house, we have a stain, just fix it, you're done. So it's like, you don't have to change the whole, wreck the whole thing. But with the pour and play, if there is a problem, you're basically looking at tearing everything up very quickly and it's hard to repair it. So, I definitely don't think it was a drainage problem though, because I, I could see the pictures that were taken. I think it was very much a manufacturing issue yeah. yeah well hopefully you know whoever we use, if we do pour and play we'll alleviate that um besides the surfacing we had talked about for maguan aside about expanding the park potentially um the playground i should say not the park itself so i'd like to get people's thoughts on that i mean it seems like it serves a huge group of people especially when the games come in and you know siblings are on the playground and family um what are people's thoughts on that having a bigger playground of course now we're looking at more money when i say that right sorry well interestingly enough the footprint is not that that big to expand and we've recently installed or implanted trees around the surface because it's a one park that didn't have was super hot people were telling me many complaints about the fact that there was no shade there so not that we can't move the trees because they're still very young um, but you know, there, I've looked at that. There's definitely a little bit of space to expand, but not a whole lot. We do remember the super hot. Yeah. We've installed six trees. So that should take care of that. This, my concern is that that will take a while because they're small, space. but, but it's a long term. Yeah, it was good to do long term. It's not an immediate fix, but uh, but it was definitely you responded to that need, Pam. Thank you. I guess my concern is the new people moving into those apartments and more people that might say, well, we're going to take a break from shopping and eating and let's you know go to the playground. I just think that there's going to be more volume and and if we and if that's the only park we have the the, the, the equipment that's really good for ADA. I get a little nervous about not having enough real estate for everyone to use, not, you know, so. 
How about coming up on the right side on the, uh, how much room is there on the right side uh, when you're coming up there? If we were to, you know, you have trees and then you have a little extension, a little separation of something else there. And then I also, I know there's neighbors that are further back with that fence, but I, I, I have to go back by and look at, count it out distance. You can expand on the left and the right, and you can actually expand a little bit on the far back side. I'd be careful about expanding on the left because that baseball field is right there, and that's where the kids that are a little bit bigger play because my son played there for years. So I do remember home runs going over that fence. So if I, I would say not go left. I would say go right. Um, that's just my feedback. If we could do it. You looked at it as a commission, Pam. Don't you remember that that space closer to West Avenue, you know, as you go that way, there's a little room there. I know there are houses there, so we have to be right, you know, obviously thinking about those people too. Mm -hmm. But I think that this place, we're not just here to replace existing. We're here to think about the future. And I think all of us need to think about what the future looks like in Darien with all these changes and with all the people moving in. Um, we want people to come out and use the facilities and we want to be, to have that. So if we the have best that, person, the, yeah. the best person to analyze that is the playground manufacturer. Whoever we choose, or even if there's multiple people that, that we, we want to give, um, you know, give opportunities to, they will go down and look at the footprint we would give them the scope of the work saying that we want to consider some expansion. So they'll come back with a plan. I think we should think about it. I mean, and it doesn't have to, that part doesn't have to be all ADA, but I feel like we should just move it, you know, move it, give it more space, more airspace, more, you know, more opportunities for kids to interact with different equipment. Um, I don't think that's a bad idea. Susan, you know how now we have been, Go I was just going to say you have a separate swing set. Right? You have a swing set separately. So I could see us doing swing sets on the side. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Really helpful. Okay. Really helpful. Um, Susan, just back to that point. You know how you did what, you built it and you've got the swing sets kind of separated from right. the climb and play area? So that's an example where we could consider doing the swing sets over there, and then you have more area for additional playground area. I, I agree, Pam. I think a manufacturer's yeah. that, that person was, could do uh, you're talking about playground by the sound, right? I just, I, sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Um, basically what happened with that was that we did the original playground and when we went back to, um, when we were talking to Darian uh, Foundation, they said to us, we want you to bring in more stuff for older kids. And so that money came in later, which is part of the reason it wasn't really in the original plan. That was added in later across the boat, what was used to be the boat ramp, right? At Weed Beach. <laughs> the asphalt that goes into the water that was the boat ramp I don't know if you know that and so then we put the swings on the other side because that was the only real estate left for us to do that so that was kind of a, a good mistake I guess or you know something that came about because we have additional funding but, but learning from that from what you just said and somebody else said it earlier Ruth or someone said I'd like to see some things for older kids too right so that might be a great place because there's so many different ages that play at Maguan you know they're playing from little all the way up they have the challenger league it's boys it's girls and then it's siblings hanging out getting those great french fries at the snack bar while their brothers or sisters are playing so that could that i think that's a that could be really an interesting area to expand into with a, a swing set if it makes sense yeah because we have i guess the, the way the monies work is we did put a certain budget number for each park right uh pam and the idea yes. that that's the surfacing so if possible maybe we should see you know, talk to the um, playground planner. Even if we don't use them, they'll give us some ideas. It's like, you know, working with a designer and getting some ideas, you know, pre-design ideas before we start. Um, I'd, I'd like to see that happen, especially with that um, space. Does anybody can have I, any? Can I okay. jump in? Yeah, yeah um, 
I was I spent some time um, I work in Greenwich and I spent some time at Bruce Park the other day and I was looking at what a diverse age group that was there. Um, I feel like in Darien a lot of times we see the five and under because a lot of our parks are not you know I know my daughter likes to go to the Henley playground because it has the zip line and like the bigger climbing things but the town parks don't have that um, and I noticed that when I was at Bruce Park I think it's called Bruce Park. Um, there was just this huge climbing mountain thing that, like, the 18-month-olds were on, the 12-year-old kids were on. They were all sharing the same thing. And I think that's something, if we don't have a lot of space, let's think about some equipment that can be utilized for the different ages. Um, because I do agree, like, my my kids love to go to the playgrounds, and, like, it's always great to get them out and, you know, the backyard gets stale after a while. Um, but they also get bored very quickly. And so I feel like if we can get get creative in the type of equipment we bring in um you know I, I think we can see that we can meet the different ages just by picking something that's a little more diverse yep. net, net, climbers, net climbers are really popular um but again space is an issue with those two to have both you know a place scape and a net climber so you'll find when we get when we get to the manufacturers part or the you know playground equipment representatives and, I'll, and I'm going to go through a list of what I've um, discovered in the last couple of weeks um, but they'll they'll bring it to your attention that whether you can have multiple or only one in this in whatever space that we have that's the only space they can work with and then they'll give they'll give this committee alternatives to what they can use which is going to be really fun to see okay Let's let's just go to another park, just because I know you know I have that thing about our meetings. Um, so let's go to Baker real quick because that's um, that might be quicker. And then Terry Lawn, if we need to continue at another meeting, we can. Um, Ruth, did you have any thoughts on Baker um, or Devin while we're you know thinking about? I was there yesterday, ironically. Uh -huh. um, Ruth, I know you've done a little more research, but I'll just even from yesterday and having I'm obviously new to all of this, but talking, you know, it sounds like we're looking at a lot of the ADA thing. I think, you know, that's that park is missing that right now. There's no trails, absolutely nothing, just grass. I am not I am out of the stroller phase, but have been there for years with strollers. Um, you definitely, I think have to do I don't know if you can now um, put in trails from the parking lot because you're just kind of rough grass and terrain all the way over um, also I don't know are you limited to the space that they have now or is there room for expansion there? I don't really know how that works it's pretty there small for expansion but it's um, within budget like we have to factor that in like we want to fix what's our you know that existing area but it's really dependent on our budget ultimately but Baker can could come forward quite a bit. Obviously, you have the neighbors right there and, and the street to your left. But again, I think it's really, I would say that playground is kind of five and under for the most part. Um, I know my older ones, they love to go there in the winter to go sleigh riding. Um, but I think, you know, for, if you are looking for something to improve and make that more encompassing, I, you're probably looking at some, some equipment for larger kids. And I know Ruth kind of already had some thoughts on that. We were texting back and forth. But that actually, that unit, Devin, that's there is only, well, it's it's a five to 12 year old playground playscape. It's, we don't have any um, apparatus there that's for 18 months to five years old. The only ones we have. Yeah, that's a five to 12 year old. I also have really large children, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody does it, Darian. Yeah, some of the some of the things on that playground are very challenging. Just like right. it's the jumps, long. I will Right, yeah. you're right. Maybe it just seems like it's a younger scenario. Maybe my kids are, you know, looking it's for more of the zip line and the climbing rope and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I mean, now knowing this, I'm gonna ask for their input very much so because I mean all all we ever want to do is go back to the Royal Playground I'm like you were just at school all day why <laughs> interesting yeah that's interesting um, because I think if you take a really good look at Cherry Lawn Park the 18 months to five years old you know big big difference between the five to twelve five to twelve is much more challenging 
um, a lot of things low to the ground on the, on the 18 months to, to, to five years old. So, you know, I think you're right. You're, you're, when you look at Baker, it's just a small space. So it makes it feel that way. I think that is a little bit. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I would you kids like at Royal. What do they want to? What What do they go back to at Royal when they say we just want to go back? Um, what are their favorite things? Zip line, and it's funny because they do have the larger playground there, and then there is the kindergarten one that's kind of off to the right behind by the gardens, um, and that's definitely where my younger one tends to go. Um, oh, barking dogs, um, but the zip line is huge. They did install this year, and I'm mixed on this because. It's, kind of dangerous the gaga ball like circle situation um i don't know if you want to do something like that at one of the playgrounds because it does get a little out of control uh i think or because you can't control what balls they're using and they're basically kicking them at each other um but i do know that is very popular with older children and one more thing i would say i know pam you were saying that um, the equipment is the, the dinosaurs, you know, the equipment itself is for five to 12. But I think the disconnect is that when you spend time there, they're actually the little guys who are using it. So mm -hmm. the, the people who are there are these little guys and like the nannies are sitting there and you're watching these little ones that aren't really, they do the slide because it's not that big, but a lot of them aren't using the other half of that equipment because they can't like even those circle things that are those monkey bars they're too big for my five-year-old so it's like we have a disc like the equipment i agree that it's maybe built for the older kids um but they're not the ones using it and the ones that are using it right now are the little ones um like i've been i i run pretty i run daily around there and so i get to see different times of the day and it's always under the age of five. I've never seen a kid over the age of five there. And the other thing is it's a very dark, like because there's a lot of trees, which is great for shade. But um, it's one of those things, too, I think we have to keep in mind when we think about, um, you know, I was thinking about the sidewalks and just the ability to get a wheelchair into that space. Um, it's a very musty type feeling. So, too, like thinking about the equipment and, like, what kind, what would be work well in that space. Because um, I, I know, like, um, my my kids love the zip line. They love these climbing things. But, again, I don't, I don't know what would do well, like, mold wise or wetness what is slippery things like that because I don't think it gets a lot of sunlight there so I don't know what type of equipment would be appropriate um, but I do think that the age is not being used in that it's not a 5 to 12 park from from the data that I've been seeing that's that's good that's what we're looking for end user data in in a park like Baker where it's a pocket park and it feels like it's a lot of people coming from neighborhood walking or I've always seen even when my kids were little when they were really little that's where I went and then we you know and then Sherlon has always been our park I have a question for all of you with little ones um, and middle ones do you um because we talked about this on a meeting earlier at you know it might be where we end up having you know one of these parks really just be geared more to a younger group or as a mom with multiple kids is the ideal thing to have all of our parks have something for your variety of ages i would like feedback on that sarah too Sorry, yeah, I just want to jump on because I think Ruth and Devin have really hit a lot of things that I also have thought about when and my kids don't go to Royal and we go to Royal all the time. Love it. Um, and we use, if someone, especially during the summer when school's not in session, we prefer to go there over Cherry Lawn. Um, I don't know why, it's just a good flow. I also, because there's so much open space, um, so we can bring our scooters and it just feels, I feel less, um, because I have different ages, I feel less like, oh, now we're in the little section. Oh, now we got to go to the big section. Okay, everyone follow me. Like, I don't, I can't keep eyes on all of them, but for some reason at Royal, it feels a little, I feel less worried. Like, oh, okay, I can see you, but I don't, there's just something about it. And the climbing thing, I absolutely agree. The rope thing. If we can put that somewhere, um, Baker, I've spent one time there and I, it is depressing. <laughs> like it is such a depressing playground and Ruth again, hit the nail on the head. I'm like, Oh yeah, it is really dark. So while we complain about some places being too hot, um, yeah, it's just, there's something about it. There's just, it just feels like, and this is to, I have no idea who planned it and who 
put it together and I know everything has a lot of thought behind it. So I don't want to insult anyone who put the time, energy and, um, and, you know, blood, sweat and tears into it. But yeah, it just feels like it was like an afterthought. It's the, it's the um, trees there. It's the trees. Yeah. And it's just something. There's just the whole thing just kind of feels like, oh, let's just like plop up this play structure here. I don't know. So, and it is, it doesn't, the only time I was there, my, my oldest was, maybe two and a half and he could not do half of the stuff on there like there he just he, he's also short he's not big um so it, i couldn't just sit on the bench and be like yeah how about it um and so i was thinking since we all know that every park cannot be everything to everyone it just it's you just can't you have to have just an infinite amount of space to do that um but i was thinking then maybe we need to think outside the box for baker then since it does it does have a decent amount of space. Maybe that's the one that you do the structures that we can't fit at at Maguan, or you know, maybe it is the more just different. Maybe it's the bigger. Maybe it is just the climbing apparatus and a few other random like surprises almost. Because um, I think, uh, like Rose said, if it's pieces that are not just a climbing thing, not just a slide, not just your swing, which all the parks have, then it's kind of like, oh, it's something special. Or it just maybe, it just feels less, oh, you have to be this age or this age, or you kind of aged out of it. Um, I don't know. I just feel like, I know we have, is the swing set still going there, Pamela? We got the money to put that swing set there, right? Okay. Right. Um, which, I mean, swings are always great. You know, I mean, who doesn't love a swing? Um, I love swinging. So yeah, I don't know. I just feel like, yeah, Baker, Baker, I have all my friends go to Hinley all of them at the school and so a lot of them could go to baker and they none of them go to it they all hate baker like and they couldn't walk to it they don't go i can't, I can't so, explain why my kids want to go it's just but i think it's because it's depressing i'm like I it's depressing it's also yeah. quiet it's a different park pam just to go back you had talked about at one point putting that track there remember what remember when we talked about the about that, is it a bike? Was it a biking thing? It's a kind of an interesting track idea that you. I love it. It's called a pump it track. It to the group maybe, um, and it would it wouldn't work at Baker, but it's it's a pump track, and it's for obviously kids that like their you know their skateboarding and their scooters and their bikes, and and it basically it's portable too, so you can put it on flat surface and then take it away in the winter, but um, it is super fun. So maybe that's and, uh, it's just hills and the kids you know do it do it on a pump track so you can look it up it's it's pretty cool but you need a really big open space for that we do well, okay you know where that could fit someday that could fit to the edgerton property pam if we ever do something there you know where the senior center came down that could be yeah. a cool place to put that mm -hmm. Um, so to Sarah's point, I really agree with Sarah. And again, I think these are these are ideas that we need to bring to attention to the people that we're gonna, we can't just get one guy in to design it. They're not gonna want that. They're gonna want an opportunity to display their best work, what they can give back to our group. If, if we choose, if we narrow down to three companies and say, look, this is what we have at each park. This is a space at each park. This is what we're kind of thinking at each park give me your best design. And then they're gonna present, hoping they're gonna get the job. So the question, you know, I think Ruth, you know, talked, touched on this, like that it's a very shady, dark spot and we should think about what works there. Um, the idea, another idea might be to make Baker kind of the more natural park. Does that make sense? Because natural materials, um, they're not, the, you know, it's, there's more it's not a slick if it gets a uh, mold you know gets that algae or whatever you call it that green stuff that gets on things when there's not enough light i mean there's when there's shade so, yeah just something like maybe that's the space we do something more naturalistic to blend more like it's, why fight it if that's what we got there we're not cutting those trees down it's because that's not happening in this town at any time why don't we work with what we have and work with nature i think that's a place for us to kind of innovate and think about and i think you know, it'll attract a different type of user that might want to get back to nature and want, they don't like the color or whatever. Um, I, I'm willing, I think that's a just a thought I, you know, just off the top of my head that, you know. You know and Pam, can you talk about Tierra had some kind of swing set like that that was very natural for all of her kids climbing around? Set? 
Was that you guys who said Tierra? Or was it somebody else? Yeah, it, it was me. Yeah, so it's it, the guy. His name is uh, Fred, uh, Frank Fred, and it's environmental designs. And he's he's done a lot around the area. And I can't explain it, but like they are, they're just really natural, and they probably would do really well um, in in that space because it's all wood. There's no color. Um, and yeah, it. So, but again, he would have to see the space, and then he would give you the idea it's not cheap but um you know it's it's all flexible it's he builds it so it's not up oh, here's your you know coming off the manufacturing line like this is the piece and this is how it fits so it's definitely customizable which is you know kind of nice um but um yeah so it's environmental designs you can see his website it's not it's not great but you get the idea um, I don't is know if anyone residential. Is he more residential? He does residential. He does commercial. Yeah. Again, his website's not great. He's small. He's not a. He's not play core, You know. Um, but um, I don't think there's a lot of people like him out there. At least not in the area locally. Um, but yeah, you, 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 you you'll get a sense, Pamela. I think. I, I know uh, New Canaan Nature Center has a couple of his pieces, and then there's um, is it St. Paul's across the street in New Canaan? St. Paul. There's a big church right there. Anyway, I think they've got one, and he's got one that's really cool that they call it the nest, and it literally looks like a bird's nest, and it's made out of all, it's it's so cool, and the kids love it, and you just, I don't know, you feel like you're in this cocoon, and it's different than being in, like, the standard, like, oh, I'm in a, you know, a box, whatever. I mean, everyone has those in their backyard, right? So what's fun about that? Um, but the nest is just different. Um, but he does he does all different things. So it, it, it is something to think about. Um, or he could do one piece. Like he's not going to be like the big companies like that's going to say, I want it all or nothing. He'll put he'll give you one piece if you pay for it. You know, so that I think is also kind of like add little elements here and there. Um, but yeah, so that's but yeah, uh, Tierra had her backyard. Um, yeah, she did it in her backyard. It's a great idea. And let's let's if we if if anybody wants to work on that, I know you know when I was in London, they have very similar that same vibe and the same uh, very natural like the nest. It's it's definitely out there. I think you just need to search for it, Pam. If you could figure out from your colleagues if there's somebody that does it on a, a very large scale or even this company, um, we have about ten minutes left. So I don't want to like you know. I, we're not going to finish this agenda for obvious reasons at this point. Um, do we want to just hit on Cherry Lawn a little bit before we kind of end today? It's it's obviously needs more than 10 minutes, but I think that it's that's going to be the one that takes the most time because there's so much, there's a much more space that we're trying to cover, I think. And it's also, to be honest with you, I think it's the most well, like highly used uh, playground in our town. So it deserves a lot of time. So do you want to start on that, Patty? Do, do, do you want to just bump it to next time and like spend a little bit more time exploring these two parks that we're talking about? And then we could make the next meeting much more focused on Cherry Lawn? Which, or or, just or we can just talk about feedback now. Um, I mean, do people have a lot more to add to those two parks? right now off the top of their heads. I mean, I, I think, you know, we've hit on a lot of the issues. I think now we have to just go deeper on some of them, like really look at, for Mag going back to McGuan, looking at expansion, looking at what we can do in terms of uh, surfacing. For Baker, you know, that's the natural thing that we're looking at, right? Um, and then I know, I think Pam had something on the agenda too for her company feedback from her members. Is that a better time to use now do you have do you need more than 10 sure. minutes Pam? no i no i don't need more than 10 minutes um i i will just let you know that go ahead that's okay to do that then instead sure. of cherry okay sure. so i put out a uh, a blast to my colleagues throughout the state with connecticut recreation and parks association as uh, many many of us do when we have questions on all sorts of different levels and I, I asked the question whether or not they had recently in the last five years replaced a playground, and if so, who did they use and would they hire them again? And um, I, I got, you know, I didn't get back as much feedback as I thought I would, and I certainly did hear from some of the playground companies because they're also on this server. So, of course, 
I, I, I heard back from uh, one of the reps that I that we've used here in Darien. I've used in my previous jobs, and he said, "Well, game time I hear is very good to use." <laughs> So, but I did hear from some, and I did get, um, you know, one that was in particular that that many people said they they would use over and over again, which was John Hollerbach, which is miracle equipment. I've used the, I've used him in my past as well. He's great to work with. I got a lot of feedback on him, so I'd keep him in the list. I got uh, Emmy O'Brien and Sons, which Darian has Emmy O'Brien. Matter of fact, that's who who. He, built uh we beach is emmy o'brien and sons um and game time like i said um that that came back regularly and then there was compan which compan is uh we do have pieces in cherry lawn of of their stuff um i only heard back from a couple people of them i'm not in particular uh i don't know it's it, it's an interesting line that they use some people absolutely love them we have a lot of their pieces in the um, smaller playground, toddler playground at Cherry Lawn. Um, the two new pieces that Susan and I had picked out with that's game time. But if you want to go and look at Cherry Cherry Lawn, the compan is some of the other pieces. I'm just not a huge Pam. Uh, hey, can you differentiate? Because I know the two new pieces um, that you said are from Game Time. Those are the two ones. They've got green covers on top. They're yes. obviously new because they're cleaner. What are the ones from? Or can you spell the name of the company? Compan. K O M P A N. Okay. Can you yep. tell me a few of examples of those that those pieces of equipment? Well, I think what the two pieces we took out were Compan. Yeah, they were. And we replaced them with Game Time. I believe that the the if you're staring at the park before entering it, in the toddler area, the playscape to the far left, I believe, is Compan. Okay. So yeah, I, I mean they all have their different flair. Um, uh, Patty, they're the water. Can you remind me the two, the two pieces that were taken out and replaced that were compan. What were they? Do you remember what they were? Were they the, the horses or can you remember? No, they were like the similar structure, but for smaller kids. Like they were very okay. much. They had the. It had a little slide. Um, the thing about compan, we used them too at uh, Weed Beach they use a certain type of material and it didn't wear as well as I thought it could. I think Pam, I, I think they showed their age very quickly because of the coloring. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's like, it, I don't know if this is true, but it's like a compressed uh, like board almost and with some kind of sheathing on it. And it just, once it wears, it shows what's under it and it just didn't age as well, I thought personally. Um, okay. But it's not yeah, feedback. Too, and, the play when we did it for Playground by the Sound, we wanted a water feature. They had a a, 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 yeah. a a structure that accommodated that water feature. So it's just kind of you got to figure out what amenity you're trying to offer and who's offering it. So that's why. Right. It. So I think it's a good start to say if you if we if we talk to Miracle, Emmy O'Brien Sons, and Game Time, we're not obligated to choose any of them. But if we want to give them the opportunity to show us their best work and what they think would be the best that they could do for that space, that's really exciting. It takes all the pressure off us, and all we do is look at the plans and see what kind of exciting things they can put in there. Um, Pam, that's a great idea. The only thing is we've only talked about two of the parks, so I wouldn't want them to jump and start doing stuff for Terry Lawn, for instance. Not right now. No, 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 not right now. Down the road when we're ready. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind hearing from them just big picture, especially for – for me, McGuan, because I'm really worried about getting that done quickly to ensure the safety of that that surfacing. Um, I think that's the part that's going to go first, so I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, for Baker, I would they could do that, but I think we're going to end up with something more naturalistic there. So if they can accommodate that, they can go for it. But I'm not sure I want to have what they're doing if they the same colorful structures there. I mean. But they, they might all have different lines. They they all have different lines. So some are more. They, can, they have an athletic line. They have a music line. They have a net climber line. They have natural line. So they're all. All those companies are staying competitive. Okay. Well, I mean, if it's okay, maybe we have them start putting some, you know, some ideas together for the parks we talked about today because we have a 
a better idea of who the users are um, and things like that. And because we want to move, especially on the quad. But Charlie, I, I want to hear from you first to make sure you we're guys gonna meet if we're going to meet in three weeks, I certainly can pop. They, I most likely they can put plans together for the next meeting for those two parts. Right, Patty? Not for Cherry Lawn yet, I think, because we don't know exactly what. No, we want. I agree. And that's a that's a double playground. You know, that's yeah. two. So that's a project of its own. I agree with you, Susan. Uh, to get the, I know you've been saying this, Pam, for the last two meetings. We could get this done by having them come in, and we were kind of wanting to get feedback first. Uh, and I think everybody on this group will continue to get feedback. And I would encourage you when you're at the playground, ask questions. I've been stopping in and asking all the parents and nannies at all different times of the day at Cherry Lawn, you know, what would they like to see, what works, what doesn't, etc. So uh, Sarah and I and the rest of us, anybody who's there, can continue to do that for Cherry Lawn. But I would say in terms of moving forward, I know that McGuan, it felt like our committee was making McGuan the first priority because of the surface and because we do know those apartments are going to be coming in. Would you all would you all agree with that? Okay. And then Pam, is there a benefit looking having companies come in and look at two at a time versus just Baker? What's your no, thought? Sure. No, I think that they're gonna love the opportunity. And okay. if they're here, why not get the footprint of both? Okay, great. And then if they we like what they're doing, that's then their pitch to try and get the bigger event at Cherry Lawn down the line. Yeah, and nothing's yeah. set in stone. So if you don't like what they put on paper, all that can be changed. Yeah. What I, if Pam, what if when you set up the meetings with the playground companies, I know they like to come out. If there are any people that are on the different committees and they're available, could you invite them to come? and talk to the playground reps, because I think that would be very helpful, because in theory, they have the on-the-ground knowledge about who the users are. So I'd like to see that happen. Did you hear what I just said, uh, Pam? Yeah, is that okay, Pam? Are you, I, uh, will they be open to that? Maybe. If the playground representative comes out and wants to look at the space, uh, it would be great to have the committee members also, if, if available, come to those meetings. If we can make it convenient for them, it'd be obviously better, too. Um, but because well, what I thought was that what I think would be very helpful to this group is that if I can invite one of them um, to this meeting to talk about, like to Ruth's point, the net climber, right? All the different types of, you know, and, and Sarah with the naturalistic one, they can speak to some of their elements. I'm going to ask them not to sell. I just want to talk about the different variety of things that they have. And what's the trending thing? Okay, I'm happy to do that. That's, That's great. great. And it's important that someone, if we can get, if they they usually come out to the place to look at it, to do a quick yes. look, and they're going to measure and do all this stuff. I'd like, if possible, not only you, but someone else on the committee to go and be a part of that meeting so that they're kind of in the process. Sure. Them, you know, because I think that they'll get more out of it and then they could report back what the, you know, then the onus isn't on you to report back to us too about what some of the thoughts were. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good um, Okay. And if there's a priority, would you rather be doing that one in person or would you rather have people present somebody coming in and presenting to the group what's trending? I mean, we could do both. There's no reason why. It's just that I, when we do have, Pam has a playground meeting with somebody, I'd like if someone's available that's on that committee, they should go. It's a given. Um, sure. But the trending thing is helpful. I, I'll, I'll do that too. But I just think we have an hour and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to lose committee time if, you know, we can't get there. Do you know what I mean? So we got to make sure that we can get what we need done in an hour because we're only meeting every three weeks. It's a challenge for people that are working and busy at other, you know, with their kids. So we're at 948 and I, I don't want to like kick everybody out, but I think we need to, you know, close this meeting. Um, if there's, I always encourage everybody, we are on a, a group email all our group you know we can interface like suggestions if everybody found found more information about the natural playgrounds let's we could sit, put it on that and discuss it at our next meeting um but i think it's too challenging to go beyond what we think is our a lot of time for everybody is that okay pam um yep i just so want to make I add one thing quickly okay. just in my experience and i know susan you have experience with this as well but in my experience with the reps that come if we're going to give three reps the opportunity to come out 
they they want to come out and measure the site. There really isn't going to be a meeting taking place, right? So right. I really think it's more valuable to have one of them at least present to the group about the different varieties that each each playground company has and what things that we should be looking for that might be more trending than others or new different things. Why don't you, I'll leave it up to you who you decide to let do that. Like you, okay. you, talk to the, you know the companies, if whoever has the most far ranging amenities that you think that we need to know about has good feedback from your group and has great experiences, pick one because I just think that we can't, you know I mean, let's start okay. there. If we think we'll give him 20 minutes. The next guy. Who would that or, be? Would it be game time? Like if you had to pick somebody right now, would it be game time? I already talked to game time in the sense of, uh, listen, in, have you dealt with this particular type of proposal where towns would come to you and say, you know, um, we have these two parks, give us the plans, and then this, this committee is going to be – you know, give us your latest, greatest. He said, absolutely. In some towns, Greenwich, Greenwich just uses game time for everything. So they don't do any of that type of thing. We don't want to do that. We want to have choices. Yeah. Right. Let's do, I know do, the game let's... time did, did New Canaan's Mead, uh, or at least a large part of it. Mm -hmm. So that might seem to be the right person out of the three yeah. you mentioned because it doesn't sound like we want to do comp and to come in and present what do you think as a presentation and as you yeah, said we'll let's, talk to the naturalists and have okay, them come out let's start with that pam that sounds okay. good go sounds ahead good. And, and we'll look at it at the next meeting or hopefully they can come at our next meeting thank okay. you guys so much for your time really appreciate it and uh keep on talking to people have a great day can guys. we just confirm the next date the next time that we're meeting? It's in three. Okay, sure. April 28th in... Pam, do you already have a date for us? or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's May... Let's see. It's it's May 1, 2, 3. May 19th. Yes. So five and I will send a list of all our scheduled meetings to you, all of you, the scheduled meetings that we sent to the town clerk, as well as um, a list of committee members with Devin's name added. Okay. And we're good with 845, guys? Yes? I think we're set. Yes. Good. Okay. Let's Evan, do that. Thank you for joining us. Thank good to see you. Thank you, guys. Happy Happy day. Day. All right. Hey, thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Hi, Sarah. Everybody. Great Hi, meeting, Pam and Susan. Really productive. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Humanity is not lost. You know, these are people doing good things for you and they're not looking for anything in return. My name is Angel. I'm a 42-year-old Norwalk resident and I am a proud client of person to person. When I lost my job after having my baby, they welcomed me in. They told me that day, to come on and start shopping. Oh, these are nice big potatoes today. So food is really the first point of contact for a lot of people. And they'll get introduced to the breadth of our services and understand that they have other pressing needs that can be met here. We provide a number of different programs that help people achieve economic stability. We have a clothing center, college scholarships, mentorships for first-generation students. They have assistance for summer camps, emergency financial assistance. I've had help with my rent. They brought me through a lot. When COVID came about, it took a toll on everything. I've signed up so many new clients for our services during this time. We are all just a paycheck away from having to utilize a service like this. And that's really what happened to a lot of people in our community that we're one paycheck away and then those paychecks stop coming. There's definitely been a lot more people coming to our doors with eviction notices. Landlords are giving three days notice and clients have to either pay or get out in three days. There's not a lot of affordable apartments. We know rent is increasing, the cost of food is increasing, the cost of gas is increasing, inflation is really harming our clients significantly, creating such a squeeze that people are rightly terrified. What we do is help get them through the short-term crisis. We help them figure out a plan. What is that pathway to get to economic stability? My caseworker is Claudine. <laughs> and I can always get a smile about that. Our caseworkers have built tremendous trust with our clients. Well, I was 
really depressed for a while. And um, she was a shoulder to cry on. She's been a life changer. I, I appreciate her so much. We do get emotionally invested in our clients and their situations and just seeing so many people struggle. We work very hard to make sure all of our services are being provided with kindness and with dignity and with respect because they're but for the grace of God. I knew a mom who lied to her son every day and said that she had eaten before he got home from school so that he didn't feel bad about eating. He didn't have to feel like he was taking food away from his mom. But I think that that's part of the beauty of what we do. Because of that emotional investment, we're able to go the extra mile. Our name is Person to Person. We recognize that humanity doesn't exist within the confines of a paycheck. It's not like you're invisible. You are seen. You know, you're really seen there. Angel and I are friends. And there's blessings everywhere. This is every day. This is what we do every day. Because of P2P, my future, it looks a lot brighter. We absolutely give people hope because they know that at least one person in this world has their back and is fighting for them. They don't have to do this alone. They are training me to get my independence back. Person to person is really a game changer. The past couple of years have been so overwhelming. It can feel difficult to even know where to start. Can anything I do really make a difference? And to those people I say, start where you are and just do something. The people who donate to person to person are phenomenal. And I don't even think they know how life-changing their, their generosity is to people. That little bit will be a ripple that has an effect on many, many more people. Thank you. Since it is one minute after our four o'clock start, I will call to order the special meeting of the Darien Police Commission, 2,432nd. First order of business is acceptance of the minutes of April 7th. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Any discussion? Second? Second. I guess I did that out of order. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Correspondence, none? Goodness. We had a couple of outgoing correspondence. <laughs> thank you, notes for folks who dropped off food and stuff. No, nothing incoming okay. for the commission's attention. Um, I can't say the same thing about department activity, so I will turn that over to Captain Marin. Sure, this is going to be for the last almost three weeks. Um, on April 7th, a 73 year old Darian man was arrested for vandalism. On April 18th, a 55-year-old Stratford man was arrested for a burglary committed in the fall of 2021. On April 21st, at approximately 6 p.m., an officer conducting traffic enforcement on the post road attempted to stop the vehicle for several traffic violations. However, the vehicle did not stop. No pursuit was initiated. However, information obtained through the registration led the officer to identify the operator. Approximately 9 p.m. the same day, a 19-year-old Norwalk man turned himself into police headquarters and was arrested for numerous misdemeanor motor vehicle charges. On April 22nd, an officer patrolling during the overnight shift observed suspicious activity behind 390 Post Road. Further investigation revealed that the two men from Staten Island were attempting to steal used cooking oil. As a result, the two men were taken into custody and the vehicle they were using was seized. We had one catalytic converter theft, two commercial burglaries, these were during the overnight, uh, one DWI arrest, five domestic disturbances, two of which involved ar arrests. We had one residential structure fire, unfortunately, right up the street here in Hecker Avenue, one incident involving mail theft, one incident involving fraud or scam, 
two reported stolen cars, I guess make that three as of this morning. Uh, one, two of which were unlocked with keys in it. Uh, four burglaries of motor vehicles that were left unlocked. 17 motor vehicle accidents, five of which involved minor injuries. 75 traffic stops conducted by the patrol division. And some training that uh, most of our officers were involved in over the past three weeks for de-escalation and hazardous materials training, taser and active shooter training. Uh, we had a handful of officers attend Gracie Survival Tactics School. And then we had a handful of supervisors uh, attend a supervision, leadership, and mentoring program. Captain, are you aware of the one car that was not unlocked with no keys in it? I mean, that was a... But we came and belonged to a commercial establishment here in town, and the registered owner did provide two sets of keys. Uh, the van has since been recovered. I don't know the status of its recovery, though, um, whether there's keys in it or not. Okay. It reportedly that the keys were not. Recovered in the Bronx, I believe, yes. Uh, unfortunately, one of our other stolen cars, this, this car was a second occurrence on the same car. Stolen and recovered once with the keys in it. The same car was stolen again with the keys in it again from the same location. Was that this morning? Mm -hmm. I don't know what else I can say. I, I, I have no words for that. No words for that. Um, okay. Um, public comment, and since while well, you can't see on um, video that we have exactly zero people here from the public, I will skip over that to old business. The building issue update, the HVAC people have been here all week. I've seen their car in the parking lot, so they are working with Dave Sabini from the DPW. I, I think they're getting close to the fine tuning of this system, so still ongoing, but they are here on site doing something that looks like it's positive, <laughs> Could you know, move us in the right nature. direction. I see them in the in the room here on the second floor that has a lot of blinking lights and everything. There's technicians in there looking at things, so I'm assuming they're getting closer every day. Okay. Um, uh, other building updates. Um, uh, they, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance this week to meet with the beautification committee. I believe the beautification committee will be taking over the care of our beds out front of the police department. We will still mow and maintain the lawn here, but as far as the actual plantings, I think we're going to. Were we? Were Were you doing that personally before this, Chief? No, the Parks and Rec <laughs> okay. Commission was taking care of that, but Parks and Rec. because of some horse trading and some things okay. that needed to be done at other town locations, they couldn't continue that. So, if the beautification people could step up to the plate and keep our grounds okay. looking nice and neat, and clean and presentable, I'm more than happy to partner with them and if they're happy to do that for us. So we're working through that as well. Uh, I'll get Captain Hedema to meet uh, with them and myself hopefully early next week. I think I that's it. I have one more building. Uh, I was just informed that beginning next week the Axon company is going to be, it's going to start installing our interview and interrogation system to replace our old case cracker, cracker system. There was a kind of a backlog on parts, I think it was, for months and months and months, and I get the guy together. Just for the commission's edification and for people who might be watching, you know, state statutory law makes us required to videotape interviews within the police building for certain crimes. We do it for almost every crime. So the system that we had was failing for quite some time. Uh, Taser Axon, who does our body cams and our dash cameras, this is the same company, it's the same system, the retention's in the same cloud, it's streamlined kind of one-stop shopping. I did an inquiry from Taser Axon last month, so why haven't you, you know, paid us according to our agreed upon payment schedule? And my answer was, if, if, some, if I see something apparently happening, like you're actually <laughs> doing something for us, and boxes start arriving that say Taser Axon, I'll start paying you according to the schedule. So miraculously, about three or four days later, boxes started arriving because they wanted to get paid. That's so, funny how that works, huh? Yeah, so, <laughs> so now we'll make them whole and we'll, we'll get our system up and running. So that should be a, that's going to be a big step forward and it's going to be just a streamlined, efficient operation that dovetails with our, with our, other, our other video retention systems. So all good there. All good. Okay. Hiring update. Well, we're going to be interviewing some additional sworn officer candidates. I don't know when that's 
Jan, two, next week? May 4th and 5th, oh, yeah. we have two four um, certified in the rest of the entry. Even though now we have you know candidates in the queue, we don't want to get behind the eight ball again. So we're going to go move forward and interview candidates with the understanding when they come in. Say, listen, if you're an acceptable candidate and we want to hire you, the commission wants to hire you, we will give you a job when an opening occurs. I think that's to, great. To have so we'll be a little bit ahead of the game because we've been behind we've been the eight behind. ball for quite some time. The four offers that we have outstanding right now. Um, or moving ahead as of today, or just got three, or just three left. We, three. I don't think we talked about the last police commission meeting, right? That we were going to swear, we swore in Officer Zakis. Oh, excuse me, right after that, yeah. Yep. So, so, so we have the three candidates that are moving forward so as part of that. Good, yep, excellent. All right. Civilian dispatchers as well. We're still seeking civilian dispatch candidates. Um, on that, on that front, I, I've had exploratory conversations with uh, the powers that be for the Fairfield Westport Combined Dispatch Center. I, as the Commission knows, that wouldn't be my first choice, but I think that we need to do our due diligence to keep all options open. That if we cannot get the civilian hires here, civilian dispatchers, that we have to investigate all other options just to keep our options open. So Westport Fairfield Dispatch Center is not up and running yet for Fairfield's running, but I don't believe Westport is running. So th this is not something that would be a turnkey that we could do today or this year or potentially even next year, but it is something that we just need to keep our options open on. I, as always, I would certainly prefer to keep dispatch operations here. I think we could provide as good or better service, but the wave of the future may be something else, so we're keeping our options open there. Yep. All right. Any other old business? Uh, new business. Uh, start with traffic. All right. So there was a Q alert filed by one of our officers on Christie Hill Road, who was up there. He was investigating a traffic collision on Lower Christie Hill Road. And we had the same situation happen maybe 10 years ago on Middlesex Road by Holly and Libby Lane. Over the course of history, there was no stop signs at some of these side streets. Right? So stop signs are not required at an intersection, but they're pretty standardized now around town that we do have stop signs and stop bars at, at most side streets. So uh, I think in the commission's packet, I think the, the streets that were listed were there, or at least I sent you the emails about which streets they were. So if the commission wanted to maybe take a look up there, uh, I think Ed Gentile from the DPW is a proponent of standardizing stop control at side streets on roads and therein. And, and that, was, that does not include private roads, is that right? Because the private roads currently do not have them, I did drive by. Yeah, I, I think under the MUTCD, if it abuts with a public road, we can put a stop sign on a private road because the violation would occur once you are off the private road. So that gives us the authority to put a stop sign there if we so choose. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it without having a conversation with that association, if there's a private road association. But, but the fact that it intersects with a public road, that supersedes and it would give it the ability to put a stop sign there. So you cannot commit the violation until you're onto the public part of the road. If you stopped before you got onto Middlesex Road, you wouldn't have committed a violation. So all of these, I mean, it seems to be consistent down that part of Christie Hill yeah. and the other side, that part of Middlesex. It's just something that you don't sometimes pay that much attention to because you, you, you know, you, until something happens. But I can't think of any other location around town that does not have stop signs. Right? Most of our roads in Darien right, are off of fairly major roads. We don't have too many roads that are off of other roads. So I would say Christie Hills traveled enough, heavily enough, that stop signs may be beneficial there. So that's not something you have to make a decision on today. We will look at Like I said, the DPW, I think, is a proponent of that. OK. Is that something that, um, well, obviously we can discuss it at the next meeting. Do you need a vote from us? Yes. As the LTA? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we should be prepared to vote on that at the next meeting. Um, <coughs> slow down in town. Think smart before you start campaign. 
point to talk about that. So, um, yeah, basically last year we did the first annual slow down, I would call it slow down in town campaign. It was called Think Smart Before You Start. Um, I think it was a success, successful campaign. This year uh, I spoke to the first selectman, Monica McNally. She's in support of doing it again. Instead of doing it just for the month of June, so we're going to kick it off June 1st, so it typically would end just uh, June 30th. So this year we decided to extend it to, for 45 days, so we we'll go through what you call it July 15th, basically. Uh, two members, uh, Matt Patrick and Ralph Oben of the RTM, are involved with this as well as they were last year. So we're going to get the RTM even more involved than we did last year as well. Uh, and Selectman Mike Burke is on that committee, as well as Marley Hayes, who does communications with the town, of course, the police commission. So they're going to come up with a new logo, maybe a new saying that will be a little bit uh, more clear, maybe just slow down in town, similar to that of, you know, where Wade has done that, New Canaan and its surrounding towns. So we'll kick that off and new logo comes out, seek everybody's input, and we'll get this thing kicked off. So we'll include social media, lawn signs, distribution of banners and stickers and things like that. Excellent. And if we're on camera, if anybody from the town has any suggestions on what we should do to improve it, feel free to reach out to the police commission, myself, or any of the other commissioners. Perfect. Um, St. Luke's running with the Saints road race. I've got that one. Um, uh, Mr. McMaster, who coordinates on behalf of the church, is petitioning the police commission to authorize their running with the Saints uh, road race on November 6th. It is the fifth year in a row. Uh, I checked our after action reports from last year and got positive feedback from all the officers that worked it. They said about 100 to 125 people participated last year. It wasn't that big of a turnout. Uh, but our motor officer, who has since retired, he led the race. He said all went well. Um, we had four hired for them. And uh, they're not planning on changing any routes or anything like that. It's the same exact route. We'll have closure. We'll have traffic advisories. We'll turn to social media to make sure the residents know. But after six years, I think they're probably, there's a level of expectation with it at this point. Um, I know we are not in the business of approving any new road races. Is this one of our listed Existing. Existing. It is, yeah. Okay. Um, I have no problem um, reapproving it. Do you need a motion from us? Mm -hmm. I make a motion that we approve the St. Luke's Running with the Saints, um, which is November 6th. Uh, second. Any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Okay. Um, walk right, bike left, drive safe signs. Yeah, Kim, I think you came up with this idea about a year, year and a half ago during the pandemic. Uh, I think it was a terrific idea. It seems to be effective on Long Neck Point and Clear Tree. And one of the suggestions that I would have is extend that down on um, Brookside Road, uh, particularly past Cherry Lawn where there's no sidewalks. It tends to be quite crowded with pedestrians, cyclists, and the like. So I think maybe extending a few signs down that way would make sense, maybe down to Stephen Mather. I certainly have no. Um, problem. And I also think in, I know we are slow down in town as a campaign, but I also think we could publicize, put these in the paper and because I think sometimes people read them and it doesn't quite yeah. sink in. But um, I have no trouble. Do we just need to fund them? Do we need to get a, we, is there any reason why we wouldn't do some more of these signs? Other than running the risk of oversigning any particular time. area, but you know, I, I think the ones on Pear Tree and, and Long Neck, you know, it's not like a perma shave. They're not coming every 10 feet, those kind of signs. So I don't see any real downside to putting them on Brookside. Um, was that Brookside? Brookside, yeah. We, need, yeah we, North, we can't put them on. We can't put them on yeah. Mansfield without state approval, but we can put them on Brookside. And I'm, I'm not sure the state would approve them on the state highway. Well, Mansfield have probably not. Well, on, on uh, Mansfield, I'm not sure they do any. I mean, there's a lot of sidewalks, and I don't think there's heavy traffic walking and biking in the places where there are no sidewalks. It's just not that conducive to, um, to walking. But um, do you need approval? 
for a motion from us to... Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, that must have been funded out of the alarm fund, I would think. I, I don't recall well, can, for certain how we purchased those signs. Well, can we table it one more meeting so that we know how many signs, the mm -hmm. cost, and if we need to do it out of the alarm fund? Uh, the other thing, this is just from someone who has experience with them on Pear Tree and Longneck Point, putting them in the right place is critical to their success because if you put them in a place where people are generally I would say breaking the rules or doing there's there's places to put them and then there's places where they're less effective so if you maybe Brent if that's your area you can go out and see where they might but can we come back next time with number and cost and whether it comes out of the alarm fund sure is that all right? yeah, perfect. Okay. And one more traffic issue, which really could also come under correspondence, and I think the commission has this letter from Long Neck Point, from a Long Neck Point resident. It is not in the packet. Right. But you, you forwarded it to I forwarded it. Already. I already forwarded it to people. Um, so, you know, the, the main, one of the main topics here first that's this kind of address is the request for the LTA to consider making Pear Tree Point and Long Neck Point one-way loop. That is a that is a heavy, heavy lift. That is something that I would not recommend the LTA consider unless they get significant input from the people who live on Long Neck Point and Pear Tree Point. I suspect you're going to get it. Uh, yeah, I don't think there will be universal concurrence for that. Uh, I, I'm not sure it would solve the problem. Let's say, for example, beach traffic in the summer would have to be, you would only be able to get to the beach one way. So all traffic would be going on one road to go to the beach, and all traffic would be exiting the beach off of one road. I'm not sure it would bring around, bring about the desired result that people might think, right? We, we already try to mitigate some of that during the summer, right? When traffic picks up a little bit with the no left turn sign, leaving the Coming tree as beach, well, right? right? Not that people necessarily obey it, but... It is an attempt to do that. Yeah. So, you know, to that end, as far as having enforcement down there, which was an, uh, another request of the resident, I've requested Captain Marin from Field Services does detail uh, speeding and traveling fast enforcement down there. So, I guess for anybody who might be watching on TV, I guess this is your fair warning. There will be enforcement going on on Long Neck Point and potentially Pear Tree Point in the near future. So. Uh, be forewarned. We're looking for compliance. We're not looking to give out tickets. And tickets are not inexpensive. Clearly, if you're going 15 over and a 30 and you're going 45 and 50, you're looking at a ticket that's at least $150. And you know, potential insurance rates going up. So uh, a lot of walkers in that area, as everyone knows. Pear Tree Point Road especially is not conducive for biking or walking. It just was not crafted that way. It's a very narrow road. It turns out. Huh? Long neck points a little more wide open in a straight away, and yeah, we, we get it. People sometimes step on a little bit down there, but we will we will do our enforcement end up there. So the bigger questions are questions that really we're gonna have to have a lot of consideration to do anything as drastic as making it a one way loop. Yeah, and I agree with you. I'm not sure that's gonna stop the speed, but um, okay, well we come into the summer months and it probably gets worse rather than better so we'll see how it goes if we're out there a little more a lot of construction going on there is a lot there. of construction so a lot going of construction on. vehicles going down there as well and we will we'll, uh, we'll be out there yeah um, and I know this is the exact opposite problem and I know the person that wrote the letter and she's not an offender but there are the um, walk four across with your dog on a leash, the, there's driver behavior and then there is walker behavior, um, both of which could improve, mm -hmm. shall I say. Well, I know we've had, we've had officer interactions with residents, well not residents, but walkers in that area that have been problematic and certainly not uh, respectful to the officers. And the officers are simply trying to have them not walk in the middle of the road or move to the side when they're supposed to. And, you know, if you're walking in the middle of the road, walking your dog, this, to have the car go around you on the <laughs> wrong side of the road is not the appropriate uh, response, right? This is supposed to be a, a shared responsibility for all roadway users. 
you know, having the cars go in the opposite lane because you don't want to move over because you are four abreast walking your dogs. It's just not. Or your, um, or your strollers. strollers. Or, your, or whatever. Or with your headphones in. So. Yes, we could have a lot of signs on Long Neck Point for almost every traveler. Um, okay, PSA unlocked cars. Well, as everyone here knows, and probably some of the people who watch on Channel 79, we partnered with the Norwalk Community College to create public okay. service announcements for unlocked cars. Uh, Jim Cameron from Channel 79 was instrumental in hooking us up with the video professor at Norwalk Community College, and we met with the students here. They have uh, supplied to us their submissions. The commission, I believe, has watched the submissions. Now we just need to, for the commission to decide which are the, the two first place winners and who is the one runner-up so we can give the awards to the uh, videographers who created these PSAs for us. Jim Cameron's waiting for us to tell them which are the winning submissions right. and they're going to run them. I think we should put them up on our town DPD website, also on the town website as well. Some of them are very well done. Very well done. You know, and I, was, I was not surprised, to be honest with you. I thought they would be very well done based on the ones that they did for Channel 79 that Jim shared with me. So I think a few were very, very good. So, and it might be a tough choice. But if the commission can let me know collectively who they think the winners are, we will. All right, we will get. We'll, we'll we will get, do that. I have watched them, but we'll get the uh, winners down here, and we'll have that little photo op and get get them a little press as well. Yes, we appreciate their efforts. They were very good. Yes, they were. <laughs> and hopefully, they will do some good. <laughs> Not just an academic exercise, but an actual um, move the needle on the problem they are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, as a commission, we will we will get on that. Um, department gift fund request for five hundred dollars for the purchase of an FBI National Academy plaque that will list all Darien Police Department attendees. And a copy of a picture of the plaque was placed in your folders. As the commission knows, we have a very nice plaque in our lobby that honors all members of the Darien Police Department, past and present, who have served in the armed services in all branches. This is a similar plaque, but it's, if you want to say it's a little more exclusive, because in the 100-year year history of the department, I believe we've only had 14 or 15 attendees for the FBI National Academy, and a couple more. This plaque has 24 names, and I'd like to uh, get this plaque to honor those people who have attended the FBI National Academy. Um, How many do we have? I think it's maybe 14 or 15. In our 100-year history? The FBI National Academy, I believe, started in 1939. Oh, and we had somebody, I think, in this, like, low two digits, like session 20. And we're up, I think, to session 23. So it is, uh, it is a feat to be nominated and attend the FBI National Academy. It's not easy, as the commission knows. We've been very fortunate in our small department here to have top shelf police executives attend there, so. I guess we shouldn't get in great until the captain comes back, right? Yes. <laughs> well, we're, 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 I'm hoping it, we'll, we'll get it done in, in advance and, you know, just not put it on if he, if he doesn't <laughs> materialize <laughs> come September. <laughs> But uh, you can see it. it's it's very nice. It's uh, it's a very nice plaque. I think it would be a good thing for the department to have. I agree. All right. I will make a motion that we approve the five hundred dollar request for the purchase of the FBI National Academy plaque to be displayed with our other similar plaque. Second. Okay. Any other questions? Comments. All right. All those in favor. Um, okay, it is a special meeting. We are coming to the end of our um, agenda. We will go into executive um, session for two items. Um, for those who have looked at our agenda, um, one of the agenda items is discussion annual review by the police commission on the performance of Chief Donald B. Anderson. This is um, an annual review. It is. Um, nothing in particular that we're meaning about. It is that time of year, um, and we will um, do that in executive session. I expect nothing but positive feedback, but 
Um, we will also discuss the upcoming collective bargaining, but we will take no action coming out. And before you turn that off, let's set our next meeting. And we will be up for next Thursday. I'm assuming the commission. I don't think we need to be doing that. It's Cinco de Mayo. Hey, you know. Um, I'm happy to go to the 19th, which is a regular meeting. We can do it on the 12th if we want to, um, don't want to go. So the 12th or the 19th are both fine for me. Same. Same thing here. Should we go for the 19th? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my paper book in front of me, but All right. I, I think either one of those dates. Well, since. Um, Chief, you do have something that day because I am going on your behalf to the Law Enforcement Memorial Day of right. the Academy. I forget what it was that you had. We got some, yeah, promotional testing that day. Okay. So we would be concluded by 4 o'clock. I'm going to put the 19th just to get us on for a regular meeting. If by chance somebody looks at their calendar, uh, the commission is fully available on the 12th. So, Jan, just can you confirm with us that the 19th works? We all march in two on the 30th? Is that we? Is that? I will be there. We, Everybody? I, I Captain Marin will not be there. Oh. Goodness. I well, think Captain Hedema, I think, will be there. All right. She'll well, have to run the days. We are. I think we're we are on Monday. But the the parade is going off, and we we're got all, our okay. state highway use permit. All right. We're all good. Same uh, route. No changes. No. Well. Hopefully, good weather. Yes. Be nice to get back to some semblance of normalcy. Um, okay. With that, we will um, adjourn to go into executive session. But we can't see who's there other than you. So, is there any chance of just letting everybody know who's there? Well, yes, I, we did. A oh, I'm earlier. sorry, I missed it. Ah, there's Sam. Hi. Okay, so uh, in the room here, uh, we have uh, Jack Davis and Frank M and Joe uh, uh, and uh, Michael Caslo. And uh, um, Teresa, 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 Teresa
Mr. Mia. And Mike Wheeler. Mike and Wheeler. Wheeler. And me. Thank you. Can we finish our vote? Uh, yes, we're, uh, we're yes. about to do that. Thank you very much. Now, uh, are there any abstentions? I see none. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, next item is just announcements. Um, there is a, uh, the, the, the bill that allows us to have a, both a virtual meeting and a face-to-face -face meeting uh, is expiring on April 30th. And uh, there is now pending before, there's been a bill uh, which supports continuing with a hybrid uh, situation that's been passed by the House, uh, the Substitute House Bill 5269. That bill is being considered by the State Senate and uh, they have until Friday to act or uh, the old act ex expires and uh, we would, you could only have then face-to-face -face meetings. It would not allow for electronic hybrid meetings. So we'll see where that goes. The, the bill that's, in with, that's going to the Senate now extends it until when? Um, let me see. One of, one of the things for the TV 79, the way the mics are set up, they're not used to recording people in the audience. They make everybody come over here to talk. So when you're going to speak, speak loud, because that's the only microphone serving TV 79, which is the primary recording vehicle for this meeting. I'm not recording it on go to meeting. I, I think I can answer that question. Tell me if I'm speaking too softly. This bill is being moved by both sides of the aisle because they felt that virtual meetings increased the participation of the public in local government. As such, it has, it does not have an expiration date. It's going to allow for hybrid meetings. Now, the ins and outs of what that hybrid meeting means um, and how, um, I haven't read the bill, so I can't answer that. But Lois has. Well, um, it, Seth Lois has got her hand up. Yes, Lois. I was just going to indicate that I looked through the bill, and I know I sent it to Seth, that it has a section in there about voting that's just what we're doing now. Right. It didn't, they didn't change anything from what was already in place, if they pass it. So, um, that's uh, my, well, the only other announcement uh, that I had was um, I got in touch with Jim Cameron to talk about FOIA, how to, how to put the, some sort of a presentation together on FOIA, and also something on Robert Schulz of Order. Uh, we discovered a number, uh, on YouTube, a number of presentations on Robert's Rules, different segments. Haven't had a chance to review all of them yet to see which ones would, would be applicable, but it looks like that part might possibly be done, that you could just simply post those up on the town portal and make them available to everybody. The other uh, part is that uh, we might uh, invite a gentleman down from Hartford who's on the uh, FOIA, he's the head of the FOIA committee and he has a, a uh, presentation. Might have him come before the RTM, make a presentation, record it, and then have that available uh, on the portal for FOIA questions. So that's sort of where we're at now and uh, hope to have that uh, uh, in more detail. Uh, fairly quickly. Okay, thank you. Good, yes, Lois. And the announcements, you're going to talk about the Blight Committee? Um, no, I wasn't uh, going to address that tonight. Uh, um, we, uh, well, we have a person um, on the, on the Blight Committee. At the last meeting. Yeah. We, 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 we put somebody on the Blight Committee. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean Blight, I meant um, ethics. 
you were going to summarize where you ended up with the ethics question with that. Well, the ethics, uh, uh, it turns out that a person, as long as they, uh, even though they've resigned from the RTM, as long as they are an elector of the town, and, uh, and that means they're living in town, uh, can continue to serve, uh, serve out their time uh, on uh, the, the uh, committee. So uh, that's covered. We don't have to put anybody on ethics. Thank you. That's what I meant. Oh. Sorry. No. No problem. And, and the person who has resigned has stated they continue, to, they wish to continue on ethics? Right. Okay. Yes, that's, that was me and the yeah. other. Yes. No, no, I, I understand, but that's an Now you were putting that on the, state. I got you, yeah, correct. Okay, so those are, uh, those are two announcements I had for you. Um, the next item is assigning committees uh, for three members from District 2. So, uh, Michael, you? I got it. So, we have added the three members um, to replace Liz Bacon, Stacy, and um, a third, um, and Mia Handler. We had um, several vacancies in District 2, um, filled them, and we last week, Mike and I assigned them um, based on their preference sheets. So, we have added Emily Salmore to PZ and H. Charles Teschner to F and B, and Katie Vanovich to um, Public Health and Safety. Um, if anyone wants to see resumes, Mike was good enough to bring them, so I have a copy. But um, it was, we put that together pretty quickly. We both it was pretty clear where their skills were, where their interests were, and where we had vacancies in district. And on two, they re they replaced the person on the committee who had left. That's right. All right. And. Uh, where did Emily go, did you say? Emily you went said to PZ and H. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. And she'll take Liz Bacon's place. Normally putting somebody on F and B in the middle of the term would be, could be a, a question, but most of the work of F and B for this year on the budget's been done as I understand it. And uh, so uh, there's no problem with having this, uh, having Charles uh, join F&Bs. Thank you for speaking for F&B. That's not necessarily true, but. <laughs> well, I spoke to you early about it, Jack, no, that something changed. The fact is there's still a lot of work to be done in preparing. Oh, I see what you're saying, okay. Mm -hmm. The work is not done. Yeah. <laughs> we did a vote. That's what we did. Okay, well, that's, what I, uh, that's what I meant. All right. Um, so, um, any further comments? Okay, so uh, can we have a motion then uh, to uh, put those individuals from District 2 on uh, the committees assigned? I'll make that move. Uh, uh, I have a motion from Mark and a second from Frank. Great. Uh, any uh, no votes? Any abstentions? I see none. Ready to vote? Uh, we are ready to vote. Uh, we are, therefore, that item passes unanimously. Um, one, yes. one request. Um, can you guys provide the email of the each of the individuals to the committee to us, so we have a way of contacting them. Yeah, they've all set up um, the standard um, gerianct.gov emails, but we can email them to you. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right. Uh, the, can uh, we ask a question there? I'm sorry, just to confirm, I'm sorry, it's Krista, that uh, Mike and Mike, are you contacting the other chairs for NH and Public Health and Safety? We just, I want to just close the loop on that. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Good, uh, next item is uh, setting the agenda for the RTM budget meeting and uh, what, uh, what I'll do is uh, recognize Jack uh, to talk about it because this is primarily an F&B show. I'm going to go over here so I don't have to shout. Uh, I was looking at the proposed agenda and so the first thing um, we have to do 
is take the appropriation of $2.9 million from the unassigned fund balance to fund capital projects, blah, blah, blah. And that has to be our first resolution of the night because we need that to balance everything else that's coming afterwards. If we don't vote on that, then we can't vote on the capital because that's being used to pay for the capital. Okay. So, so that goes first. That okay. goes first. So that becomes 2211. Um, and in reality, f and is the only um, primary. Yeah, and, and primary, probably the and only, the only one committee on that. So I don't know if you want to move that and vote on that individually or just do the whole sheet and vote on the whole I'd like to do the vote. whole sheet if, if everybody's okay, fine. okay with that. Whatever your preference was. Just check. Okay, next is 2212A, pardon me, and it's the appropriation from the capital reserve for capital non-recurring expenditures. I have yet to figure out how to not have the glasses fog. <laughs> Uh, non-recurring expenditures, um, and that F and B is primary. Will provide an overall reconciliation, but then each of the various committees, um, including education, would report on their capital, um, with the exception of anything that was we voted on in ARPA. You don't have to report on. We've already addressed those. And there's um, three items that are being bonded, which is the um, Board of Ed track for about 600,000 and about 750 or someplace in that range for sidewalks, um, which you know public health and safety or public works would typically both report on. But those three items are off the table. Um, we will be addressing the bonding on those in our June meeting. So, but everything else that's in public works, everything else, park and rec, education and that, has a capital report on 2212A. Um, now, are they going to be, I mean, what they would be reporting on is mostly finance, right? I mean, no, they're going to report on what the projects are. I'm not touching them. Ah, all right. I'm going to say, here's how we're paying for it. Here's what was requested last year. Here's how we addressed it. Here's uh, the numbers um, overall. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I may touch on one or two other things saying these are being bonded to, to talk about that. But other than that, I'm not really getting into the detail on the project. So, right. like Adele will right. talk about that there's an extra 100000 on the tennis courts, or um, if there's a public works truck, then um, obviously Ralph would um, talk about right. those. So, the details of what they're and what they want to talk about is up to them. But I'm just doing high-level financials, comparison, year-to-date. Um, and um, part of the explanation of how we're paying for this. Right. Because we started with about $9 million or so of capital, we're down to this, and it didn't magically dissipate. Most of the projects are there, with the exception of the Lee Beach project, which nobody has to talk about because it was withdrawn. Okay. And I'm not even using it in the starting numbers. The next is 2212B, which is the approval of the selectman's budget. Again, I'm talking high level. Um, so we'll talk about the, really, the four component parts, which is the board of selectmen operating the library grant, because it's really included in there, um, the debt, at which time we'll present a slide that was used at the board of finance that shows how debt is going down over the next um, five years of about 30 million. We'll talk about what debt and interest, which we always do at that time, and we'll talk about the transfer to the capital fund, which um, accounts for the capital that's there. Again, it's, it's just an uh, overall number. Um, depending upon how Kate and I do get together, um, <clears throat> This is an interesting budget year because there is a change 
in accounting. So I'll briefly talk about the change in accounting of what we're doing. Um, also, the Board of Finance Chair came before us in December and mentioned that core growth should be 2.5 and overall growth should be 3. And both of these budgets are coming in over 3 and a quarter percent, and that was never reconciled. So what I'm trying to do is meet with Rich and with Kate to show, first of all, whether or not 2.5 was even reasonable, which I don't think it was based upon just the core increase in health care and um, fuel and other normal things that we bought, that just the prices all went up. But just so that people are aware, because I've heard this mentioned before, the 7.5 inflation that I've heard mentioned at various things, especially in the Board of Ed, has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Because most of the drivers of that inflation number that comes to 7.5 do not affect town or Board of Ed budgets. All right? We're not buying food. The cars we buy are minimal. The Board of Ed has locked in their fuel, so it's not affecting them. It does affect mm -hmm. on the uh, town side. So when you deconstruct the 7.5 inflation, it has nothing to do with why this is driving. So I do want to get into what the drivers are on the Board of Selectmen. After that, again, each of the committees would talk about their respective um, budgets. All right, I'll get a hold of them and make sure they're prepared. Right. And it could be simple, all right? Well, <laughs> but, it, I mean, it, it, they're responsible. I'm not getting into what's going on in, in public works. I'm not getting what's going on in park and rec. Um, that's there. I'm, I'm talking the total overall, here's what's happening and what's happened there. Um, we get into... Um, 2212C, and on this one, education is primary. Yep. F and B is secondary. They can discuss their budget. We're going to discuss the drivers of the budget. So, like, one of the things sort of caught me by surprise is that the real one of the major drivers of this budget increase happens to be that there's eight or nine new FTEs. And that's driving why it went up by that. There's other factors that are going in there, um, certain new programs and other things like that that we can talk about. And there are some costs that did go up. But those are the drivers. So when we talk about it, we're going to talk about what the drivers of this are, as well as some of the concerns. Because I'm going to tell you, F&B isn't happy with the 3.7% operating increase in either of the two operations. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you my joke here, because I'm not going to say it in the audience meeting. <laughs> you remember when your mom told you that two wrongs don't make a right? Well, this year, we had too high of a Board of Selectmen operating budget. We had too high of a Board of Ed budget, but because we didn't properly record revenue for the current year's budget, which FNB did suggest that certain things be added, but if they weren't, and we've had the good fortune of Park and Rec really blowing it out of the water, which is a good thing, again, on their programs, and we're down on staff so that, in reality, our expenses are down, so we're almost saving $2.5 million coming back in on the Board of Ed budget, uh, Board of Selectmen budget. And let's remember when we net revenue against that, this isn't a big budget. You gotta take away the debt, you gotta take away the capital from that 50 million. And when you net revenue, we're almost getting 10% back on that budget. That's not good. That's not good budgeting. But because of all these three wrongs, we're able to pay down all these high things. Oh, and the grand list went up by a significant amount, generating about $2 million. That's not bad. Right. That's a good thing. What percentage of the grand list go up, Jack? Do you recall? I, 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 I have That's to look. Great. It's either 1% or 2%, but it's like the highest I've seen yeah. for like forever. Um, and we're still having other things coming online. So when you're looking at all these things, we're able to pay it down. So we end up with a 2% increase in the mill rate. 
And so even if F and B was to come and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, nobody cares. So it's a little bit of frustration, but if we're looking at further budgeting going down the road, this isn't good business practice to continue the financial strength that this town has. That, so that's my basic joke that three wrongs made a right. Well, what it shows is that you have a one-time anomaly, if I can use that word, which offsets uh, hides, maybe? No, no. Seth, no, it's not I, I, that's not true. We've been watching what the revenue no. has been on what we record. We tend to be very conservative on our expenses and very conservative on our revenue. But F&B has been challenging the recording of revenue, saying it's too low. And part of the thing is we have a grand list. So if you're off on revenue, it's okay. We can always make that transfer out from the grand list. It's part of the re I mean, the general fund. It's part of the reason why it's there. In addition, which we'll get to later, when you calculate out the taxes, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, rightfully so. But there's some wiggle room, which comes in. So anyhow, so um, on 12 C education, they go first. F and B will go afterwards. Then we go to um, 2212D, which shows that people can add, because basically it adds 12 um, B and C and says, here's the number. So in the past, when we were all together doing Kumbaya in prior years, we F and B moved it, and then we did a voice vote. We didn't even have to record it. It was just voice vote, because basically we know how to add, hopefully. Then we get to the approval 2212E. I have to put my glasses back on because I made this far too small for me to read. Um, we get to E, which is approval of the mill rate. So we're going to go back over the mill rate because we're going to do analysis of here's where we started by moving this, by paying for this, by going to ARPA here. Now, here's how we got to this mill rate, all right? Then we get to the fact that we adjust the grand list. This is where we'll talk about the grand list, that we make an adjustment to the grand list. And some of the adjustments are some of the credits that we give to veterans, some of the things that come in from the state, our volunteers that are working, they will get credits. There's some other adjustments and other things that go on there. And there was a change in the methodology because we were accounting in prior years for too high of a credit. And Kate and Jen, which they always do by reviewing all this stuff on an annual basis, made the determination that we were giving too much of a credit there from what we were actually doing. So they lowered it, which in fact will reduce some of that cushion that we have next year. But it's the right thing to do, and I fully trust what they've done and, and have reviewed it with them. But then what we do is we take the last five years collection rate come up with an average, and then take 25 basis points off. Now, 25 basis points doesn't sound like a lot, but you've got to remember what it's on. This is big money that we're talking about here. The reason for it is twofold. Number one, we can never guarantee that we're going to get the collection rate on an annual basis. We're at 99 plus percent, so we're in very good shape. But the other thing is, during the course of the year, adjustments are made to the grand list. So there's a really good analysis that Jen does on an annual basis that shows the historic use of what we put for a budgeted grand list and then what the grand list was for the taxes that we actually sent out bills on. And they're never the same. It can't be because we do adjustments in February in that. So sometimes a little this higher, question. Question on the screen. sometimes a little lower. So that we'll talk about in there. Who had the question? Patty. Yes, Jack. Um, will you be sending this information out in advance? Like, will everybody be able to get a packet or get it all online so they can review all of this in advance? 
then it could perhaps be covered a little bit more quickly. I, I, I don't know if that was in my contract and based upon the pay raise they gave me to do this. Um, I, it's a lot of work. I did that to- Well, if you, if you do the work, I'll do the Xerox. <laughs> it's not a Xerox. It, it's tying in each of the forms, getting the information and going from there, and I have to have all of this validated by Kate, Jen, and Rich. So I need for their turnaround, and remember, people don't work here on Fridays, even though I will say that I do get responses from Kate and Jen when they're not supposed to be working. Sorry. Um, I will try, but and as I did two, th two, three years ago, I sent out a full package on the reconciliation, but it's a lot of work. <coughs> and so I will get what I get together out, but some of this, I'm not gonna give you my commentary out on it. I'm um, going to give charts and analysis for what will That's be good. shown if, yeah. if I can get to it. If I can get to it. If you, you know. can do charts and analysis so people can review it up front so that if they have questions, I think that yeah, would be I, great. I, 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 I would appreciate it, but, you know, unlike everyone else, you know, F&B wasn't the only people supposedly looking at this budget to review and analyze it. And all of the Board of Finance meetings have been televised. So while I'm more than happy to spoon feed, I, I will try and get what I can get done. So, and get it out to them. There may be the high level, but some of the other charts that I work out with Kate may not be in that initial package. But I'm trying to get this stuff out. Because- Okay, thank you. Oh, that's good. Um, so we'll talk about the mill rate because there's various component parts on the mill rate. And I'm you know, trying to keep some of this simple, but it, we should explain what's going on. The next thing is the authorization for borrowing for 500,000 based upon future tax receipts. Five million. Uh, five million, rather. Um, if you read what we have here, f and the only one on that one as well as primary. Um, so if you read, this is a standard resolution that is raised to 10 million two years ago during um, due to unknowns associated with the pandemic, but moved back to 5 million for the current tax year, fiscal year 22 budget. The town has never drawn on this authorization. That essentially, even though there'll be more verbiage associated with it, the standard, that's going to be my report. It's going to be th that simple. Um, same thing on the next one. The authorization of appropriations for other funds, which is G, F and B is the, um, is the I'm sorry, F. Uh, oh no, that's, I'm talking about 13, sorry. Um, 12, 2212 G is how we fund all the other funds. There's a new fund this year because, again, in June, based upon, again, Park and Rec blowing the socks out of, off the socks off on their programs, they have more expenses than what they've given appropriations. So at our June meeting, we're gonna to have to do what we did last June by increasing their appropriations so they can pay for the programs that they've sold, all right? So this doesn't become an annual event. A number of years ago when we first did the initial accounting change, they had an account on the balance sheet but it wasn't a fund, just an account, and they'd net this and then move it in at the end of the year. That really wasn't good accounting. So they then tried to do the income and the revenue, and we're having to go and do an appropriation in June every year. That's not good accounting. Anymore. So what we're going to do is we set up a special revenue fund that we're setting up this year to start next year, July 1st, and all the revenue and all the expenses that they need will go into that fund, and at the end of the year, it sweeps out into revenue, and they have a number in the revenue side from the Special Revenue Fund for Park and Rec, so we don't have to come back and approve appropriations. So we will talk that that's the new fund from the Reserve um, Recreation Program Fund, which has 950,000 in it. Um, if anybody wants to talk on the sewer fund or on the parking lot fund, or Adele wishes to discuss the park and rec fund any greater than what I just did, they can 
Julie. I spoke to them. They said they'd have, you know, they would keep it short, but yeah. that's fine. I, that's fine because I don't typically get into sewer funds. Although I am doing bumper stickers that we support. Sometimes our I wish I did. I've that. been I've been asked for those now. Um, so that that wraps up that aspect. The next thing is twelve thirteen, which is an appropriation for fifty five million plus that says that the board of finance can refinance or use general funds to pay down debt, which we've done um, before. But it's only for those that are available, because sometimes when we issue a bond, you cannot refinance for a certain number of years. So it's only those that are available. So this has consistently decreased or increased the number of changes. I think last year was 65 mil. So brief explanation of what it is. Um, and then we're done with that. And again, basically what you're reading there may be what the report that I'm reading, even though there'll be a much larger report that I'm not reading the whole thing on. So it'll be in the file, the record, okay. but it's going to be real short. All right? Now, what we need here, though, to explain all of what's going on is an intro. And part of it is talking about what I talked about, that we've had changes of account. We have operating budgets that are far too high. We have to discuss what's happening at the end of the current year that's generating about $660,000 from the um, Board of Ed. Only five hundred ninety dollars is from the ECR, but, um, and that's based upon a higher rate return. That we have some revenues coming in about one point, I always forget which one is what, 1.3 versus 1.2, but one side of it is 1.3 for either increasing revenues and expenses. The other side is we've had a lot of retirements, specifically over in the police department, and because of that it takes time for us to hire new people. It's very hard to get um, police officers, and we've done a very good job, no matter how good of a police force this um, is, and it is a very good one. Um, but it does take time, and like anything else which happens in the Board of Ed situation, is that you may have a more experienced teacher retire or leave the system, and you're bringing in an equivalent person at a lower grade. So you pay them less. So there's some action that goes on there. Um, so that's generating about a 1.2 million dollar savings in expenses. Um, so we have to explain all this. We have to explain that our grand list went up. And, and this is like it's a start. So I've touched on some of it during the report. But this is sort of setting the story. I, I believe... So we want to start with the intro, right? Right. But okay. I wanted to go through all that to say, look, this is all this stuff in here, but things move faster because in reality, we're telling a story here. What happened during this budget year? How did the current year affect this budget year? This is the story. So those are some of the things that we'd be talking about, some of the reconciliations. And that sets the tone, which then allows us going through so it's not the first time somebody's hearing what's going on. Also that they decided to take 2.9 million from the general fund. And a little bit of education again, we talked about it in February, but we're going to continue to do that, is that at a minimum, the Board of Finance doesn't want to be less than 12% of what our revenues are. And we try to be at least 15%, which is the goal that we want to be. But really, the best number is 16.5%. And with moving to 2.9, not that it's heresy that we're going to go and lynch our Board of Finance for doing this, but we could have gone a little bit less, and we ended up about 16.4%. Now, again, some of the numbers of what we're estimating to come in is estimates, so we'll have a better idea of that. But some of those things, we have to talk about the grand list, we have to talk, because these are all the component parts that f and and the Board of Finance and all of us talk about on an ongoing basis, because that's how we ended up with a 2.3%. We also took, which I was very happy with, um, you know, we talk about the capital 
um, a reserve fund for capital non-recurring expenditures, yeah. and they have a capital reserve in there, which two years ago we had facilitated cleaning up with the Board of Finance because we thought there were a lot of projects that just shouldn't be there anymore. And we, they lowered, they're using some of that to pay down the capital, which is good because, you know, I know that um, Jim, and rightfully so, likes keeping his powder dry on that for things that might come up, but uh, we, neither one of us wanted to be too high either. So it's finding the balance over there, and they found the balance by moving $100,000 out. So some of that is just setting the tone, setting the pace, and setting the story so that it's going to be, you're going to hear about this later, but you know, here's what happened, you're going to hear about this later. Here's the number, you know. Again, F&B during the last reval started to focus on something else. What's requested? Because what re is requested is the numerator. We don't control the dom denominator of figuring out the mill rate. That's the grand list. We don't have input, right. nor does any elected official have input into what that denominator is. But the numerator we do. And so we started doing that, and part of the reason was is that our taxes, I think, went up 3% that year. But if you looked at what was requested by the Board of Ed and the Board of Selectmen, their increase was only 2%. It was that we lost, um, our, our grand list went down that year that resulted in a higher tax increase, but really our two operating budgets were very good. So we've continued on that um, thrust of looking at what's requested, and we'll try and do a reconciliation of that as well, because that's where we're starting. What are you requesting? Okay, how do we pay for this? Okay, this is how we went here. And, and that's basically it from the budget. Do you, so, do you do a reconciliation on the cost side when they close the books on 21-22? We, um, we have in the past, we started this year on the, um, on the Board of Ed. We had um, a conversation come in and um, Dr. Adley and Duke were able to come in um, in October, and we talked about what happened in the prior year's budget. And I have to say, f &B has a little bit of an advantage on this, because there's several programs that they've implemented over the last couple of years, and unless it gets on a Board of Ed agenda, they can't talk about it. But when they're in our meeting, we can say, okay, two years ago we did this, how's that working? What, what are you finding? What are you learning from that? And that was a lot of what the conversation was. We want to do the same for the, um, the um, Board of Selectmen. And, you know, even in the intro, we may touch on a couple of other things because as I was just talking to Joe, you know, we talk about a unassigned general fund of $28 million or so, all right? And so everybody thinks we only have $28 million. No! We got 50, 60 million. We just did a debt um, thing, so that goes into a special debt fund until we pay down whatever we took the debt for, repaid, or on the school, we're waiting until the bills come in until we're paying that off. So that's in a special fund. We have the capital accounts where we're moving all this money in and the projects are there. Some of them take over a year to get done, so that's there. Um, we have other investment accounts and other things going on. Even little things, during the time of the pandemic, the cafeteria fund, the Board of Ed had to find sources to replenish that fund so it's not in deficit. And it was in deficit going into this year. And I'm happy to report, based upon the March numbers, it's back to being healthy again. So just on some of the other funds that are there, I just want to mention, like, here's some other funds. We don't vote on it on the budget, but they're there in this town. And so this one's healthy. That's going here. That's going there. And one of the things that we asked um, to do a number of years ago, and it's been implemented by Kate, is that if you recall, F&B did a joint project with the Board of Finance and Gen to clean up some of the reserve funds. Um, 
So one of those funds are going to be cleaned up this year, which is the special ed fund is going to be closed out um, for 100000 because 100000 wasn't going to resolve any special ed project nowadays. Um, so that's being closed out back into the general fund. Um, and then um, there's some other transactions that are going on. But they provide a list of where all those fund balances are. So at the end of the year, so we know what it is so that nothing's going out and we can clean up anything that's out there. So I may just mention some of those, just the key ones, not all of them um, to go. And then some people know that I am looking during the course of this um, kind of July 1st um, to address the um, false alarm funds which may mean that nobody ever comes to my house if you're a policeman or a fireman again. But, um, but yes, I, I'd like to um, address and see if we can have a change on that um, to be more consistent with what other towns are doing at this time, but still provide both of those commissions with some funding. So It's a lot of work, Jack. Well, we a get lot of there. work. We have a good team. Well, uh, there is a lot of complexity to this. And in the good old days, if I can use that term, I, when we first started doing budgets here in town, we used to get a mimeographed, and the different RCs were in different color sheets. <laughs> and so uh, that's changed. This is the largest budget in the history of the town. And uh, it is complex, but if you're going to understand it, you've got to take the time to explain it. And so uh, I, I, I congratulate you for doing as much as you've done in the amount of time, because uh, there's a lot to it. Um, my only suggestion would be sit in your desk, put a stopwatch in front of you, and go through it one time and just see what you got. So you've got a target, some, some sense of where you go. It's going to depend upon what charts we can get, all right? Um, because I do think it's very important, because everybody heard that the, oh my gosh, the budget's up 9% and everything at the beginning of the year, and now we end up with a mill rate increase of 2%. The, the guidance that we had was not on the mill rate. It was on the operating budgets, all right? Again... F and B's position, I don't mean to speak for the entire team, but at least I can say my position is, I don't care if capital goes up by 100%. Don't care. Because it's infrastructure and investment in our town. And so if we don't do it this year, for the most part, there's a couple of projects that I would say, yeah, why the heck are we doing this? Um, if we don't do it this year, for the most part, we're going to be doing it in the future years. The question is whether or not we have the right price there. I, I should also add, and I've it's said... the right project, to your earlier point. If it's yes. the right project. Yes. Um, I, I should add also in the 15 or so years, I'm, I'm never sure how long I've been on the RTM anymore, so I just keep on saying 15 years again. Um, unfortunately, I'm not getting any younger when I'm saying that. But this is the first year that I've ever seen the Board of Selectmen have a net addition to the town administrator's budget. Now, I could agree if these are essential things, but even in my conversation with some of um, my um, associates on the Board of Selectmen, they said, yeah, these are nice tabs. <laughs> But again, you know, when you're when you're when you're having a 2.3 percent increase in the mill rate, who cares? You can't even make an adjustment or a suggestion to it because nobody's really interested. I got a 2.3 percent in mill rate increase instead of the nine percent I heard about. This is a good budget year. Well, so, that's our, that's our well, well, that was part of the reason we got there. We had ARPA money, we had monies coming in, we had an increase in the grant list, we took some money out of the, uh, some other funds, and um, we're bonding about 1.3 million, and you know, 
at the end of the day, you end up where you want to go. And so, the awareness is going to keep going up, at least in the short term. Yeah. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Are there uh, questions for Jack? Uh, Frank? Jack, if you were asked about a question about. Frank, we're a little loud because that's the only microphone we have. Uh, Jack, if you're asked a question about the uh, change of the grant list, I know you're not responsible for that, but what can be uh, the general response to that? You said it went down. No, 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 no it went we up. did the reval a number of years ago, if you recall, because property values went down, the grand list went down. Yeah, yeah. All right? So that's it's market the, driven. From, from all we hear about real estate, Prices and sales going up because of COVID. It has gone up. It seems to be an anomaly. The up. grand list has gone up. An anomaly that it's gone down. It's not going down. No, the grand list no, 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 no. I was talking about we started something a number of years ago during the last reval because the grand list went down. Back now then. we've been going up since that time. Okay. Um, but just an interesting little aside for, for folks just so that everybody understands the grand list. You have a million dollar home and it sells for two million dollars. No effect on the grand list until we do a reval. You do an addition to your house, well, all of a sudden market rates may hit you because it's not just what that addition was. So that's new buildings that we've done. Um, when, when you're seeing these three developments going on, you gotta remember, some of that grand list goes down because all the personal property is no longer in that building, the building's there. And the only thing you're left with is land. Buildings have been torn down? Yep, and, until you start building again. And then it's like, I one time did some valuation for mortgage, um, commercial mortgage lending. Then, you know, you have these experts who come in, and we have um, several in this building that come in and say, ah, eh, you're about 40% done on this, so this is worth about this much, and they negotiate, and by the way, that becomes your new taxes for that particular building. Um, it's an art, it's a science, but, uh, and I'm always impressed by those who are capable of doing that. Um, and um, and we have somebody who's very good in our um, in our town who's very good in negotiating that. But just don't think that because a house sells that that grand list is going up um, because it doesn't. Not until the rebound. Nope. Change your bathroom. So can I ask a question? All right. Yes. <laughs> so granted, it's not a conversation for this budget season, but in the event. We end up talking about Great Island in our June meeting. I assume we're going to talk about that impact of that coming off the grand list, potentially? Um, I would imagine if a sale goes on, all right, that F&B, as well as other committees that are assigned, will be looking at all various aspects of that. Um, including what the debt service would be, um, what impact it might have on future operating budgets, um, what the effect of the um, of losing it off the tax rolls are, um, and every other financial aspect that we can think of, um, as well as um, and and I'm going to be very honest because I've said this before, so. And, you know, I might as well be on the public record because I've made this comment enough. If, in fact, this comes to fruition, I am hoping that the Board of Selectmen do not come and tell us what they're going to do with it. Because any decision they're making now is the wrong decision. That's somebody who's done business development in their professional career. I'd like them to tell me what we might do with it I'd also like to have a, a board of trustees with some very innovative people on that to figure out what the business propositions might be for the various aspects on it, as opposed to people who say, no, I want to have people figure out how do we get this done. 
It's a different mindset than had going in. And understand, I ran greenhouse groups, so that was part of what I used to do is, oh, how can we do it? Oh, that's a barrier, okay, we can go over, we can go under, blah, 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 blah. so a, a group of people in town, this, this town is very capable of having that. But, so that that's there, because I don't think anybody should be telling us what we can, what we can, we will do with that until you really have time to evaluate and go from there. And I'm not saying one way or another of where I am with it. Um, I will tell you that as happened with Highland Farms, um, I know that Seth was contacted early, I was contacted earlier, um, so that we knew that something was there. We are not privy to the executive session conversations, nor do I want to be. I mean, I had to hide that book from in my house so nobody else saw it. Right. Um, and, um, but, the, you know, the, the town is doing it the right way. That's the only thing I can say. And if it does come, well, I, I don't think it'll make the June meeting. Um, but if it does come, then I promise that everybody will be looking at it with very strong, fine tooth combs. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, no, no, any other no, questions question. for uh, Delano? Yes. Uh, I, I would assume that you're you're about Adele. ready to ask everybody to vote on the um, agenda for the yeah. next meeting. And as you do as you do that, I realize you know the agenda says that we will be meeting that the RTN will be meeting in person. Right. I just want to be, and I realize you're doing that because you don't have a choice because you don't know the whether the rules are going to change or not. Right. Um, between now. So anyway. Um, my question is, are Welcome you, are to my shoes. To let people know? What are we doing to let people know right away? Because they've been voting remotely and they're expecting to vote, vote remotely. So, right. Um, as soon as I know, I will send an email to the RTM, everybody. Uh, as it is now, um, I, I, when we uh, post this uh, agenda, we'll note that it is in person because that's what it is for, for now. Um, and if they, uh, if they vote in time, uh, then uh, we'll be able to do a hybrid uh, by the time the meeting rolls around, May 9. Uh, the, the current permission to be able to do this. We, we, we won't be able to do a hybrid for the full RTM. Right, Wolves? We're not. No, hybrid. no hybrid for the full RTM. We have the technology in place to do it. We, we can. It's either virtual or virtual or virtual virtual hybrid meeting in tonight because mm -hmm. people can't see each other. Yeah. So we won't, we won't be ready till the fall uh, in the auditorium for a hybrid meeting. Oh, well, in that case, um, I thought that we'd work some of that out, but never mind. Um, yeah, well, in that case, uh, I'll just note that if it isn't voted, uh, you know, um, uh, if it is voted, uh, then we'll do a hybrid. We'll, we'll have to do a hybrid. I don't know that we can. Do, no, we can't do it in the virtual. Not a hybrid. I didn't mean that. Electron, uh, a virtual. Virtual. Yeah. virtual. Yeah. Yeah. I meant virtual. virtual. Or in person. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, if we're doing in person, I mean, just because there are some of us who still um, are a little bit cautious for various reasons, um, can we have like certain areas, I know we all like to be in a district in that, but what precautions are we doing? Can we have an area that has a little bit more space spread out for people who are not wanting to sit within Lo the area? Lois and I mentioned, Lois and I mentioned, Lois and I want to talk about it. Lois is, um, the balcony. In that, yeah. So Mike and I looked at the rows and things, and the way we looked at it, if we have the guests go up into the balcony, we can have like five rows per district, and, and just on the back of an envelope, what we said was the first row could be, everybody wants to sit together and doesn't care, the second row could be blank, the fifth row could be blank, and the third and fourth would be spaced, like three seats apart. And we figured, and there are 22 seats in row, so we figured that was enough space people, we hope, to feel comfortable whichever way they go. Um, and it's up to this group, really, if we want to recommend that we do that, or do we just keep it the way it is now and let um, people 
you know, just figure it out for themselves. I have no feel for how, how other people feel about wanting space or not wanting space, um, or even attending, but that's a separate. Well, I, I'll speak out. I want everyone to feel comfortable, even if it might be a majority or minority of people especially on a budget vote, which is not, you know, a one, two, three meeting like our last one was. Jack, we can't hear you very well. Could oh. you get closer to the mic? Uh, usually people don't complain that they can't hear me. Um, thanks, thanks for help. <laughs> I, I'd like to recommend that we do do what um, Lois and Mike recommended because I want everyone to feel as comfortable as they can be in this meeting. So, you know, and it's not going to put anybody out if we do five rows. And, and you know, if it's a minority, fine. If it's the majority, fine. Don't care, don't need a, a survey. We just should be cognizant to make people feel comfortable. Uh, right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but depends on how, if the, if the governor requires virtual, we don't have a choice. If, if the bill is extended and people have a way, are allowed to vote remotely, we will not have a choice other than to do it virtually. Fine. I don't think so. Uh, uh, we can do it in person. Pardon? Why wouldn't we be why can't we do it in person? I don't think the bill is going to say you have to do it electronically. No. I mean, I think we have to do one or the other. Um, I haven't read anything. Technologically, that we have a problem trying to do a, hi a hybrid. Well, I think Mike's asking a different question. Mike's asking. Yes. I think. Yeah, Mike the is bill, asking. Yeah, is the bill saying we have to offer a virtual, continue to offer a virtual option? Or just no, it that, doesn't that we have the right to offer a virtual option? Is it the obligation or the right? We don't know yet how they're going to vote it. The way it stands now, it, it's not a requirement. You can do it, but you don't I have guess it. then the question is, if the, let's if they do allow the continued virtual voting, do we want to do the meeting virtually or do we still or do we want to do it in person? I think that's the question we haven't asked yet in this right. program. Okay. So so what's the sense of this room? What would you like what would you like to do? I'm the moderator. This is where I get to be moderator. <laughs> <laughs> sit squarely in the middle and smile at all of you and say, come, talk to me. Well, there is the option of Krista of sending another survey monkey to um, people. Uh, I, 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 no. no. No, no, because then it's majority rules and it puts the minority in an uncomfortable situation. I, I, I've said I enjoy my virtual meetings um, because people who are not necessarily in town, look over here, um, or have other obligations can participate um, and this is a budget vote and I think that when it's on your computer screen as opposed on the big screen over there um, I think people tend to focus more on the budget numbers that are going to be there. No scientific um, or anything that says that I'm right or wrong my own personal feelings but obviously I will um, defer to what the group wants. So, uh, what can I have a question? Uh, Patty, well, I, yeah. I'll just make a point. I mean, I, I, I've been in some in person meetings now as we started to go through Parks and Rec and an in person meeting the commission. The other day, I was in an in person meeting today. So, I'm not personally against in person meetings, but I will say if this is an in person meeting and it's our first meeting back and it goes as long as it did the last budget meeting, I wrote down the number of people that started to get off the meeting before the final vote. And it was a surprisingly sizable amount. And so if there was a way we could try and be, I know we have a lot to cover, but a little bit more efficient with that. Because, I mean, I kind of feel like we lost some new people on the RTM who hadn't yet had the wonderfulness of being all together in the RTM with us and doing a long, long budget meeting like that. And then they were like, I'm done, I'm out. I mean, my will, and son probably felt that way. He didn't come back. 
So I, I would just say, if there's a way that if we are in person, we try and be cognizant of the time we are keeping all of these people. To I, I can read just the yeah. charts and leave, but, Patty. Patty, I'm going to be very honest with you. I can read the charts and leave. If somebody's not willing to listen to the budget, then I don't know they were rightfully on the RTM to begin with. So while I hear you, I am not sympathetic. This is the most important meeting of the year. This is why the governor decided that, June, that April 30th was the cutoff, because he knew every town does their budget in May. And that's why he wanted in-person meetings. Look, if somebody can't spend time on the budget because they don't have interest, and they're not on the RTM, we have many other quality people in this town to take their spot who may be. So I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but. A suggestion. I know I want to be work, and I always take notes at every meeting, and I'm always there to the end, and I vote on it. I'm just don't, don't take it personally. I'm just, I'm not. This isn't helping everybody. It's not just you. It's just if there's a way. I'm just thoughtful of the fact that it's the first meeting where everybody is back. So I like the fact that we can spread them out. And thank you, Mike and Lois, for going through the auditorium and figuring, you know, here's one row where you can be together, skip another row, here's another, you know, row. So those are all constructive things just thinking about the future. Well, I'm done. I have a seen you know, my suggestion to you is that um, that we we split the baby. Excuse me. Uh, we have um, face to face if we have to, because they don't vote hybrid. They, they don't extend it, and uh, because of technological reasons, uh, if they do vote it, then I think we we have to do virtual because we don't have the capabilities, I understand, and I will double check that I because I- I agree with that statement, Seth. I, you, keep inter, you keep putting virtual, you keep putting hybrid in. I, hybrid no, in no, I, I meant virtual, virtual. In other words, you're either, if they allow it, uh, um, if, if they allow virtual, then I think uh, we would have to do that because Why? I'm not sure because Why do we, have to do we don't that? have the we don't have the ability to be able to uh, technologically to be able to run uh, both virtual but and I, face to face at the same why you're time. Making that connection to if if they allow us to do electronic voting. I don't understand why you're making the leap to say, well, since we can't do virtual, we therefore have to do, excuse me, we can't do hybrid, we therefore have to be virtual. We still have the option of making a decision to do it live. And that's what the discussion is. Yeah, yes, I will make a motion. You do. We can vote it down, and I'm not sure how I'll vote, but let's formalize this. I will make a motion that we have the budget meeting in person. Can I, okay. Can I um, do we have a second? I'll second it. But can okay, I fine. Add? Now, discussion. So, there is a I'm happy speak up. Person. Speak up because this is important. So. <laughs> I was just putting it out there so yeah, we could have the discussion. I, I, so. I feel like we're, we're forgetting something we can all do. I mean, I, I, I agree with you because sometimes I think our meetings last longer than they should because of technological problems. Um, and the budget meeting is important, and I'd hate for it to get caught up in technology problems. If we do it in person, why don't we suggest people have to wear masks? I mean, there are still places around town and other towns where, you know, there are certain places I go where they still require you to wear a mask because the people who own the business want that. So if we have people who are uncomfortable, you know, in person, maybe telling them they, that we are all going to wear a mask will make people more comfortable going in person. If, if I might add to that, mm -hmm. I think, I, I think, right. I think that part of the situation here is that this bill will allow hybrid meetings should the town desire to go there. Because we don't have the well, technology. Have virtual meetings. What? Uh, yeah, hybrid, so we can have in person and hybrid and at people the same time. on the yeah. But we don't have the technology now. So that doesn't mean that we have to go virtual, it just means that we can't go hybrid That's at right. this time. So I would, I would support what Michael um, said, but with the amendment to it, 
that the seating arrangement that Lois and Michael worked out be implemented at that meeting, as well as... Jack, I just, excuse me, Mike, can we can I just one at a time, please? I, I, we lost our, our, our note taker, so I wanted to ask oh, Patty, okay. if, you were, take, if you could pick up for Mark, because he's, he's left us, and I don't know if we got disconnected, but we have no one taking minutes right now. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> no, well, it's being well, recorded, yeah. right, you guys? Nice yes. To me. Mm -hmm. I know. No, no, this this is being recorded, right? It is yes. Being recorded. Okay. Yeah. Well, then. For the minutes. So. Okay. Yes. So for the minutes, he can see the recording and Perfect. yes. Right. Okay. And I'll, I'll just take him and share with him. With him. Okay. <laughs> Very he good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now okay, back on the subject. Um, you're okay, Mike, you didn't have anything on, you were just giving us a, right. okay, okay, thanks. Frank. We'll switch <laughs> I guess you know that I'm never in favor of delay. I would always move forward. <laughs> However, in this case, uh, since on, a, a, after the legislature closes and we get to the reading of what Hartford is doing to us, Seth has the ability to call this group together at a special meeting. And at that special meeting, we'll have the facts. And we can thrash it out and nail it down then. And we're dealing with too many variables here. I guess I don't hear to do anything tonight. I don't hear the variable though, Frank. I'm sorry. I the variable is what the state decides to do to us. But I'm not sure in my mind, in my motion, that's not relevant. We have the option. Well, that, that's right. We could make, certainly yeah. we could do it your way. But when we do have the facts, we will be solidly based as to what we're going to do. Okay. I, I don't see it no. that way because the reality is if the tap if the state lets us do it virtually we have then have the option to do it virtually right now because you have a statement that if and then we have the option but i want to remove some of those variables that we make a decision when we discuss it and okay make a decision. okay thanks frank others okay yes lois and i see you i, just, I want to support what i think mike then. Uh, Michael was saying, which is that if the state doesn't allow us to do it, then there's no vote. That's no my vote. point, Lois. Thank you. <laughs> if the state allows us, I think that's what we're discussing, and that's what we're trying to vote on. If, but but yeah. let's go back to this. Wait, wait. Uh, uh, wait, I've got. I'm letting uh, Lois. Wait a minute. I got. I got Adele and then Jack. Okay. Adele. I guess what I would, I guess my point of view is that if we, if the state allows us to continue to uh, meet virtually, and if, so we have the choice of the two types of meetings, then I think we should go to the RTM and ask the RTM members what they think, if they're ready to go back to in person or if they, if they want to stay virtual, honestly. Okay, thanks. Jack? I, I was just going to say, my understanding of this bill is that they want to be able to have, because there's been such public participation in the virtual meetings, because people can sign on, they want to know that if we go back to an in-person, that hybrid would be allowed to go, including voting. But if we don't have the technology in the auditorium, which we do not have, then we can, we, we don't have that capability, so we could still do in person and just not have a hybrid meeting. This bill is to allow hybrid meetings, not foster it upon people. Correct. That's my interpretation. So again, I haven't read the full bill that passed the House. But, but I think we could do, I, I don't think that they're going to tell everybody that they have to do um, every meeting in the future has to be hybrid because, you know, Darien is a little better off town than some others. And I don't know that some of the small towns could afford to do that. I don't think the bill is about telling them that they have to. I think it's, it's the question is whether will still people will still have the option to right which goes back to why again just frank i didn't mean to, to cut you off before but in my <laughs> okay. mind in my mind 
the question, that, or at least what I put out there, we could all vote it down, and that's fine, um, if I'm in the minority, which, again, I completely respect. Um, but to me, I am proposing that we have the meetings in person again. And it really has almost nothing to do with what the state does on Friday or Saturday, whenever they do it. Well, I'll, I'll read you. And I may completely be in the minority, but that's why I put it up here to debate and vote. Fine. That's what it's all about. Um, I will, I'll take a moment just to read you what's on the table. Uh, and I'm excerpting it because this thing goes on, but it says under this, it says summary. Under the state's Freedom of Information Act, public agencies must generally make their meetings other than executive sessions open to the public. Current law allows these agencies until April 30, 2022, to hold meetings that are accessible to the public through electronic equipment, that is to say by phone, video, or other conferencing platforms, or electronic equipment combined with an in-person meeting uh, called hybrid meetings. <clears throat> This bill removes the sunset date, okay, and allows public agencies to continue holding remote and hybrid meetings as long as they comply with the requirements under existing law. So uh, that's what the Senate has to still vote on, because otherwise, you know, that's where it is now. That's where it sits. They're just essentially extending the, as they say, um, um, the bill removes the sunset date, so it just keeps going, and it, it has no, at, at this point in time, has no sunset date. Lois had a question. Yeah, and now I've got hands. Uh, I'll get Lois, and then Teresa. You know? No, I was pointing out that I, I saw Lois' hand. Uh, okay, Lois, I'm sitting here. It's like I you want to be where I am, <laughs> folks. I got screens all the way around me. Go, Lois. I just want to say there's another paragraph in the bill that talks about voting. And it talks about that if you do it electronically and you don't have, um, it's not and it's not unanimous, then you have to do a roll call, which is exactly what we're doing. Right. So it does allow for the electronic voting, which is the other piece that you need. Not only do they allow the meetings, but they allow for electronic voting, which is the other piece. But you know, it's, it, to me, the meetings in two weeks, people that need to. You know, wanting, if we want people to go back for an in-person, we need to tell them right away. Um, and if not, if it's, you know, anyway, we need to figure out, and I think it's our responsibility as the Rules Committee to figure out what we're going to recommend, however we all vote, and, um, and, and go. I don't think there's a lot of time to debate and, um, you know, and wonder what the committee needs to do. And I, I also support what Jack said. It's, Go to the minority. That it, this isn't a, a popular vote. It's you know how do how do we honor most people as many people as possible attending and voting on the uh, budget because that's the goal in a comfortable right. in a comfortable yeah. environment. Which the piece I'd add to all that which is you guys did the work on. Yes, you say the you point know, which has been kind of a theme for some of the debate points. Jack's point as well as Lois's and, and certainly in mine is that. Um, and maybe a little bit contrary to Adele to your point about polling the RTM. I think we as the Rules Committee have to look at the quality of the meeting. And if we think the quality of the meeting is better to be in person, then I think that's what we should be debating here. Um, again, I may be in the minority, but that's what I'm putting out. Well, you, you, yeah, know, you put it on the table, yeah, Michael, so, so, want so that's, more, that's what it's all right? about. Yeah. You want people to come, and if that's part of the polling, you get a better idea if you're going to get a quorum, and people do, really do indeed feel comfortable. Well, just in yeah, case yeah. we don't, just so everybody understands, because we still have a June meeting, but if we do not properly vote or reject these budgets, the budgets revert back to the prior years or the current year's operating budget and none of the capital is approved. So just so that people are aware of that. All right. Jack, does that, would you, can we vote in June if something gets messed up in two weeks or does we have to vote in May? We have to figure it out in May. No, we just have to no. make sure that it's up. And then the legislative body would continue to meet until we come to an agreed upon budget. So if we don't have a quorum, so we can't vote in May, 
we have a heck of a long meeting in June because in June we're going to have the park and rec issue, we're going to have 1.3 million um, in bonding for this current year's budget and we will have presentations on three schools and the appropriate bonds for each of them. So you want to put a budget meeting on there. Patty, even I'm leaving that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a special meeting, I think, to settle this, but um, okay, uh, others. Okay, um, are you ready to vote? Can you repeat? What you're doing? <laughs> and then, uh, well, uh, well, I'll have Michael. Uh, yes, uh, mine is simple. I moved that we and I'll try right. to add Jack's amendment into it. If Jack okay. correct me if I don't have it accurately, um, that we um, make the next meeting of the RTM um, an in-person meeting, and that we do it with um, the seating plan, the the spaced-out seating plan that Mike and Lois have identified. And if someone wants to add the mask requirement to that, please do. I'm okay with that. I think Teresa did, so we might as well throw masks. And require in there. that people be masked. Okay. I'll second it. There we oh, we got to second. We 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 brought we brought Teresa in Teresa with that one. Teresa second that. I, I <laughs> All right, saw good. That. All right. Um, other questions? Ready to vote? No votes, please. I have. Okay. Uh, one hand will do, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> we it's only get to count enough. Mike once. I have, He's I have uh, one, two, yeah, three, four, five, no votes. No, you have. No, no, wait. I counted you twice. I'm sorry. Four, no four, no four, votes. four no votes. What about Ian and Mark? Do you need to hear them? And then uh, that's so far. Now, what. Um, how do we connect with, who's, who's AR? I am. Yeah. And, yeah. And Mark? And Mark was on for a was on, on and then he's off again. Yeah. Oh, it looks like he's on, but. He was on. Um. Yeah. All right. Should we do it as a roll call vote? Um, given the complexities of this? Yeah, I, I, it looks like that's, um, what we've got to do. So, yeah, all right. Um, oh, a question for the minutes. So, uh, so yeah. RO is Rolf, right? Yeah. I'm just trying to. Can figure. I ask a question for the minutes? Okay. Yes, so yes. For that motion, yes. It down, and we were talking about the spread out seating program. Yeah. But was the requirement of mass included or not? It was included. It was. 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 Yes. Yes. That's yes. Because there was a, 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 an amendment accepted uh, by the motioner uh, to uh, add masks and to add the seating that Lois worked out and, and Michael. And do we have a way we would enforce that? Mm -hmm. No, I'd, I'd, I'd lay it out and, you know. Well, who has gun permits? <laughs> right. So, um, yes. All right. Um, I was not required in town hall. Mark, the, the, no. Why I, yeah, I know that, but um, we, if, it, if, it, if it increases the attendance because of it, what, you know. I think, what, I think it decreases the attendance because of it. I think Mike is right. It's why I, was it, I agree, Mike. I think it decreases it. So, so just to play Robert's rules for a second. Yes, sir. First of all, we should vote on my amendment to my motion to Michael's motion to implement the seating. So why don't we take a vote well, I, on I, that? Well, Michael accepted no, no, it. No, 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 we I still should vote. Sense, given the points that have come up, I'm and then, to say, let's do it mine, and then, and then we can then we'll right, do okay, the so, uh, we'll do, do I have a we'll second have for Jack's uh, okay. motion on the seating? Amendment to the motion. We have the motion on the floor, and that's just a plain old. Lois, uh, Lois seconded, Lois seconded Mike. And Lois seconded. Or um, Jack. Okay. Okay, Lois seconded. So, so now we've got Jack. Now, do we want to. Does, does no, the, all we're doing is voting on who's in favor of implementing mm -hmm. the seating 
that right. Lois and M Mike worked out at an in-person meeting. Right. Okay. Now, um, I don't see... I'm, 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 Mark says he's on, but he's not. I'm calling to see if he's on. Mark, I'm... I'm on. All right, we can hear you now. I am. We can hear you now. Yeah, I've been on the whole time. Okay. And I've been on the whole time. Oh, we don't, I don't see you on the screen. That's why I didn't know you He's were on Cola, too. Oh, oh. I, I, my iPad ran out of batteries, so I'm on the phone. I need someone to restate the motion and then the additional uh, motion on the motion. Uh, uh, okay. The, 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 the motion, I made the motion, this is Michael, that we hold the next meeting in person. Keep it simple. I got that. Then Jack and, made a and, and amendment. I say Teresa seconded that motion. And then Jack amended it with? And then I amended that at the in-person at, at in in meeting that we implement the 